Ana, Ana, Ana. Όχι, όχι, το έχω το χρυσό από δώσει. Για να δω και μας έφερα από εδώ. Οκ, τέλεια. Κάνω αυτό, εντάξει. Οκ, από τώρα θα χρειάζω κάτι άλλο από μένα. Από το έτσι είναι, ναι. Αυτό είναι το δικό σου, έτσι. Ναι, ναι. Ναι. Ότι και θα χρησιστείς αυτό. Θα αλλάζει από εδώ, έτσι. Ε, ναι, από εδώ θα αλλάζω, ναι. Χιλόφωνο ε, ή θα, θα σε δω. Ε, όχι, αυτό καλή δύο. Το, το βγάζω εδώ και συνδέω. 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 Εγώ θα πω ότι θα σα πω ότι θα σα πω Είναι το 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 Αν έχεις κάτι με ήχο, δεν θα παίξει. Όχι, δεν έχω κάτι με ήχος.
Εδώ δεν έχω ενωθεί. Στο όντιο δεν έχω ενωθεί εδώ. Το όντιο το άφησα πίστευτο. Από εδώ, ναι. Ναι, να μην έχουμε διπλά και... Ναι. Ναι, πρέπει να το έτσι. Να μην κρατάω το ένα από αυτά τα μικρόφωνα. Και αυτό πέφτει. 
Calligrafo. Ναι, καλύτερα είσαι. Ναι, ναι. Ένα χρειάζομαι. Θα μιλάς έτσι, εδώ. Όχι έτσι. Όχι έτσι. Έτσι. Το έχω, το έχω. One, two. Good morning to everybody. Welcome to the second day of uh, our workshop. Okay, as usual, we're going to start with our invited speaker with a tutorial lecture. And uh, today, uh, the, our invited speaker is Professor Francesca Francudi, who uh, is going to talk about bar galaxies in cosmological simulations. Okay, I will talk about this in a second if we if I get my slides back up. Sorry, we seem to have a little technical problem. Hmm. Okay, one minute. <laughs> My computer has decided to die, so. That's all right. Doctor, Applaus, if you get the internet, can I pass a mock? Si no, es que tú sí, que hay que me... Tú eres más de los frales. Te voy a dar otra llena, doctor, si no veo. Τώρα 
ještě měla lepší kino. Ευτυχώς που έχουμε την μισή, ε, πέθανε το κομπιούτερ, το να ξανανάβει. Ευτυχώς που έχουμε την μισή. Οκ, sorry. Οκ, okay, εντάξει, τώρα να δούμε αν ανάψει, δεν ξέρω τι έγινε. Έρχεται. το λοιπόν. Πάμε καλά. Τώρα το έρχεται. Ε, τώρα θα ανοίξουμε όλα. Είστε. 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 Εδώ. Ανοίξουμε και το Zoom. Ναι, το να συνδεθεί και αυτό. Okay. Είμαστε έτοιμοι. Okay. Ναι, μια χαρά. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry about that, everyone. We had. Uh... My computer decided it was time to restart. So yeah, good morning, everyone. Kalimera. Um, thanks a lot, first of all, to Panos and all the uh, organizers here in Athens for putting this um, together. I, I had a, a great day yesterday learning a lot from everyone, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the week. So um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about barred galaxies in cosmological simulations, I hope. And um, maybe not. Um, let's see if this is going to work. Okay. But seeing as this is um, a school kind of workshop type thing, I wanted to start really at the beginning and uh, tell you a little bit first about cosmological simulations, um, a little bit about biodynamics, and then uh, what we're learning from cosmological simulations. And we have technical problems again. Problem is that I don't want to see the Wi-Fi and it comes from Zoom. Yes, I know. It comes from the Wi-Fi and... What I can do is to record the record of the Amelia on my own. Ωραία. Και να μην έχει... Ωραία, θα κάνω το δικό της ειδικό σου, το μάθαμε να δούμε στο file, θα το βάζουμε μέσα στο μετάλλο. Ναι, τώρα πες έχουμε ότι άμα πέφτει, θα πέφτει και στο δικό μου. Αυτό είναι το πρόβλημα. Ξέρω γιατί. Ξέρω γιατί το πεθαίνει αυτό. Ωραία. Θα πέτυσε απλώς θα μας δώσει τα slides και θα έχει μιλώσει όταν έχεις μιλώσει. Θα δούμε το βαλτινά. Να κάνουμε κάτι σχετικό. Νομίζω είναι το δίχτυο. 
Ναι, κάτι δεν του αρέσει. Α το κάνουμε χωρί το recording και. Θα το κάνουμε χωρί το recording και θα μα δώσει τα σχόλια. Δεν το κάνουμε, δεν το ξανακάνουμε. Δεν το κάνουμε δύο φορές. Δεν το κάνουμε το κόσμο, στις δώσεις. Θα το ανάψει και να το ενώσει. Δεν ξέρω, τι πρώτη φορά μου το έχει πάθει αυτό. Δεν ξέρω τι είναι. Ε, τότε θα πρέπει να το περάσουμε, θα πρέπει να Να δούμε τώρα... Μπορεί να είναι το ζήτημα της μεγάλης ανάλυσης αυτό που παίζει τώρα. Μπορεί, Α, αλλά... Θα περάσει στην επόμενη διαφάνεια. Ναι, μπορεί. Έγινε κατευθείαν στο ΟΚΕ. 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 So, good morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, this is the, the outline of my talk. And the objectives here are to um, tell you a little bit about what cosmological simulations are. Um, so, why we use cosmological simulations. I'm going to very, very briefly touch upon the n-body methods and techniques that we use and tell you a little, about the, a little bit about the different types of cosmological simulations um, that, we, uh, that we use. Then I'm going to give you um, a very brief recap on bar dynamics. We heard a lot yesterday already from Leah and Albert and others um, about, about this topic. So I'm going to just very briefly tell you a little bit about some of the kind of results over the last few decades on uh, bar dynamics, a lot of which were done here at the Academy of Athens. So that's going to be a bit surreal talking about this here. Um, and then I'm going to, in the last part, which is also the longest part, I'll tell you a bit about what we've been learning about barred galaxies from studying uh, cosmological simulations in the last few years. In particular, what we've been learning about the formation, the evolution, and the dark matter content of barred galaxies. Okay, so let's start. So, um, in uh, galaxy formation evolution, we have a kind of classic physics problem, which is that we have a system um, that we want to evolve, that has some initial conditions. We want to evolve this to its endpoint, and we want to understand all the physical processes that take place um, in, in this uh, evolutionary process. And the question we want to answer is, how does the observed distribution and diversity of galaxies in the universe arise from the initial conditions? So the initial conditions are given to us, um, of the universe are given to us very accurately from uh, the cosmic microwave background, which tells us what the universe was like um, very uh, uh, soon after the Big Bang. And then the, the end point in our case is the distribution of galaxies. For example, this is from the 2DF surveys and we, from the 2DF survey. And we see how galaxies are distributed in the universe. And we also have a um, diversity of morphologies and properties of galaxies. And this is the, the end point, what we want to understand. And in between here, there's a bunch of uh, physics that's happening and we want to uh, understand this and understand what's going on. Um, so in, in here, in order to go from the initial conditions to the, to the end point, we need, of course, a, a physical theory of cosmology. Um, the preferred kind of concordance model today is lambda CDM, um, which tells us that, which is just a mathematical model of the Big Bang theory that tells us that the universe is uh, expanding and that it's doing so at an accelerated rate. So this is what this lambda is telling us. This is the cosmological constant that tells us that um, the universe is ex has an accelerated expansion. And the other part of 
uh, lambda CDM is the CDM, the cold dark matter, which is telling us that uh, most of the mass of the universe is thought to be made up of this cold, i.e. non-relativistic type of matter um, that's dark, doesn't emit or absorb electromagnetic radiation, and that this is thought to make up most of the mass of the universe. And lambda CDM implicitly assumes, of course, that general relativity is the correct theory of gravity. So this here tells you how structure is formed. So it tells you how you go um, from these initial conditions into having um, all the structure that we see in, in, in the universe today. But we also need basically a galaxy formation model. So this is telling us how galaxies themselves are forming and evolving inside of each one of these little, uh, or in each of the halos, the dark matter halos that we think um, galaxies form within. And this will have a lot of messy physics. So it will tell us how, um, how star formation proceeds, how energetic feedback from supernovae is injected back into the interstellar medium, things about the active galactic nuclei, all a lot of very messy physics, uh, magnetic fields, cosmic rays, how all of these things affect the formation evolution of galaxies. So this is um, all of the baryonic physics is enclosed in the galaxy formation model. And to, to, to model this and to understand this, we really need a large dynamic range. So we need to probe scales from even below one parsec to 10 to the nine parsec. So we have to probe orders of magnitude uh, in terms of uh, distances. Um, and we need to be able to follow the nonlinear evolution of structure formation. And we need to be able to model all of these physical processes that we were talking about. So the only way really to do this is with numerical simulations. You can't do this analytic analytically. You need numerical simulations to do this. So if we now start very simply and think about dark matter and the distribution of dark matter, um, the, the kind of starting point for all of this is, um, is this set of equations here, the collisionless Boltzmann equation and the Poisson equation. So this equation, it just connects the distribution function, which we heard about yesterday from Paula, which is just uh, telling us the number density of particles at a given position with a given velocity at a given time. So this, this set of equations connects the distribution function to the total potential of the system. And we can get the potential um, from the density distribution um, over here. So um, these coupled equations, they describe the behavior of any collisionless fluid. That could be dark matter, that could be stars. Um, and yeah, it's not something uh, particular, let's say, to, to, to cosmology, but this is very, very useful for numerical simulations. This is kind of the base equations. But these equations, oh, right, yeah. So, and when we say collisionless system, what we mean is uh, we're, we're talking about this thing here, the relaxation time. So um, this is the time that it takes for the velocity of a particle in this system to be completely perturbed by encounters with other particles in the system. So if you have a star moving in a, in a straight trajectory, you can imagine it will experience perturbations due to its interactions with other particles in the system and the time for its velocity to change 100% uh, due to these interactions is what we call the, the relaxation time. And it depends on some characteristic crossing time of the particle in the system, and it depends on the number of particles in the system. Um, so for a system to be collisionless, this relaxation time needs to be much larger than some relevant characteristic time scale. In our case, this will be the Hubble time or the age of the universe. Um, so just to give you an example, for, for stars in a galaxy, this is the characteristic crossing time. This is the uh, approximate number of stars in a galaxy. If you plug this in, you get that the relaxation time of a galaxy is of the order of 10 to the 7 Hubble times. So this is clearly a, a collisionless system. If you do this for actual dark matter particles in a galaxy, um, this is the order, if you assume a, a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle for, for dark matter, then this would be the order of uh, particles that you would have in a, in, a, in a galaxy. So obviously this system is extremely collisionless, right? Um, 
So we can, in principle, we can use these equations to, to um, describe a collisionless system. However, the problem is that this system of partial differential equations is very difficult, nay, almost impossible to solve um, in non-trivial cases. So what do we do in uh, numerical simulations is that we actually discretize um, the distribution function with, and we essentially are using a kind of Monte Carlo approach where what we do is we say we have this distribution function, which is a continuous function, but now let's Monte Carlo sample the distribution function with particles, with a finite set of particles. Um, and so now these particles in the simulation, they do not actually correspond to, for example, a given dark matter particle, but these particles, they're, they're much more massive. Um, we have a much smaller number of particles now than the actual dark matter particles that there are in a galaxy. And these, these particles are essentially just tracers of the underlying distribution function. Um, and we can then solve um, these equations where we have the acceleration on a given particle um, that's given uh, by the gradient of the potential, and we can get the potential um, at a given position by summing over all uh, the particles. And you'll notice here that in order to, when we, when you, when we use this approach, this n-body approach, we need to uh, add here this, um, this uh, epsilon, which is the gravitational softening. And this is needed in order to prevent large angle scattering, scatterings between particles and to ensure that the two body relaxation time is sufficiently large. So you need to ensure that these, you can use these, um, you can use these equations to, to kind of uh, approximate this in the limit that this, the number of particles that you use is large enough so that this system is still collisionless. If it's, otherwise you can't use this. And the kind of simplest way that people implement this, you can think about implementing this n-body method is with something like this. So the direct n-body particle particle method, um, which basically tells you that to get the potential, you essentially sum at a given particle, you sum the contribution of every other particle in the simulation. Um, and that will, will tell you the potential on that particle. So this is the most kind of, naive, let's say, naive or easy way to, to compute this and to conceptualize this. However, this is very computationally expensive. So it scales as the number of particles in your simulation squared. So this becomes very quickly very computationally expensive. So usually what's used are other methods. There are a number of different methods. I won't go through all of them because that would be another lecture in itself. Um, but one very popular method is using these tree methods. So the idea here is basically that we group distant particles together. So if you have, for example, this particle here, this blue particle here, and you want to know the potential uh, at, on this particle here, for all of these particles that are far away, you can group these together um, and get the, the, the multiple, and you can then get the potential from all of these particles on this particle here together. You don't have to calculate the contribution individually. And as you get kind of closer to the particle, you need to start considering finer and finer uh, distributions, let's say, in order to, to get uh, the, the potential. Um, and this is set by what's called um, an opening angle. So basically you set an angle and that you say, if uh, distribution of particles is smaller than this angle, then we consider everything inside here um, as a single point at the center of mass. Um, if, if, a, if a cloud of particles is, is larger than this critical angle, then you have to open it up and you go into these smaller and smaller nodes. And these are called octrees because you usually divide into eight, um, eight uh, nodes. In any case, the, the, the details are not so important, but just to say that this is much more uh, computationally efficient and this scales as a log the logarithm of the number of particles. So this makes it much more uh, efficient to use. And then what you have to do is now you have your, your potential on, for each particle in the system. And then essentially what you wanna do is you want to advance every single particle in the system 
uh, forward in time. And you'll do this, usually this is done with some algorithm, for example, the leapfrog algorithm, um, where you can use this uh, kick drift kick uh, implementation of the algorithm, where essentially you advance the velocities, um, you, you, you have the acceleration now from the, from the potential, and you can advance the velocities according to, to the, well, the, the previous velocity that you had, you, uh, uh, you update the velocity, um, taking into account the acceleration, then you uh, drift the particle, so you move it forward in time by a small time step, uh, delta was just given by this delta t here, and then you uh, give the velocity another kick. And you do this at every single time step, and you're just basically advancing the system every time step. So every time step you calculate the potential, you advance forward the particles, you recalculate the potential, you advance forward the particles. So this is what these n-body simulations are doing. You're just numerically solving these uh, partial differential equations. So now what kind of cosmological simulations are there? So this is the first kind is this, what I'm gonna be calling big box n-body simulations. So this is basically where you model a chunk of the universe. This could be something like 50 megaparsec on a side or a gigaparsec, depending on how um, how large you want your box to be and, and how many, yeah, the, the amount of time that you have available to make these calculations. And the the, um, the kind of first step in it in doing all of these simulations was to start by doing dark matter only simulations. Um, and these are still uh, very useful nowadays, even in, for, especially for, for um, cosmology. And the idea is that you set up your initial conditions where you have um, a very, you can see here, this is a very smooth density field. So there's a very, very small perturbations there. And essentially you put in your, um, uh, the equations for, for solving for gravity and you let the system evolve in time. And you see that now you, you start getting a clustering um, and a lot of structure forming in, in these simulations. So these, these were the kinds of simulations that were used um, also in the 80s and 90s to try and reproduce um, the large scale structure of the universe. Um, and the Lambda CDM model reproduces very well uh, what we see in terms of the large scale structure of the universe. So this is one kind of simulation. The second kind is a kind of a step, a step forward from what, from what I was just telling you. So it's these kind of big box and body simulations plus hydrodynamics. So now you don't just have uh, dark matter, but you also add in the baryons. You add in the gas, uh, for example, the hydrogen and helium gas that you have in the early universe that then is gonna go on to collapse to form stars, galaxies, supermassive black holes, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, you also need to solve, in addition to um, the equations that we were just talking about, you also need to solve the uh, Euler equations for hydrodynamics, for example, to see how uh, the gas is going to um, evolve uh, when this is coupled to, to gravity. But in addition to that, you also need to put in some recipes to these, what we call uh, recipes into these simulations. Um, so this, you need to tell the gas what to do when it becomes very dense. So you need to have star formation. You need to have, for example, the formation of supermassive black holes. You need to have feedback processes, for example, um, feedback from stellar winds, feedback from supernovae, feedback from the supermassive black hole. And you can add in as much physics as you want, cosmic rays, magnetic fields, et cetera. So all of these processes, essentially almost all of these processes, um, star formation, feedback, et cetera, they are happening below the resolution of the simulation. Um, so you cannot actually resolve these individual um, processes that are taking place. So what we do is we, you have to implement this, what we call the subgrid level. So you, you basically tell your simulation, okay, if you have uh, if the gas is denser than this amount, then turn this gas into these many stars. Um, and then we're gonna, we expect feedback from these many supernovae, et cetera, but you're not actually resolving these processes. So that's why we call these the subgrid physics. Um, and all of these together also make up the galaxy formation model, what we were talking about before. 
Um, so you, with this kind of simulations, you can trace the evolution both of dark matter and of the baryonic components down to redshift zero. Um, and you can have the, a whole chunk of the universe that's modeled uh, in this way. So there's been a lot, a lot of simulations uh, done in this way, Eagle, Illustris. Uh, here I'm showing you a video from Illustris TNG. This is one of the most recent uh, cosmological uh, big box hydrodynamic cosmological simulations. Uh, where you have uh, an exquisite detail, you know, the, a lot of the uh, you forming galaxies of different masses and different environments, everything self consistently. Now, these simulations are, are great, but they're also very, very computationally expensive. So, TNG 50 took uh, 130 million uh, CPU core hours to run. So, that's the equivalent of about 5 million days on a single computer or 15,000 years if you were to calculate this on a single computer. Um, so these are very, very computationally expensive, which means that you can't just, you know, if you wanna change something in the physics to see how this is gonna affect the outcome, you cannot do that, right? You can't just go and change it and then rerun it again. Um, so you, you Put, you make some choices about the physics that you're gonna put into this, you run it once, and then that's the only realization you have. So you have to be, there's only a certain, I mean, there's a certain number of questions that can be answered with these simulations. Um, I also wanted to say, of course, that all of these simulations are just tools. They're all numerical experiments that one can do in order to try and answer the questions that we were talking about, about galaxy formation evolution. In these simulations, they're very versatile. You can use them for many different things, but you can't change the physics to see how that will affect things. The third um, type of simulation is what we call zoom-in uh, hydrodynamic simulations, cosmo zoom-in cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. Um, so the idea here is that you basically start by running a kind of low resolution dark matter only simulation, which is very cheap. So you run your simulation down to redshift zero, and then you say, I wanna focus on this galaxy here. So you then say, where are all the particles that end up in this galaxy coming from? Um, you go back to your initial conditions, you, you select all the, the, the region where all these particles are coming from, um, and then you re-simulate, you, you put in uh, gas as well, and then you re-simulate this um, keeping very high resolution in the region of interest, putting your hydro, your star formation, your feedback, all of that stuff there. And then the rest of, in the rest of the simulation, you keep everything very low resolution. So this makes, um, this makes them much cheaper. Um, but of course, at the expense that you don't have now a population of galaxies, you really just have one halo or two halos, depending on what you've chosen at high resolution, everything else is low resolution. Um, but the adva advantage is, of course, that you can um, resolve internal structures. Um, you can test for different physics because these are cheap enough that you can run them, change something, run them again, see how things are affected. Um, so they're also a very uh, useful numerical experiment for, for some things. Um, and one very... Um, kind of uh, well-used suite of cosmological zoom-in simulations that I'll also be uh, talking about quite a bit later is the Ariga suite of uh, simulations. Um, this is a suite of 40, high more than 40 high-resolution hydro cosmological zoom-in simulations. Um, they have a range of masses um, around the Milky Way, but there's also an extension to lower masses, so going into the dwarf regime as well. Um, they're run with the code Arepo, and they have a comprehensive galaxy formation model with star formation, stellar feedback, AGN feedback, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can see they form very nice uh, spiral galaxies uh, by, by low redshifts. Yes, and these are now uh, publicly available simulations. These have been made publicly available. And on Friday, um, we are gonna have in the morning a little hands-on session about how to use these simulations. So if anyone's interested in that, just uh, come along on Friday morning. And we also now have um, even um, kind of a newer version of these Ariga simulations that we are calling Ariga Superstars. It started out as, the name started out as a joke and then it kind of stuck. 
Um, these are a subset of Auriga halos that have the same gas physics at or, the original Auriga resolution, but they have about 100 times better stellar resolution. So we have a, a, um, stellar particles that are, have a mass of 800 solar masses. And um, so these have you know, 10 to the eight, um, uh, to, uh, yeah, ten, like 10 to the eight uh, particles in the galaxy. So these are really, really high resolution. And they're really great. They're ideally suited for stellar dynamical studies. So if you want to do stellar dynamics, this is a really great suite of simulations uh, because you have a lot more resolution in the stellar dynamics. And uh, I won't uh, spoil anything here. So just, just see Thomas's talk later. He's going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, applications of these kinds of simulations. OK, so I want to now give you a, a recap, a small recap on what we know about the, the dynamics and the formation and the evolution of BART galaxies. OK, so as I was saying, the goal uh, of you know, galaxy formation evolution is to understand how we go from these initial conditions to this uh, end state uh, over here. And I'm, in particular, very interested in um, how these galaxies uh, here form. Uh, so these are, of course, the barred spiral galaxies. So we're going to be focusing on the spiral galaxies over here, and in particular, the difference between the barred and the unbarred galaxies. Um, and why we're interested in this, you heard a little bit already also um, about this yesterday, and also from uh, Camilla, that a very significant fraction of the spiral galaxy population, about half to two thirds of spiral galaxies in the local universe have bars. So these are a very significant fraction of the uh, population of galaxies. And uh, as uh, Camilla was saying yesterday, they also affect the um, internal evolution of galaxies. So understanding these bars and how they affect our galaxies is very important for understanding galaxy formation evolution. And also our own Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy. So this, this makes this very interesting also for um, galactic studies. So bars are these elongated, rigidly, rigidly rotating uh, body that is composed of stars that are essentially trapped on uh, resonant orbits. Um, not only, but but uh, to to a great part. So this is what uh, some this is what resonant orbits look like here. So this is from these are orbits taken from a simulation. The left hand side shows you an inertial frame of reference. And the right-hand side shows you a, a, a rotating frame of reference, rotating at the same angular frequency as the bar. Um, and I'm plotting here three um, resonant orbits. So resonant orbits are the ones that satisfy this condition here. So this is basically telling you that when the frequency, um, the azimuthal frequency, the frequency with which stars go around the galaxy, and the radial frequency of stars, so the frequency with which the stars move in and out radially, when these are commensurate with the, uh, with the angular frequency of the bar, so when M and L are um, integers, then you get these kinds of resonant orbits. Um, and uh, here you can see an example of, so these two, this orbit here and this orbit here are what we call um, corotation. These are orbits that are uh, trapped at the corotation resonance. So they have the same angular frequency as the bar, and they're always kind of stuck on the same side of the galaxy. And then this um, orbit here is a, a two to one orbit. Um, so it goes uh, in and out radially twice when it goes once around in the rotating frame of reference. And these are the kinds of uh, orbits that are really bar supporting orbits. You can see that in the rotating frame of reference, this just moves up and down in the bar. Um, and one of the ways uh, that was really uh, pioneered uh, here and um, by Leah and others um, of studying, um, uh, and of course, uh, but for studying these kinds of orbits is uh, looking at closed periodic orbits. Um, so these are orbits that are exactly closed, as the name suggests. Um, and these make up really the, the backbone of stellar bars because they can trap around them 
um, non-closed orbits like these. Um, so you can see an example here of a black, the black line shows you a closed periodic orbit and the red color shows you a non-closed orbit that's tra trapped around this, this uh, closed periodic orbit. Um, and you see, this is kind of analogous to the ones that we see in, these in the n-body simulations. And we can um, describe these closed periodic orbits uh, using this kind of uh, characteristic diagram um, where we can say, let's take the location where the orbit uh, crosses the y-axis um, in, let's say, a, a right-handed fashion. Um, and then for each orbit, each, each of these closed periodic orbits will have uh, an energy, a Jacobi energy given, um, which, is, which is plotted on the x-axis. So each of these orbits is characterized by one point in this plane, in this characteristic diagram. And in um, in barred galaxies, we have many of you have we have many of these kinds of uh, orbits, these closed periodic orbits, and they essentially um, uh, for a given family of orbits, for example, the X one family, which is the family that um, one of the main bar supporting uh, orbital families, they will cluster along a line. So you'll have a line in this characteristic diagram of these um, X one orbits. Um, and we can uh, learn a lot about the, the, the dynamics and the orbital structure of galaxies by looking at these kinds of diagrams. Um, this is a, uh, an example from the, from the work of uh, Lia, Lia in 1992, where you can see the X1 uh, family here. And another very important family is this, the X2 and the X3 family that you see in this part of the characteristic diagram, where the X2 uh, orbits are these um, orbits that we find at the center of the, um, really at the center of the potential. Um, these are also two to one orbits. And I think we'll be hearing more about these um, in a couple of days from, from Mattia also, um, as these are very related to the formation of nuclear disks. Um, and bars not only trap stars into resonances, but they can also trap dark matter particles into resonance as well. Um, and um, in, in the spherical system, the dynamical friction, we'll talk, I'll tell you a little bit more later about dynamical friction, is exerted by uh, these near resonant particles. So this is very um, important for the evolution of bars. And, and here what I'm showing you is, um, is a movie of a, a dark matter particle that is uh, trapped uh, by the bar. And you can see here the face on and the edge on projection of this uh, dark matter particle here. So, okay, why do bars want to form? Well, galaxies, as was uh, um, told to us in this seminal paper by Lindenbell and Kalnaj, they want to transfer their angular momentum from the inner regions of the galaxy outwards. And uh, when they do that, uh, when angular momentum is transferred outwards, the outer parts of the galaxy will grow and the inner parts uh, contract. This is a very common process. It happens in a lot of uh, physical systems, not just in, in, in spiral galaxies, this contraction of the outer parts and um, the expansion of the outer parts and contraction of the inner regions. Um, but of course, if you know, you remember uh, first year uh, uh, mechanics, um, in order to change the angular momentum, we need torque. And this is what bars provide. They provide torque in order to change the angular momentum of uh, material within the galaxy itself. Um, and very briefly, I just wanted to touch upon some of the factors that we know um, to, that affect bar formation. So one thing that we, we learned, we heard already from, from Albert yesterday is that um, from the work of Ostreicher and Peebles, is that massive, uh, this work showed that massive spheroids can stabilize the disk against bar formation. Um, however, oh yeah, right. Um, and this, this goes, when we talk about massive spheroids, this could, this could refer to something like the dark matter halo, but this also applies to something like a spheroidal bulge that you have in the center there. Um, however, as we, we heard from Leah yesterday, this is only partially true because in fact, 
Um, if you have a massive halo that's live, um, this halo can actually absorb angular momentum from the disk, and this can therefore make the bar stronger. So this is shown um, very nicely here, where uh, on the y-axis, uh, you can see the bar strength, and on the x-axis, this is time. And the solid line shows you a, a simulation with a massive halo, and the dashed line, a simulation with a massive disk. So if you focus on early times, you see that if you have a massive halo, um, well, you see that in the case with a massive disk, you form the bar very rapidly. This is very unstable. You form a bar, and then this, this continues. Whereas if you have a massive halo, the formation of the bar is delayed. You can see that it takes longer for the bar to, to actually form. However, at late times, you, you see that in the case where you have a massive halo, um, the bar grows much stronger than in the case with a massive disk. Um, and this is because the, the halo is absorbing angular momentum from, uh, from the disk. Um, and so the, the bar is, is emitting this angular momentum and growing. The other thing that can affect bar formation is um, by increasing the velocity dispersion of the disk, you can stabilize it um, against bar formation. Um, for example, you can see here, this is um, a plot from uh, Athanasu Land Selwood in 86. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the, how um, massive the disk is. And on the x-axis, this is showing you how um, hot the disk is. So this is increased random motions towards the right. And the size of the symbol shows you the growth factor of the bar, so how quickly the bar is growing. And you can see that as you move to the right, so as you have increased random motions, this, the growth factor uh, decreases. And there are a number of other factors that um, are thought to or have been suggested as being important for bar formation, aspects such as gas fraction, velocity dispersion of the halo, et cetera. OK, so now I want to move to the last part, which is on uh, bars and cosmological simulations. Um, and what we're learning from cosmological simulations about the formation, the evolution, and the dark matter content of bar galaxies, but now specifically within the kind of lambda CDM framework. So on the formation of bars and cosmological simulations, um, one thing, the first thing to go and look at is if these cosmological simulations um, are predicting the correct bar fraction um, that we see in observations. So this is um, now, um, most of what I'm going to be telling you about and what follows will be from the Ariga simulations, I'll say if, if otherwise. Um, so if we look at the bar fraction as a as function of redshift or look back time, the black dots show us the bar fraction from Ariga. And the symbols here are showing us observations. And we see that um, uh, the bar fraction in Ariga is, is kind of OK. It seems to reproduce more or less what we see in observations. And we see that the bar fraction decreases as we go to higher redshifts. Um, and the other uh, thing to note is that if we now separate the um, galaxies into high mass galaxies and low mass galaxies, we see that for the high mass galaxies, which are shown in black, we have a higher bar fraction um, at all times when we have these high mass galaxies. Because if we go further back in time, we, we don't have at these high mass galaxies anymore, um, at least in our simulations, because they're, these are focused around a small range of masses. So that's a, a big caveat to keep in mind. Um, yeah, so that for the high mass galaxies, the bar fraction is higher than for the low mass galaxies at all uh, times. Um, so this is um, quite different from what is found in the TNG 50 simulations. Um, also, Paula is giving a talk. Uh, later, uh, we'll tell you a little bit about bars in TNG50 as well. So this is from the work of uh, Rosas Guevara et al. And this is showing you the bar fraction, but now the, the x-axis is flipped. Um, so the so redshift zero is on the right now, and you're going to higher redshift towards the left. Um, so uh, if you focus on this black line, this is telling you the bar fraction um, in TNG50. And you see that actually um, it's quite low at redshift zero. Um, of the order of like 30%, and then it increases towards higher redshift, and then it drops a, a very high redshift again. Um, 
However, the authors showed that if you um, only take um, long bars, for example, this blue line here is showing you bars that are longer than 2 kpc, um, then the fraction is, is low, but it's kind of flat. It's flattish, it doesn't increase much. And then it, it drops again as you go to higher redshifts. So this is telling us that it could be that there are a lot of barred galaxy, short bars um, at earlier times in the universe that we are not possibly not detecting due to um, observational limitations. Um, or it could be telling you, if that doesn't turn out to be true, it could be telling you that there's something interesting going on here in terms of the, um, that this simulation is forming more bars than we see at, in the universe at intermediate redshifts. So I think that will be really interesting to see uh, what comes out in the next few years. Um, going back now to Ariga, if we look at the formation times of bars, so what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the bar strength, um, and on the x-axis this is look back time, this is a messy plot, um, but essentially what I'm doing here is I'm color coding by the formation time of the bar, so the dark colors are the oldest bars, the yellow colors are showing you the youngest bars, um, and basically what I want you to take away from this plot is that bars are forming at a range of redshifts in these simulations. So you have bars forming, you know, half a giga year ago, and you have bars forming over 10 giga years ago in these simulations. And uh, by and large, these bars are long lived structures, especially from redshift two downwards. So if you look above redshift two, you have some bars that can form and uh, to be destroyed, for example, through mergers. But from about redshift two onwards, the bars that are forming in these simulations are, are stable, they're staying, they're st sticking around, they're not going anywhere. Okay, so what affects which galaxies uh, form bars in cosmological simulations? I already mentioned some, some things that are, we know are important for barred galaxies previously, but what is going on the, in these cosmological simulations? So one thing that we um, went and looked at was um, the uh, kind of baryon dominance of barred and unbarred galaxies. So uh, what I'm showing you here is the stellar mass of barred galaxies, uh, of all galaxies in, in Auriga versus the halo mass. The blue points are the unbarred galaxies, the red points, uh, the red squares are the barred galaxies, and um, the crosses are uh, barred galaxies that are also interacting at low redshifts. And this is for redshift zero. And what you can see is that for a given halo mass, we tend to find that the barred galaxies tend to have a higher stellar mass for a given halo mass. Um, and we quantified this by looking at the offset of these galaxies from the abundance matching relation of Mosser. Um, you can also see that the galaxies in Auriga are lying um, kind of above the abundance matching relation of Moster. Um, but if you take e the distance of each galaxy from the median relation, this is what's shown here. So you can see that the, in blue, these are for the unbarred galaxies. They lie closer to the abundance matching relation than the, the red line, which is the barred galaxies that are more offset from the abundance matching relation. Um, and if we go and look at the, um, the contribution of the stars to the rotation curve, so what I'm, what I'm going to be showing you here on the right, this is the contribution of the stellar component in terms of the circular velocity or, or the enclosed mass um, divided by the, the total um, circular uh, um, velocity. Um, so this is what these lines are showing. So you can see that the V star over V total as a function of radius for the barred galaxies is higher than for the unbarred galaxies. Um, so, the, so the barred galaxies are more baryon dominated everywhere in the disk on average. And um, the black line here, interestingly, and I'm gonna come back to this later, the black line is the um, model of the Milky Way derived by Bovey and Ricks. Uh, in 2013. This is a very commonly used model for the Milky Way. Um, you can see that it's much higher than both of these, the blue and the red lines. So dynamical modeling of the Milky Way is finding that the, the disk of the Milky Way, the, the, the Milky Way is much more disk dominated than what these cosmological simulations are finding. And this gets even worse as I'll show you later when you go to other cosmological simulations. 
So there seems to be a bit of a mismatch between what dynamical modeling is finding and what um, these cosmological simulations are, are outputting. But the takeaway, takeaway message here is that barred galaxies are more baryon dominated than unbarred galaxies in the cosmological simulations as we'd, as we'd expect. Um, and if we look at the stellar mass over the dark matter mass inside 5 kpc as a function of time, um, so at redshift zero, this is higher. This is what I've just told you for redshift zero. But if we also look at backwards in time, this also holds. So the barred galaxies are essentially more baryon dominated than the unbarred galaxies, um, also going back at much earlier times uh, to, uh, this is look back time of 12. And if we look at the, essentially the growth of the stellar mass and the dark matter mass in the barred and in the unbarred galaxies, um, you see that the, the dark matter, which is given by the dashed line, is very similar for the barred and the unbarred galaxies. So it's uh, overlapping. But uh, for the stellar mass, you see that the, the barred galaxies, the growth curve rises much more steeply than um, for the unbarred galaxies. So what this is telling you is that these barred galaxies seem to be assembling their stellar mass more rapidly than the unbarred galaxies. Okay, so one interesting, um, one interesting um, consequence, that's what I'm looking for, of what I was just telling you about barred galaxies being more baryon dominated is uh, in the Tully-Fisher relation. So if we go and look at the, this is showing you the, the Tully-Fisher relation for the Auriga galaxies. So we have the stellar, um, the stellar mass on the y-axis and the, what we call a V-flat, so the velocity at some, at some distance of 30 kpc in radius. Um, here we're plotting all the barred and the unbarred galaxies, and they are fitted um, uh, by this uh, line here, which is roughly not so inconsistent with what is found in observations. Um, what, however, the interesting thing here is that now if we go and we fit a curve separately to the barred galaxies and separately to the unbarred galaxies, um, this is what we see here. So you see that for a given V flat, the barred galaxies have a slightly higher M star. So this is a consequence of what I was saying before, that for a given halo mass, the, the, the barred galaxies have a higher stellar mass and more baryon dominated. So there is a, an offset between the barred and the unbarred galaxy Tully-Fisher relation um, in these uh, cosmological simulations. Now, um, oh sorry, that's this should be Tully-Fisher, not abundance matching. Sorry. Um, so what this is telling us is that if we were to observe this, um, if we were to detect such an offset in observations. This would rule out something like, for example, modified Newtonian dynamics, which is another very, um, like a, a popular alternative to, um, to Lambda CDM, where you don't have dark matter, you just modify the gravity. Um, because in, in the Mondian framework, you, you should have essentially zero intrinsic scatter in this relation. Um, whereas um, you see here that there is some intrinsic scatter, and we can explain the scatter in terms of barred and unbarred. Uh, population as well. Um, another thing we can go look at is how um, the XC2 bulge affects the formation of bars. So um, here I'm taking the fraction of, I'm looking at the fraction of accreted stars in the central regions of the galaxy, and I'm taking this to be kind of a proxy for some kind of spheroidal bulge, because um, actually getting the fraction of the spheroidal bulge is non-trivial when you have also a bar in the center, et cetera. Um, so doing this kinematically is not easy. So what I'm doing, I'm assuming that if you have a high exceed fraction, you've had a lot of mergers, and so you'll have a more uh, kind of dispersion dominated um, uh, bulge in the center. Um, and what we can see uh, here is, so on the, uh, over here, I, what I'm plotting is the offset of these galaxies from the abundance matching relation. So what I was showing you before, the, how offset they are from the abundance matching relation. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the accreted fraction of stars. So what you can see, first of all, is that the barred galaxies have, on average, a lower accreted fraction than um, the, the unbarred galaxies. 
And the other thing is that as you get more offset from the abundance matching relation, it looks like the accreted fraction slightly uh, increases. So it seems that unbarred galaxies have a higher a, a fraction of accreted stars, and also that um, as you as as you are more offset from the abundance matching relation, you have a, a higher uh, fraction of accreted stars in the unbarred galaxies as well. The other thing um, to note here is that if we look at um, the tumor Q parameter, which tells us how hot the disk is, um, we can see that the, if, you, if we look over here, if we look at the tumor Q as a function of look back time for the barred and unbarred galaxies, we see that the unbarred galaxies have a higher tumor Q um, at all times. Um, so this is in agreement also with, with theoretical uh, works that unbarred galaxies have a higher tumor Q. Um, and the last thing we looked at was at the gas fraction of barred and unbarred galaxies. And uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, the gas fraction on uh, the y-axis and the stellar mass of the galaxy on the x-axis. And the symbols are as before. So red um, is for the barred galaxies, blue is for the unbarred galaxies. So if we take the gas, the average gas fraction for the whole sample, this is what's shown here. So if we look at all the halos, and we look at the, the gas fraction for the unbarred galaxies, we see that it's higher than the gas fraction for the barred galaxies. However, um, one thing you'll uh, notice if you look um, over, over here is that you tend to have more barred galaxies. Barred galaxies tend to be more massive. Um, and at the low mass end, you have fewer barred galaxies and you have more unbarred galaxies. Um, so this... Um, so if we only look inside this region here, for example, so if we take the, the high mass spin, let's say, and we look at the gas fraction of barred and unbarred galaxies in this region, we see that the gas fractions are much more similar between the barred and the unbarred populations. Um, so this seems to suggest that at least in these simulations, there is no difference in terms of the, the gas fraction for barred and unbarred galaxies when we account for the differences in stellar mass in these populations. So to summarize, um, what drives bar formation in the lambda CDM cosmological context? Um, and this is a kind of a, a little summary plot here, but basically disk dominance clearly plays a role in which galaxies uh, have bars. Um, having a low accreted bulge fraction also um, meet, will lead to these galaxies, uh, have it, to galaxies having these bars in the cosmological context. Um, the barred galaxies also have low uh, disk velocity dispersion, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a difference um, between in the gas fraction of barred and unbarred galaxies for a given stellar mass. Um, so bar formation really involves a very complex multidimensional parameter space. Um, but one nice thing about these cosmological simulations is that you have all of these different things happening at the same time, and you have a big kind of um, uh, population of galaxies that you can probe, and so you can, it's interesting to see the parameter space of bar formation in these simulations. Uh, how much time do I have left? I'm still okay? Yeah, okay. So the last part I'm gonna tell you about is on the evolution of bars in cosmological simulations. Um, so one uh, thing to, to that uh, Camila already touched upon yesterday is related to the bar length. So one interesting thing that we found in these simulations, in the Ariga simulations, is that if we look at the bar length as a function of time, um, and we separate into galaxies that form at different times, we found that the bars that form very early on, so this is shown by the light green curve here, the bar length doesn't seem to change much. So it, the, these galaxies form with long bars and they kind of stay long throughout their evolution. Um, then um, bars that form at intermediate redshifts, they seem to form with slightly lower bar lengths and then they do in, indeed grow with time. Um, and then the bars that form at very uh, late times, they, they start to grow, but they haven't had enough, enough time to grow much. Um, so bars that form in the early universe seem to form long and kind of saturated, and meaning that they don't grow much more. And we uh, kind of speculated that this is because all of these bars, they seem to form around the time of a significant merger. 
So this is plotting, this inset here is showing you the bar formation time and the time of a significant merger for these galaxies. And you see that the bar formation time seems to correspond very well with the time of a significant merger in this, for these galaxies. So it looks like these, uh, if you have kind of a, a significant, I don't wanna say major, but an, a significant merger, which is gas rich, um, happening at early times, this can, it looks like this can really trigger the formation of the bar. Um, and uh, see also uh, Alex Merrow's talk uh, on, on this in the next days, uh, looking at this in particular in the context of the Milky Way and the Gaia Enceladus sausage. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the bar length at the time of bar formation as a function of the, essentially when the bar formed, the bar length at redshift zero, and this is showing you the change in the bar length. And what you can see is that the oldest bars, they don't change much, their bar length doesn't change much. The intermediate cases, they have the most change in their bar length, and then the youngest bars uh, don't, don't, haven't had enough time to grow, let's say. This has the interesting um, implication that the ratio of bar length to disk size, if we take the, the ratio of bar length to disk size, which is what I'm showing you here, this will, um, at the time of bar formation, this will have a steep slope in terms of depending on the age of the bar. So older, so bars that form earlier in the universe will have a larger ratio of the bar length to the disk size as compared to bars that form in the, in the at low redshifts. Um, and this relation, however, flattens out by redshift zero. So by redshift zero, if we went and we looked at these galaxies, we would see a flat relation. And that's because um, the disk size um, grows um, so that the, the, the disk grows from high redshifts to low redshifts. And so this pushes, uh, this pushes these down. So these that are up here end up down here, and that's because the disk also grows from high redshift to low redshift. Um, so this is something that could be tested. For example, we can look at this um, in the local universe, this RB over R disk, and then look at what, the, what this ratio is at high redshifts and, and see if there's a difference. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is the evolution of bar pattern speed, which is uh, something that um, uh, has been of interest of late. So um, as I kind of hinted at early on in the talk, there is this interaction between the dark matter halo and the bar um, through this effect called dynamical friction. So dynamical friction basically tells you that if you have a high mass particle that's moving through a sea of low mass particles, um, those low mass particles are exerting a gravitational force on the high mass particle as it's moving and they're pulling on the high mass particle. Um, and this is kind of like a frictional force, a gravitational friction force that will slow down this high mass particle. Um, and this was uh, first uh, described by Chandrasekhar in the 40s, and later this was uh, generalized to spherical uh, systems by uh, uh, Tremaine and Weinberg. And when we have a barred galaxy, we have a bar um, rotating in a galaxy, this bar can also experience dynamical friction from the dark matter halo, because you can think of the bar as rotating inside this uh, the, the sea of low mass dark matter particles. Now, if we look at the angular frequency of stars in a galaxy, so this is what's shown here, the, the angular frequency of the disk as a function of radius. If we have a bar that has a given pattern speed, um, there is a radius at which the pattern speed and the angular frequency of the stars coincide. And this is called, um, at this radius is what we call the rotation radius. So star, on a nearly circular orbit at this radius would be uh, rotating at the same angular frequency as the bar will be co-rotating. Now, if, if we have dynamical friction, what happens is that the, um, the pattern speed will decrease. So the bar will rotate more slowly. So as the pattern speed decreases, the co-rotation radius will move outwards. Um, However, if you have a lot of dynamical friction, you might not have um, as much of the growth of the bar um, through trapping of new orbits. So I uh, remember Leah was talking yesterday about the different ways in which the bar can exchange, can lose angular momentum. One way is by trapping more uh, stars onto elongated orbits. And the other way is, is through this kind of slowdown and dynamical friction. 
Um, so you, if you have a very massive concentrated dark matter halo, um, the ratio of the corrotation radius to the bar radius can increase. This was um, uh, shown in this work by De Batista and Selwood, where they show, um, here what they're showing is the uh, disk, the velocity, the circular velocity of the disk over the halo um, at its peak. So basically you're looking at how much the stars are contributing to the total rotation curve. Um, and on the y-axis here, they're showing the um, corrotation radius to the bar length, so this uh, squiggly r parameter. And so what you can uh, see is that when the stars are contributing uh, a lot to the rotation curve, so when you have a disk-dominated system, um, what happens is that, so when you have a disk-dominated system, then your curly r is very small, it's close to one. Um, however, when you have a dark matter dominated system, um, your curly R is much higher. So your corrotation radius over the bar length is uh, much larger. Um, so we can look at this by plotting the corrotation radius versus the bar length. And we have, um, a, people usually separate this into fast and slow bars by the, when the ratio is 1.4. Um, so below this green line are fast bars, above this green line there are slow bars. And uh, observational studies um, tend to find that in local massive spiral galaxies, bars are fast. Um, so this suggests that at least in these cases, there's not been much of an effect of dynamical friction. So what are uh, cosmological simulations finding in this regard? So here, there haven't been too many studies um, on this until the last few years. So one of the first studies that I'm aware of at least was this study by Al Gore et al in 2017 that looked at the Eagle simulations and this other study by Peshkin and Wokas who looked at the illustrious simulations. And um, essentially what you can see is that, um, this, is a, this is now showing this in log scale. Uh, you can see that these are very slow bars up here. Um, so the Eagle simulations, they, they slow down a lot in these simulations. And you can also see that in illustrious as well, this ratio is, um, yeah, has a, an average of around five. So this is much larger than one. Um, so Eagle and illustrious would fall somewhere up here in, in this plot. So uh, previous studies of bars in lambda CDM find very slow bars compared to observations. And there's also, um, in some, some later work, for example, by Roshan et al. in 2021, who looked at TNG 100 and TNG 50 simulations, and they also found similar results. So you see that they, they lie, this is where the barred galaxies lie in TNG 100 and TNG 50. This is where the observations are. So they, they claimed to find a 10 sigma discrepancy between observations and the TNG 50 and TNG 100 simulations. Um, so that's where uh, TNG would lie. So of course, this raises the question of are our fast bars incompatible with CDM? Now, we also went and looked at this in the Auriga simulations, and I was very excited for the answer to be yes. Um, I wanted to find it, this tension as well because um, that would be a really exciting thing to find. Uh, but when we looked at the Auriga simulations, this is what we, um, we found. We found that the Auriga simulation, in the Auriga simulations, the bars seem to lie roughly uh, on top of the observations. And remember that in Auriga, these are also in the Lambda CDM framework. All of these simulations are cosmological simulations in the Lambda CDM framework. So that was um, unexpected. Um, so we were, at the time, there was only these studies by Eagle and Illustrious. So you can see the curly R for Eagle and Illustrious here, and for Auriga, it's down here, and it's quite close to what we see in observations. Um, so yeah, bars in Auriga are fast in agreement with observations, but of course, this raises the question of why are Auriga bars faster than in other cosmological simulations? since these are all in the same framework, cosmological framework. So we looked at a few different things. I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but we looked at a few different things that could be causing this difference in, in, the, in, in the slowdown rate, um, slowdown factor. 
Um, but what we, what we didn't find a difference or we didn't find something that could explain this, what we did find that was different between Ariga and Illustrious and Eagle was this V star over V tot. So how baryon dominated these galaxies are. So you can see this is V star V tot as a function of radius and you can see that Ariga galaxies lie above um, Eagle and Illustrious at all radii. So they're more baryon dominated. Um, so, so this is just to say this is this makes sense within the theoretical framework, right? We, as we were saying, if you have a more bary baryon-dominated system, you expect less of an effect of uh, dynamical friction, so less slow, slow down bars. And this is what what we found. So this all kind of makes sense. Uh, however, one interesting implication of this is that if we look at this plane of the stellar mass over the um, halo mass. Um, also divided by the, the baryon fraction. So this is kind of telling you a, a star formation efficiency, a global star formation efficiency for galaxies as a function of stellar mass. Um, this will tell this means, this implies that the, this has as a consequence that the Auriga galaxies lie above the illustrious and the eagle simulations. And also they lie above the abundance matching relation that's given to us by, for example, the abundance matching uh, relations of, of Moster and others. Um, however, what's interesting is you can see there are some data points here. So these are from um, the work of Posti et al in 2019 from the Spark sample, who showed that when you look at massive spiral galaxies, so this is stellar mass and this is the same parameter F star, so the stellar mass over the baryon fraction times the halo mass, um, they found that there, the massive galaxies also lie um, above the abundance matching relation. This is, and uh, I just want to emphasize, this is from observations and dynamical modeling of observations. So they, they basically modeled the observed galaxies in the sample called Spark, and they found that these galaxies lie above the abundance matching relation. Um, and this is actually in agreement with what we're seeing in Ariga. So also what we see in Ariga is that our galaxies need to lie above this, uh, are lying above this abundance matching relation. Um, so what this is telling us is that barred galaxies actually should be baryon dominated in cosmological simulations. So they need to be offset from this uh, abundance matching relation in order to have dynamics and pattern speeds that are consistent with observed bars. If we, if we force um, these galaxies to lie on the abundance matching relation, what we need to do is we need to remove, um, we need to increase the feedback to decrease the stellar mass. And then we have dark matter dominated systems that lie on the abundance matching relation, but then their dynamics are all uh, messed up. And this seems to be compatible with what's being found also in observations and dynamical modeling. So dynamics of stellar disks and bars can help us constrain galaxy formation models. And uh, most cosmological simulations are producing under massive stellar disks, meaning that feedback is too strong. Um, and this is a problem that's been seen already in simulations. This is not the first time. So this is again, this is now looking at the model that I was telling you about before by Bovey and Ricks, who, are, who did a dynamical model of the Milky Way. And this is um, from the illustrious TNG simulations, TNG 100. This is from the work of Lovell et al. in 2018. And this green point, points here, these are the, the dark matter halo from Bovey and Ricks. You see that in, in the Milky Way model of Bovey and Ricks, the dark matter halo is very subdominant in the inner regions. It grows very slowly. And this is the dark matter halo found for Milky Way mass galaxies in TNG 100. So it's much higher and much more concentrated in the inner regions than what dynamical model, models are finding. Do I have, yeah, a few minutes, okay. So then uh, lastly, I wanna tell you about this recent work by uh, Alex Brook, who um, was a master's student. He finished um, at, at Durham, um, which is on the, looking in a bit more detail at the effect of these subgrid physics that we've been talking about in cosmological simulation, how they affect bar dynamics. So what Alex did was he went and he took some of those Auriga simulations that I was, um, that we looked at their bar pattern speed. He took those same simulations, he took the same initial conditions, um, same uh, yeah, exact setup, but essentially what he did was he changed the subgrid physics and he put, instead of the Auriga subgrid physics, the Auriga galaxy formation model, he put in the TNG model. 
Um, so this is the same galaxy formation model that was used to run the TNG simulations. And remember, I was showing you how the, the galaxies in TNG are, are much slower, uh, have slower bars than the galaxies in Auriga. So we took exactly the same galaxies, the same halos, and we re-ran them with the TNG model uh, in order to look at what would happen to the bar properties. Um, so this is what we found. This is showing you one example. So this is showing you the curly R as a function of look back time. And the blue line is um, from the Auriga halo. And then the green line is the, the same halo, but now run with TNG physics. And what you see is that um, at early times, well, this is, this is quite messy here, but basically at early times, um, they have quite similar curly Rs, but then the, the curly R in the TNG case increases at late times. So we see that even small changes in the subgrid physics can really have very significant effects on the dynamical properties of the bar, and this can lead to the slowdown of bars. Um, and you can see this here also in this plane of the corrotation radius versus the bar length. So um, the, in the case of the Auriga, you see that the galaxy stays uh, kind of fast at all times. And in the case of TNG, it, 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 it grows, um, it becomes slower. And you can see that what's changing is that the corrotation radius is increasing while the bar length stays the same. Um, so if you look at all, so we did this for a few galaxies, um, and you can see this in the R corrotation R bar plane. The blue points are for Auriga, the green points are for TNG, and you can see that things are moving towards the left. So they're all becoming uh, kind of slower in um, in the when we run things with the TNG model, and um, you can see that if you look at the halo mass versus the stellar mass they all move down in stellar mass. So um, the blue points again are the Auriga halos and then the same halos in TNG. You see that they're for a given the, the, the stellar mass decreases when we use the TNG model. So this, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So this is kind of an explanation of, of why we see these differences between the Auriga and the TNG model um, simulations. It really seems to be due to the subgrid physics that are used that in TNG are more kind of aggressive, you have stronger feedback, and this makes less massive uh, galaxies, and then their dynamics is, is wrong. So I'll leave you with my take home messages. So cosmological simulations are a powerful tool for studying bar dynamics. In terms of the formation of barred galaxies in cosmological simulation, we find that bars in the Auriga cosmological simulations are robust, long-lived structures below redshift of two. Bars form in baryon-dominated galaxies with low accreted ball fraction and low disk velocity dispersion. And in with, within the lab stadium framework, the Tully-Fisher relation of barred galaxies should be offset from the unbarred population. And in terms of the evolution of barred galaxies, we find that um, old bars can form long with saturated bar lengths. Intermediate bars grow longer with time. Um, bars can be fast in lambda CDM, but massive barred spiral galaxies need to be baryon dominated for this to happen. Um, and we can use bar dynamics to try and constrain galaxy formation models because even small changes in subgrid physics will change things like the stellar to dark matter ratio of galaxies, which set things like how fast bars can be, for example. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this indeed very interesting talk. So uh, if you have uh, questions, I don't hesitate, okay. Thank you very much for the talk. I was curious in the project where you compare between bar and unbar galaxies in cosmological simulations, how do you do the classification? Is machine learning sophisticated technique or is something more manual? And which is the size of the data sets? Like how many galaxies you have of each type? So how we classify unbarred and unbarred galaxies in the cosmological simulations. In, in my case, in the case of Auriga, what I did was I just took the M equals two Fourier mode of the surface density um, yeah, projection. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, basically I use, um, I look at the M equals two Fourier mode and then I say if it's above a, third, a certain threshold, then these are barred. If it's below, they're unbarred. Um, so yeah, there's obviously some freedom with what kind of threshold you pick there. Um, this was just for the Auriga galaxies are just 40 galaxies, so it's a very it's a small sample. Um, but then the TNG 50 sample uh, simulations, I think they have of the order of like 100 
200 maybe far galaxies. Someone else would, would know that in, in more detail. Um, yeah, was, I think was, that was a question. Yeah, how many? Hi, Francesca, thank you very much. It was a really, really nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about the subgrid stuff, the galaxy formation models that you're using, um, which some of which you answered uh, when you talked about Alex Brooks's master's project, which is really interesting. Um, what is motivating those models? You talked about how uh, the Origa subgrid maybe had more aggressive star formation or more, or more the, aggressive the TNG, feedback. The TNG one is more aggressive. Okay, yeah, in, in so, so what, how are you calibrating those? Where, where do those models come from? Yeah, so, so this is no easy game to play to calibrate these, these feedback models. So they're um, calibrated on usually like redshift, redshift zero results in terms of like the luminosity function that, or the, the mass function of galaxies, basically. In, in observations. Sorry? In observations. In, yeah, sim the simulations are calibrated on redshift zero observations. Uh -huh. um, things like um, the mass function of galaxies, the luminosity function of galaxies at redshift zero. So the simulations are basically calibrated. So this, the feedback prescriptions are tweaked in order to get something that is reasonably matches what we see in observations. So this is one of the reasons why, let me go back to, yeah, something like this. So um, if, you, if you see this, um, the gray line is, um, you know, from this abundance matching relation, so observe, uh, simulations, cosmological simulations like Eagle, Illustrious, TNG, also Auriga, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get galaxies to fall on this line. Um, now, to get galaxies to fall on this line, you have to basically increase feedback at high masses to reduce the stellar mass to push, to push the galaxies down onto this line. Um, so that's why... Eagle, for example, and Illustrious, you see they're much closer to this line than in Auriga. That's because in Auriga, um, we, the calibration wasn't done like as carefully and as minutely because we used a few cases, they seemed to match. They were like, okay, that's probably fine. And then when they ran a larger sample, a lot of them fell above this relation. So that was a bit of an oopsie moment. It was like, uh, they're a little bit too massive for what we would like. That's a shame, but never mind. But then it turns out that when you look at the dynamics of, this, of these galaxies, they're actually much better what we see in terms of the bar dynamics than the other ones that have been forced to kind of fall onto the abundance matching relation. And this over here kind of offers an explanation of why, that's hap why, that, why this is happening. And that's that um, the average abundance matching relation is downturning. But if you separate into massive spirals um, and ellipticals, you see the massive spirals are going up. And then there's a later work by Posti actually showing that early types lie below this relation. So the average relation is still downturning. But if you just look at the spirals, they're actually going up and the early types are falling below it. And so um, this all seems to kind of make sense in the sense that the, the, the spirals actually need to be more baryon dominated um, and the early types less. But most cosmological simulations and galaxy formation models have not been trying to implement that so far. Um, so they would just try and force all the galaxies to kind of lie on this relation. So they would calibrate the feedback until that happens. Um, but then you have some issues in terms of the dynamics of these massive spirals. Makes sense, thank you. Thanks a lot for a very nice uh, introduction. Review. Uh, I was curious. You said that uh, bars uh, uh, that, that that form uh, at high redshift are um, are long lived, and um, for example, uh, a merger can also induce bar formation. I, I was curious if these long lived bars uh, had any uh, sort of fairly large merger happening after the bar formation, and did they sort of get destroyed? Uh, yeah. Um, so if if yeah, so the question is if the um, if these can have massive mer if these um, old barred galaxies have massive mergers happening afterwards after the bar forms, it could be um, whether or not the bar will be destroyed will depend on how massive the merger is. If it if it destroys the disk completely, then it will destroy the bar as well, of course. Um, 
yeah, so it will depend on on a lot of details of the of the um, of the merger itself. In the case of the uh, of these galaxies here, they don't have any uh, very. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't checked if they have any what would be called merge major merger after the bar forms. They do have some mergers, but none of them seem to destroy the bar because the bars are are long lived. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the nice talk. I had two remarks. Um, one is uh, concerning the, the, the way to destroy bars that is not really considered in the cosmological simulation context. It's just if you accumulate a few percent of, of the mass and the bar inside the, the lean red resonance, destroy the orbits and the bar dissolve. So in the cosmological context, if you have this uh, two dissipative uh, uh, f uh, sub subgrid physics, then you can have no bar. And I've seen this in the past, many the simulations were, were completely uh, destroying the bar. So, if, uh, so you might think, uh, look at just this effect. It's very sensitive, you don't need much mass, but um, and it depends on the subgrid physics. The other point is the, this uh, uh, weinberg tremen breaking of the bar. Uh, it's a very simplistic model because they consider a rigid bar, so it shouldn't ta be taken too seriously because if you replace this model with a double star, a big, two mass, they are self-gravitating, then you find just the opposite. If you break a double star, you, you, you shrink the orbit and you accelerate. With the rotation speed. So this, this model is is not good enough, I would say, for the bar situation. Yeah. Yeah. I on the last point, I mean I would definitely be very interested to see like newer uh, models on this. But I think this has also been shown um, in N body simulations, for example, by De Batista and Selwood, they also find this this breaking, right? So it's you also see it as well in the, the self-consistent end body simulations yeah. as well. But definitely, I think there's more work to do there from the purely theory side to understand it, what's going on there. Um, for the, um, for the, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. So if you have, what you're saying is that if you have um, a lot of gas that's very dissipative goes to the center, if this becomes massive enough, you could destroy the bars. Mm -hmm. is, is that, yeah. yeah, yeah, so absolutely. And I think, I mean, that doesn't seem to be a problem in models like, um, for example, in Auriga. Um, and this, of course, is very sensitive to things like the star formation and the feedback model that you put in. You need to be able to efficiently get rid of the gas in the center in order so that it doesn't accumulate. Um, so this doesn't seem to be a problem in Auriga, but I do agree that that probably is a problem in some other uh, cosmological simulations that, yeah, this is very sensitive to what you put in, in for the feedback. Because if you have a lot of this gas reaching the center and becoming very dense, you can destroy the bars. Yeah, absolutely. Which I think is yeah not happening in Auriga because of the way the, the feedback is done and stuff. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, I have a question about the Tully-Fisher relationship. Uh, when you discuss the systematic offset, it seemed to me like the difference was very small, and I don't know if it's related to maybe the sample size or any systematics. And on that same uh, topic, maybe you mentioned, but is this consistent with uh, local results, like in local galaxies? Because I assume there's many samples with a lot of uh, bars and... Yeah, so that's a really uh, interesting question. So let me go back to this. Um, so yeah, so the difference is very, very small, you're right. Um, and it's actually, you'll notice, it's exactly of the order of the, so this here is the, uh, this. so this is the uh, intrinsic scatter um, when you take into account the barred and the unbarred galaxy population. And you see that the offset is exactly of that order, right? So you have to have, I mean, you're going to need good observations to, to measure this. Um, this is compatible with what we see in, in observations. So I compared this to, um, for example, the spark sample. Um, the, the 
the scatter is much smaller than what that we see in the observations, because of course you have additional observational errors there. Um, but this is very much compatible, uh, like this relation is very compatible with what we see in the observations. This offset, um, so I, uh, I'd be very interested to know what uh, other people uh, who know more about this um, have, have been reading in the literature. So I found, um, I think two papers that discussed this. One was from Sakai in the early 2000s. And um, they looked at a Bard and Unbarred galaxy sample and they seemed to find a difference between the Bard and the Unbarred sample, uh, in between the Bard and the Unbarred galaxies. There was a later work by Courtois um, who looked at two samples of, of um, two samples, yeah. And they, in the, they had a, a larger sample uh, of the two. And in that one, they didn't find any offset. And that's what they conclude in that paper that there is no difference between the barred and unbarred population. But I, to my knowledge, I don't know any more recent works that have uh, specifically looked into the barred and unbarred uh, population in terms of the Tully Fisher relation. So it seems to me that this was something that kind of got attention like 20 years ago, people looked at it and then it was settled that there was no difference because of this of one of the papers, and then I haven't seen much on it. So I think it would be interesting now with uh, you know newer samples to um, newer data to, to have a look at this question again, I think would be very interesting. Okay, thank you for this very nice talk. Uh, my question is about the bar slowdown rate, uh, whether this could depend at all on the way the simulation is done, I mean, the, the the gravitational part, let's say in the naive uh, dynamical friction model, you could play with uh, how much mass you give on the particle, the number of particles and so on. Well, if it's resonances, transfer of the angular momentum through resonances, that essentially should be a collisionless phenomenon. So my question is, could the discrepancies be any way due to the way the simulation is done? Um. I mean, in principle, um, these the errors in terms of the way the gravity solver works in these simulations, in the cosmological simulations, they are, you know, controlled and you know tested, and people try to make sure. I mean, the people who are really going into the nitty gritty, they try to make sure that these things are not um, playing an, a role in terms of affecting the the, the results. So I. I'm not sure that it's something in the gravity solver necessarily. Um, yeah, and I also think there's been enough, a lot of uh, simulations that have shown these this kind of result using different codes and different setups that I think that's that wouldn't be um, the issue because this is just an end body solver basically at the end of the day, right? With a lot of other hydro and fancy stuff added on top of it, but. It's, it's just an end body solver. So I don't, I don't know that that would be making these differences, but of course one can always, yeah, double check and be more careful, yeah. Any other question? Yes. Thank you for an interesting talk. I would, ask, I would like to ask uh, what, uh, what can we learn about the factors that prevent the bar formation in cosmological simulations, like other galaxies that host bars and do not host bars, somehow different, and uh, what parameters are there that we can check to understand what prevents the bar formation? Since uh, there are a fraction of galaxies in the local universe that are, of course, these galaxies, but they do not host the bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. That's so. Uh, that's kind of what I tried to, to to summarize here is the different things that we looked at in 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 this um in these simulations, and this is uh, like the differences in the barred and the unbarred populations. What what are some of the differences that we think might be causing the fact that some are barred and some are not barred? So what are the main factors? So all of these factors can yeah. So the disc yeah, all of these factors exactly. So disk dominance seems to how disk dominated the system is. So how um, 
how much, uh, how early the galaxy forms and how many stars it forms in a given dark matter halo play a role, which is essentially driven by its formation history and its merger history. Um, then that also then feeds into whether or not it will have a, a bit a smaller, large accreted bulge fraction. Um, it's a classical. And, uh, it's a classical bulge. I mean, classical bulge here. Yeah. So the, I'm. Yeah. So as I said, I was. I'm using a created bulge fraction, which I'm taking as a very rough proxy for classical bulge. Okay. Though that can be debated how, how accurate that is. But I think to to answer your question, the, in the end of the day, essentially what's playing a role is the is the formation the merge, in a way will be the merger history of these galaxies, right? So the barred galaxies. Uh, if you look at how the mass builds up, the cumulative mass um, for the stellar component, which is the red solid red curve, you see that these galaxies are often, um, they tend to form uh, more rapidly than the unbarred galaxies. They tend to assemble their, their mass more, more rapidly. And then there will also, I mean, this is, I mean, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface right there. So I think this is one thing that this will lead to higher disk dominance, lower accreted bulge fraction, lower velocity dispersion in the disk. And then I think the other thing that we are still exploring in the cosmological simulations, which is very interesting, is the effect of interactions and mergers on triggering bar formation as well, which is something that, you know, in a lot of these cases, in some of these cases, you might have galaxies that aren't baryon dominated that experience an interaction that, you know, triggers, a, triggers bar formation, for example. Okay. Thank you. On that note that you just comment, I was curious, um, if you go back to that slide that you have all the factors are different between barred and unbarred galaxies. So I was wondering how that would look if you separate between barred galaxies that were uh, triggered by interactions, if they would look more like unbarred sample or the bar sample? Yeah, they do. That's a, a very uh, good uh, question. So if you plot the, um, in a lot of these uh, properties, the galaxies, well, okay, I should say, the galaxies that have bars that have undergone a recent interaction where it looks like maybe the bar was triggered by the interaction, they seem to have, they, they don't necessarily lie in the parameter space of the barred ones. They seem to lie more in the parameter space of the unbarred ones. And just to follow up, I was wondering, uh, this is the, let's say the current characteristics, right? So how do they compare before the bar forms? Um, so for some of these cases, so for example, in terms of the um, disk velocity dispersion and the disk dominance, this is the same as, as we go to high redshift, yeah. I, I didn't check this for the accreted bulge fraction. That's because of a technical reason that we, it's harder to, we have the accreted lists of stars at redshift zero, but I don't have these at higher redshifts in the simulations. Um, but yeah, so all of these, apart from, the, apart from the accreted bulge fraction, everything else is the same at high redshifts, yeah. Like, so it seems to be the same also at time of bar formation. Uh, I have a quick, quick question. Have you ever uh, tested uh, if there is a correlation, have you studied if there is a correlation in your simulations of the bar strength with the morphology of the features that are driven by the bar? I mean, uh, small strength rings or big strength uh, open spirals, not because you can compare with the observations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked into this, but this would be something very interesting very to look interesting into. Because you can you have a lot of simulations, so you can compare with uh, yeah. observations, and you can. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you very definitely. much. Yeah, that would be really interesting. That to check. interesting. Okay. Yeah. Is there any other question? Yes. Okay. Okay. It's a it's a nice question of what uh, Mirella asked because the dynamics, even if you have X one supported bars the features that, are, that appear are different in slow and fast rotating bars. So it would be really very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, future work. <laughs> okay, is there any other question? Yes, uh, before the coffee break, uh, Panos would like to make an announcement. Thank you again. Bravo. 
So uh, something that we are asked uh, all these days and uh, unfortunately we didn't get the needed help. We'll plug it in to show you about how you can uh, reach the internet from inside this room or from the building here in the academy. There are some small pieces of paper at the entrance, but uh, not to get uh, 40 pieces of papers, we prefer something, so if you can. So please take a note, and if one cannot take a note, then one can get a piece of paper at the entrance. But this is what we want to show you. Here we are. So I hope you can see that. The, you will recognize the Wi-Fi network is the upper uh, row of characters. But please, uh, if you're interested in, take the time to note the password. This is how you get, okay, or make a picture. Yeah, that's the easiest thing. So that's the announcement. So, okay, we go for, for coffee. Yeah, and you can take a little bit uh, more time for coffee because, as you will see, we'll have uh, a postponement of uh, a talk in the next session. So let's reconvene half an hour back in the room. Πανώ, στείλει μου τους επόμενους που φέρνουν τους παρουσιάσεις, ήρθε όμως, και είναι όμως. Ωραία, μπορείς να το δείξεις. Ωραία, μπορείς να το δείξεις. Ωραία, μπορείς να το δείξεις. Yeah. And this is an S. Yes. yes. CNS, ATH, percent, dollar, number, MY, ACAD stream. Thanks. No, because they are in the cables that are in the shop. Yeah, that's sure. Because it would be not convenient for the speakers. Yes, but uh, you know, there's no, uh, the cables are not too long, so the controls are here. Yeah, yeah. do the other side, you know. Yeah. This is always the paper. I mean, many things will be good. Yes, yes. It's just what's the good one. And it's the one that I'm sure no one is.
Okay, so, uh, so this is your yep, yep, okay. first yep, one, huh? Yep. Okay. Next one, yeah. those one or the warriors one that you were watching the first. Just move them on. Yeah. Okay. Now it's the time for the young researchers talk. Uh, unfortunately, we will not have the last talk of Dr. Merrow due to some personal reasons. So uh, either we will uh, uh, finish earlier or we'll have time for more questions. Okay. We'll see. So uh, the first talk is by Dr. Tom Linson, and he's going to talk about the evidence for bar resonance substructure in a cosmological simulation. Okay. So presumably you don't have to motivate many people as why we want to study the bar, but in case anyone still doubtful, I mean, it's a ubiquitous feature with majority of local galaxies having bars, and importantly, I mean, Milky Way has one. And also, I mean, while the bar is centrally located, it's probably a dark galaxy in the disk and also the dark matter halo. So it's not just um, for people who are interested in the central region of the galaxy. So those bar resonances, so we do what we had a lot of these things. So we um, in bar galaxies and over time, stars are trapped in orbit and resonance with the bar, as you have the bars a rotating potential perturbation and this then um, induces a torque in stars in the galaxy and then stars are trapped in that zone. And these resonances occur when they start orbit frequencies are also Vertical angular frequency, so when these have particular ratios between each other. This can also be um, expressed by the numerical value here, which is just um, the difference between the energy and the stars along the rotating reference frame, and then they And 
One example of such a resonant orbit is uh, a rotation orbit. And this occurs when a star's has a movement frequency, so the angular frequency is equal to the path speed of the bar. So as the bar rotates, the star moves along with the bar. Yeah. So we have a plot here. If we now have a um, rotating side page, um, <laughs> this one. It will um, so some other resonant orbits that you have in the galaxy. Orbits, which we have also heard about, which is a two to one resonance. Um, so we see that we go with twice. And these are the orbits which compose most of the bar. And then you have the co rotation orbit, which any resonance stays in this one place. And then you have the outer limb blood resonance. Um, something that we've also heard about, which is I mean, it's not like the relax, and you're meant to see all the bar, which lets it grow stronger. But this is just the dark matter. So you can't observe dark matter. What does it look like in um, the stellar halo? Something we can actually observe. But before moving on to that, just a quick tangent to energy and Energy on the y axis, so you just have the more negative you are, the more bound as a particle you are, and then the momentum on the x axis, so positive angular momentum program multiplied by largely angular momentum. The, uh, Momentum. And then if you find substructures in this space, these are uh, like, and the disk is just the region of the And then um, when people find substructures in the space of energy and the momentum, these are then frequently associated with the uh, This will be 
bit and so it's like as even Arkham Emerger has a pet. But then in section three, we're looking at our function data, we're looking at a feature in Gaia data. And to see if that's correct, they ran a test traffic simulation. Um, stars trapped in bad residence. We also did a follow up paper. Like what does the creature population look like? And you also have chemical abundances and you can see if we can find also um, any patterns here. So this is then what I have been looking into. And I've been using a halo of the Auriga superstar simulations, which Francesco also already mentioned in the talk before. And this is a cosmological zoom-in simulation using a repo. And this is based on the um, Auriga suite of um, Milky Way mass halos. But uh, uh, they do an extra step here, where each gas cell, instead of giving birth to one star, they give birth to 64 stars, which are then, so this is an efficient way to increase the stellar resolution. So it's still computationally much more efficient than actually increasing the resolution of all the parameters in the simulation. So in the end, this achieves a stellar particle resolution of 800 solar masses, which for a Milky Way mass galaxy is quite good in a cosmological simulation. So this is now achieving new resolution levels where you can um, study the dynamics of stars um, in the entire galaxy with height um, de in, in detail. So now, but to first convince you that we do see some nice um, sensible orbits in superstars, I'm just plotting, just, this is an example ILR orbit in superstars. So you can also see that you have a good temporal resolution so we can actually capture the orbit quite well. And this is then what a co-rotation orbit looks like in the simulation, and then an OLR orbit. I mean, I've picked these out to be nice orbits, but also these orbits aren't rare. You will find lots of these orbits. 
So these orbits seem to be making sense. But to find these orbits, so what I'm doing is I'm um, calculating the orbital frequencies using fast radio transform. And the time resolution of that is five mega years, which is limited by the snapshots of the simulation. So anything that's um, rotating very fast at the center of the galaxy, you won't be able to actually get proper frequencies for that because um, you only have information every five mega years. And this is done for 401 snapshots over two giga years for um, stars further out in the galaxy with a larger radius with three giga years. And then the bar resonance is calculated using the frequencies with maximum amplitude, then using this formula at the bottom. And this is an example of what this looks like for a co-rotation orbit. So we have a, um, the vertical frequencies here. So we have a nice distinct peak, which is then used for the, um, so these peaks are then used for the calculation of the bar resonances. And so we do see that in this orbit, you get nice distinct peaks, which you can then use to calculate our bar resonances. And the distribution of these resonances in the galaxy. So this is split into in situ particles and accreted particles. And in the in situ population, we see a very strong peak for the ILR orbits and another strong peak for stars and co-rotation. So these are the dominant ones here. You see a bit of um, OLR orbits and a tiny bit of these one-to-one um, -one resonant orbits. And for the accreted population, the picture is a bit different. I mean, don't have much at all of the ILR orbit, but we have lots of co-rotation um, orbits in the accreted population. Then also, I mean, some OLR orbits, and then a much stronger peak in the one-to-one -one resonance compared to the um, in situ population. So we do see a different picture in terms of the resonances between accreted and in situ particles. And now, before moving on to the sort of more detailed analysis, the actual motivation for doing this was looking at just a plot of energy angular momentum space was this over density here, which is quite clearly visible, and we just looked at that and thought, okay, I mean, at some point later on, we'll actually look what it, what it is now. That's what I'm doing. And then also the thinking was, okay, this might be something related to the bar. So it's this over density here. So now that I've got all the resonances of the particles in the simulation, I can now just start looking on into where do we find these in energy angular momentum space. And so now here we have a plot of energy angular momentum space of the whole galaxy, mm -hmm. and then plotted on top of that, are uh, in these different contours, stars of different resonant orbits. So in blue, we have ILR orbits. So we see that mainly at lower energies and confined on mainly prograde. And then in black, we have co-rotation orbits, which fall along this horizontal line here. But there's also a tail going along this over density to um, negative angular momentum. And then we also see this one-to-one -one resonance. So we have a population which is retrograde. Uh, and then also another discontinuity and just a jump where you have the prograde one-to-one -one resonance. And this retrograde one-to-one -one resonance is also found in a region of this overdensity and is also overlapping with um, co-rotation, um, particle co-rotation here. And this is just an example of what then a retrograde one-to-one -one resonant orbit looks like in the simulation. And to look a bit further into just how bar resonances vary in energy angular momentum space in the simulation, we just have a nice, um, uh, so we have, uh, this is taking the median um, bar resonance in each pixel of this plot. And we see that they um, have a progression of resonances where you have the negative one-to-one -one resonance here, and then just other resonances here. And also this negative one-to-one -one resonance is then continued by in the prograde so this is retrograde and prograde by the, um, in, for prograde particles by co-rotation. Whereas the um, prograde one-to-one um, -one, um, resonant particles would be the bright red ones here. So you have a jump to these here and these are continued by stars of co-rotation. And this is also something that is in line with theoretical predictions, where you also have this negative one-to-one -one resonance, a jump where they continued, where you just go from this to the bright red. And then this negative one-to-one -one resonance is then continued in the prograde by these co-rotation particles. So this also looks sensible in line with um, some of the predictions. 
But now we can also look at what does this look like in different areas of the galaxy. And to do that, let's have a just look at the spatial distribution of these orbits. What does that look like? So we have the entire halo here with the sun marked at um, eight kiloparsec distance from the center. And then the co-rotation orbits, these are also mainly found perpendicular to the bar, these slopes here. And also just from a solar neighborhood, you will capture a lot of these co um, particles and co-rotation. Then when you look at the particles in this retrograde one-to-one -one resonance, we see that it is a quite centrally um, confined population. So these, yeah, see, these are mainly found in the center. So in just looking at the solar neighborhood, you were only really capturing these particles here. So only capturing a smaller part of these retrograde one-to-one -one, um, resonant particles. So when looking at energy angular momentum space at around the center in a four kiloparsec sphere, and this is what we see in the in situ population. So you once again see that that's the over density here. I mean, you can't quite clearly see it with the um, contours plotted over. Um, so we have present here, but then this is much stronger in the accretive population. They can quite clearly here still see this over density, which is also then overlapping with the one to one resonance and the co rotation particles. And you also see these two strong peaks at. Um, one-to-one -one resonance and co-rotation. So we see this feature in both the accreted and situ population, but it is more prevalent for accreted stars. And this might be due because the accreted stars are maybe more halo-like and able to absorb more angular momentum than the in situ population. Now, if you look at the solar neighborhood, which is maybe something a bit more useful for something looking at it with Gaia data. So this is what it looks like for the situ population. So I mean, in the in situ population, I mean, you might, it's not, as clearly visible as um, looking around the center. But in the accretive population, we do still see this feature. And we do still, in the um, distribution of the resonances, we do still get these peaks even around the solar neighborhood. So even though these one to one resonant orbits are mainly found more towards the center, we do still capture them looking at the solar neighborhood. So this is good news for actually detecting this with Gaia. So now something you can also do in cosmological simulations, other than looking at accreted and in situ, is also we have chemical abundances. So now you can look like, what does this look like? Um, so what we see here is that even though this is a um, substructure caused by our resonance, it's actually quite chemically distinct. So this is the metallicity, so it's Fe over H, so ignore that. That is the value of the abundance of, of iron over hydrogen. And um, looking at, especially the accreted population, we see a very significant difference in the metallicity of particles in this overdensity compared to the surrounding particles, which we also see in the in situ population, where we see more metal rich particles in the overdensity compared to the surrounding particles. And so we find a substructure created by bar resonance, and this is chemically distinct. So this is exactly what people would be looking for in entering a momentum space. Oh, you see an overdensity, it's chemically distinct. People might just assume, oh, maybe this might be a merger. But what we see here is that you have a chemically distinct overdensity in this space, but it is not related to a single merger, but um, caused by bar resonance. So we can also look at, um, so what does this look like if we split the accreted population into different mergers? So, I mean, we can ignore the first two for now. I mean, these are just earlier mergers, which um, don't show this. But then we have these two later mergers. So we have two mergers which are found in this overdensity. So it's not just a single um, accretion event, which is then um, trapped in these resonances. But these two mergers are accreted at a very similar time period. So this might have something to do with that. And also bar formation happens shortly after these two um, satellites are accreted. So this maybe has, may have something to do with why you find these so strongly in this resonance, um, in this overdensity. And now before I get to the end, in another fun thing we can do is just look at uh, more of these, just of some videos of these orbits. So we have a co rotation orbit here. So in the engine momentum space, it doesn't move too much in a given orbit. So it mainly stays um, in the same area. Just a reminder of what does this orbit actually look like in the rotating reference frame. And now we can look at a one to one orbit. So it's Similar story, we just now had negative angular momentum and it's largely found in um, a small region here. 
and then just moves around the center of um, the galaxy like this. But then we do also find quite a large number of orbits which are a bit stranger than these. So this is, I mean, so what orbit do we have here? So it's something that is found both at ne negative angular momentum, but it also moves to positive angular momentum. So what is it? Is it a co-rotation orbit or is it one-to-one? -one? And what it looks like, it might be both. Because looking at how this now, how this orbit moves in the rotating reference frame. So this is something that looks more like um, co-rotation, but then we start seeing moving across the center of the galaxy. And now it looks more like one of these retrograde one-to-one -one resonant orbits. And if we now look at this in a inertial reference frame, is it? these videos I might be messing with it a bit. But yeah, so now in the natural frame, so we see this particle moving in this direction, but then at this point, it's changed direction. So it changed from being prograde to being retrograde. Mm. And this is not just a single case of this happening. This is actually, um, you can, um, this happens quite frequently and these particles move in energy and momentum also across this over density. So we see that particles can change from being co-rotation to this retrograde one-to-one -one resonance and that stars can change from being prograde to being retrograde and then also from retrograde to prograde. So then my conclusions. So we can now have nice new cosmological simulations which can be used to study bar resonances. And we have self-consistent environment information history. So we have now additional information that otherwise we would be lacking. So accreted versus in situ population, chemical abundances. And the bar has a significant impact on the inner halo, on the inner stellar halo, with both accreted and in situ stars being trapped in bar resonances. And this visible over density is caused by being um, stars being trapped in co-rotation and in a retrograde one-to-one -one resonance. And this is more prevalent in the accreted population. And there's also a visible difference in terms of the metallicity, which then again might be confused with a merger. And also, I mean, stars can change from co-rotation to one-to-one -one and um, retrograde to being prograde, so there's lots of more things to look into and lots of fun things happening in um, stellar dynamics. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Okay, are there any questions? Very nice talk. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, did you calculate the uh, Jacobi integral with E and LZ? You can calculate the Jacobi integral. Uh, I mean, the, these are taken from the simulation. I mean, you get a potential in the simulation, and then... And then you have omega, the, the pattern speed. So if you, if you had these plots with E, LZ, you would make moving time, you would see the particles, they, they go on and climb. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, this yeah. is something and to do the, at some point. But... The slope is just the, the pattern speed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you divide with to find the slope, you you find the rotation curve, but you can calculate the Jacobi integral. Mm -hmm. And then this is a constant or not exact in practice. But, so it's a nice way to plot the particles mm -hmm. because yeah. you have an action, an action or yeah, cool. While e, e on LZ, they change in time, as you saw, yeah, yeah. a lot. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely something yeah. interesting to look into further. So. Another question? So, thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, I have just a general comment about orbital classification. Uh, in strong bar cases, there is a large chaotic region in the co-rotation region there. So uh, I would feel safer in, in classifying the orbits with their energy, Jacobi constant, if it is possible. Because just imagine that, uh, well, in strong bar cases, we have many of them, as we can see in images of uh, bar galaxies where the sides of the bar are quite empty, then if you have a particle that is 
in all, by all means a corrotation part that has the energy of the corrotation. And for some reason you put it well inside the bar, mm -hmm. then it will take a lot of time until it finds the gate along the unstable Lagrangian points to get out. So all the time that it will be in the uh, bar region it will be classified as a two to one more or less particle, but it is a corrotation particle. Mm -hmm. And at the end it will express its uh, uh, character by doing, uh, by reinforcing the spirals of the rings, etc. So th this is just the, the common mm -hmm. element. Also, if you have, if you can um, distinguish your orbits, Mm -hmm. uh, between order and weakly chaotic with a chaoticity index. You can see that a lot of weakly chaotic orbits behave as order ones, but they can change their frequency with time. Yeah, so they're just capturing. You, make a yeah. you can find uh, why they change uh, frequency. They behave for a very long time as order orbits, but then they, they diffuse outwards. So yeah. maybe this will help you. Yeah, it's just, yeah, capturing case in a simulation like this is difficult, but okay. it's having something more, um, also yes, more mathematical will be. more to yeah. make this, this yeah. distinction. Okay, uh, another question. Hi, great talk. Maybe a naive question, but as someone who is interested in using ELZ to look for mergers, um, this is obviously like worrying to me. <laughs> So I guess my question is, is there, a, you can calculate if you know like the bar pattern speed and that, where these resonances should sit then. And so then can we calculate like where they should be if there's a bar that exists and then say, okay, well that's not a merger. And so if there's somewhere like there's stars in a different overdensity, then we can say that is a merger. Is that like a good way I mean, to do it? That, that, that should be possible. Okay, yes. great. <laughs> but then again, we can you would still find both in situ and accreted there. So it's, you can't say, okay, there's nothing there. So it could still be part of a merger, but because Mina saw this other merger, which was completely um, pushed into this overdensity. So you can still have cases where a merger will just come in and then um, be moved into this overdensity. So it's, you can't just say, okay, this is not a merger. It might, might still be a, a merger. Yeah, but maybe just a follow-up uh, comment on that also is that Assuming that we know the bar pattern speed well, which is still something that is being debated in the Milky Way, but yeah, then in that in principle you could yeah isolate that region. But as Thomas was saying, you still might have accreted material there, confusing everything. Other questions? So we thank the speaker again. The next talk is by Dr. Lopez, and uh, hi, he's going to talk about, uh, okay, the title is From Bars to Boxy Peanut Bulges, Formation, Formation Mechanism and Evolution in Cosmological Simulations. Do you need to maybe lose my cut? But I can use the other microphone if not. No? <laughs> it's not for you. <clears throat> Hi. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Paula. Um, I am a PhD student. I am working uh, with Sofia Cora, Cecilia Scana Pico, and also with the Galaxy Dynamic Group uh, from Durham University. And as the title said, I will be talking about bars and box dependent pulses, focusing on formation mechanism and evolution in cosmological simulations. So I don't know how to pass. I don't know what 
what I have to do. But, ah, okay. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I thought uh, starting with some big questions that we have in this field, but I will be going through this very quickly because we had the amazing lecture from Francesca this morning and also a nice presentation from Thomas. So um, the idea was to have in mind this big question as how a bar can be defined, how they interact with the guy that's in the host end, and what is now about the physical processes involved in the formation, in the bar formation. So the map of this talk will be this very brief introduction. I will try to do it very briefly. And um, then I will discuss uh, two um, projects. One of these, uh, one of them is BARS in TNG50, focusing on information mechanism, um, where I will show some results of this uh, paper that I uh, work in. And um, the second project is the study of formation and emolution processes happening in boxy peanut bulges in the Auriga simulation. So let's start with introduction. So what, uh, how a bar can be defined. So it would be very quick, right? From a morphological point of view, we can see in the inner regions of, the, of some of these galaxies, uh, this elongated structure that is made up by resonant stars. And we know the almost two thirds of the spiral galaxies in the local universe have a bar structure, so that made them a very common structure. So that's why it's a very nice feature to study. <clears throat> Now that we know what is a bar, we can think, okay, we have the bar in our galaxy, how they interact, the galaxy with the bar. So the bar are involved in the secular evolution of the galaxy. They can influence the dynamic of star, inducing different motion in the stellar orbits. They can also influence the dynamics of gas in the galaxy. The galaxy produces shocks over the gas, and because of that, there, uh, it's generated inflows of gas to the inner region. So if you have a big amount of gas in your inner region, you will have a big, um, a burst of star formation. So um, the bars are also at a, site, a site of active star formation. Also, the bars produce the distribution of angular moment of the galaxy, mostly from the inner uh, disk to the outer disk and to the halo. And another interesting thing is that some of the buried galaxies can experience uh, vertical instabilities, and as a consequence of that, they can form structures in the central regions that are these structures, the, the ones we call like boxy peanut bulges, and we can see in this uh, image of a etchon galaxy. So <clears throat> we have our definition of the bar, and we know how they interact with the galaxy. But we can go to the uh, beginning, how in the first place the bar forms, what we know about the physical processes involved in the bar formation. So basically you have a, a stellar disk and you will need uh, to have inst an instability in your disk. And this instability could uh, happen because of internal processes related to secular evolution of the galaxy or also due to external processes such as interaction with other galaxies. <clears throat> so now we have uh, in mind all of these uh, bases about this uh, topic. And then I will start to talk about this um, project the the idea was to uh, do a study of barred galaxies in the TNG-50 simulation and try to understand what was happening to that bar. So, as I say, we use the TNG-50 simulation. That is one of the third TNG um, simulation that has the illustrious TNG project. As we can see in this plot, there are uh, a lot of simulations. Here we, we have the information about the number of galaxies that they resolve, the mass resolution, and the, <clears throat> simulate, uh, the simulation volume. And as we can see in the, the TNG-50 is the one with the better mass resolution among the TNG uh, simulation of the illustrated TNG project. So the idea of this uh, work was to try to um, study some galaxies in a very uh, detailed way, so rather that um, in a statistical study. Having that in mind, we uh, construct our sample of galaxies that uh, uh, they are a galaxies that we took for a catalog process in 2022. Four of them have a bar of redshift zero and the other are unbarred at redshift zero. So as we wanted to do um, an evolution, uh, we want to study the evolution of the different uh, process uh, that uh, are happening in the bar, one of the parameters that we need was uh, the uh, time formation of the bar. So 
to uh, found this, we use the strength of the bar that we already heard a lot about this, this uh, M2 mode of the Fourier decomposition or a stellar uh, density distribution in your phase on projection. And then basically, if you have a bar, you will have a signal in this, and if you don't, you won't have the signal. And with this idea, we uh, construct that, um, that plot, that is the evolution of time of this, uh, of the maximum of this parameter. And with this, we uh, found the time formation for the RA4 bars. And we found that uh, there are four, but they exhibit a wide range of, of time formation. Two of them, they form very early on in the simulation, and the other two more, uh, more late, but uh, they have a lot of evolution until uh, red to zero. So as I say in the, in the introduction, there are different ways of thinking a bar from a, morphology, from a morphological point of view, can also think about from a dynamical point of view, we can think of the bar of this solid structure that is rotating to, uh, to a certain angular frequency. And this angular frequency is a very important property of the galaxies. <clears throat> so we want to look for it. We calculate the evolution of this pattern speed of this angular frequency for a barred galaxy. And we found that uh, there seems to be a little bit of increase after bar formation, but then with time, um, the uh, pattern still start to decrease. And we, we, we found that this uh, decrease in the pattern speed of these uh, galaxies was accompanied by the increase in the bar length. And this decrease also <clears throat> in the pattern speed is consistent with the transport of angular momentum. So as I say, in the beginning, we have transport of angular momentum, mostly from the inner regions to the outer disk and to the halo. So we say, okay, let's see how the halo spin of these galaxies evolve. So here we have this um, dimensional representation of the angular momentum of the dark matter halo. Here I have, as an example, one of the galaxies in the upper panel that have the evolution with time. Uh, of this halo spin inside 10 kiloparsecs mobile, and in the lower panel, we have the evolution for the whole galaxy. We did this with the whole sample. So here is the same plot that I showed before, but in the left side, we have the barred galaxies, and in the right side, we have the unbarred ones. And uh, we found that there seems to be a difference in the evolution if we saw, if we see the a central region or the region contained inside 10 kiloparsecs per mobile uh, respect to the total. When we see that the barred galaxies have an increase in the halo spin, um, mean, most of them, meanwhile, the unbarred uh, galaxy seems to evolve um, uh, constant, or at least constant. Um, so, Something was uh, something is happening in, in uh, more uh, internal regions. So we wanted to go further, so we want to look at the, um, the distribution, the, the mass content in an inner region defined as one kiloparsec mole. So here we have the fraction of a stellar uh, mass content relative to the dark matter inside this one kiloparsec mole, and we can see that both uh, type of galaxies they have an, um, a, a big increase uh, in this fraction from early times, but in general, the, the barred galaxies exhibit more amounts of, of uh, star uh, mass relative to the dark matter. And if we see the gas, uh, we uh, found that galaxies seems, uh, with bars uh, seems to possess a larger gas reservoir, but with the evolution and the formation of the bar, this uh, gas contents drops to zero, the redshift zero. And um, this is a consequence of the, this, um, the present of the bars uh, generates um, because uh, star formation bursts and then uh, the gas is consuming, con is consuming in, in stars. So <clears throat> one thing that we found in general is that it seems to be a larger baryonic mass concentration for barred galaxies than for the unbarred ones. The other thing that we wanted to study is try to understand how different stability criteria or instability criteria work. As I say in the beginning, um, a favorable scenario for the formation of ours occurs when an instability is triggered in the stellar disk. So we have a stellar disk, and then we uh, we could have for some reason an instability in our disk, and that it's necessary to have a scenario that favors the, the formation of the bar. So here we have two, um, two parameters. One of them is typical using semi-analytical models. 
One of them is measuring the global gravitational importance of the disk and the other the relative importance of the disk and the dark halo. So the FD, if uh, we have the, the first parameter, if we have this parameter is uh, higher than uh, one, this means that um, the, the bio, baryonic uh, disk have a more um, importance uh, in the in the overall uh, gravitational potential that they are a matter. Uh, so we will have in that case an instability in our disk. And the second parameter of this uh, is um, if this parameter is uh, lower than one on some authors use 1.1. 1 .1, uh, this is telling you that uh, you have um, a, over your whole system. Um, your stellar disk is more uh, important than the contribution to, uh, of the whole um, potential to the galaxy. So with these two parameters, we can define an instability region. So we say, okay, let's, um, let's uh, apply this to our galaxies. And this is what we found. This is evaluated at some point in the time, meaning that the triangles are the bird galaxies. And it is, this is evaluated in the time formation of the Barrett galaxies. And for the Barrett galaxies, we choose an arbitrary time of redshift zero because we don't have a time formation for Barrett galaxies in the Barrett galaxies. So in principle, it seems that the combination of these two parameters uh, works very nice. So we, but as this uh, is, um, is a thing that is uh, evaluated in one time, we wanted to see how this was uh, changing with time both parameters. So here we have the F this, as you remind the F this, the Y axis, the relative importance. And we have the evolution with time. So in principle, we can see that um, the Barrett galaxy centered in stable region a um, long time ago, four giga, uh, at the time of four giga years. Uh, meanwhile, the Barrett galaxies uh, never entered the, um, the unstable uh, region. And if we, see, if we look at the f vec parameter, we see that both Barrett and Barrett seems to be in a stable region um, since a long time ago, except at Redshift zero for the Barrett galaxy that coincides with the, the time that I decide to evaluate uh, this the plot that I showed you before. So in principle, we can ask how the efficiency of this uh, instability criteria works. Um, so I think that we found that could be a nice uh, thing to do combine it in order to see if our stellar disk will be becoming stable or not. But the use of this in cosmological simulation is, uh, is challenging. So I think that there's a lot of things to, to study in here and see if we can find parameters uh, that depends on other uh, physical properties that allow us to understand this uh, instability disk. Um, so, as the takeaways of the first project, uh, we found an increase in the halo spin in the central regions, and we found al also in these central regions that there is a significant contribution from the baryonic mass in, ma in Barrett galaxies. And there seems to be a difference in initial gas contents, as the Barrett galaxy seems to possess more gas than Barrett galaxies. Um, and the Barrett galaxies have a big uh, inflows of gas uh, that produce a uh, big uh, burst star formation. And then, so the gas drops to zero at, uh, at like the point. And that the use of instability parameters is a challenge. So there is a lot of to study there. So uh, now I would like to talk to you about a little bit, a little bit about this um, project that I am going doing that is uh, the ideas of star formation and evolution processes again, but this time with boxy peanuts pulses and using a different cosmological simulation, the Tsauriga simulation that uh, um, we, we already know the Ariga simulation from the previous talks. So as I say in the beginning, one of the consequences of having a bar is that some of them could, um, could experience these vertical instabilities and form these boxy peanut pulses in the inner regions. And this uh, structures has been observed in many, in many galaxies. So they are also a very interesting feature to study. So we use the, the, the Auriga's uh, simulation that consists in 30 halo that reproduce the properties similar to the Milky Way. 
And the goal of this work, as I say, is to try to understand how these structures form and how they evolve uh, in these cosmological simulations and uh, compare the results with observations. So to do uh, this, we analyzed these uh, 30 galaxies, these 30 halos, and we found um, that of the 30 halos, 20 of them are barred galaxies, and of the, that 20 barred galaxies, nine of them exhibit a boxy peanut component at redshift zero. There, are, there is an example of one of them, Auriga 13, we can see the edge on projection, uh, the density, the stellar density, edge projection in the upper panel and the unsharp mass in the lower panel um, at redshift zero. And the vertical lines are indicating the size that we found for this uh, boxy peanut, which that, as we can see, sorry, um, is smaller than the, than the bar. We found in general in our uh, sample that the sizes of the boxy peanuts um, were uh, at redshift zero were uh, 60% of the size of the bar. So again, we want to do an evolution analysis, evolution uh, study. So again, it will be good to have the time uh, when these structures form. So we try to uh, do an analogous analysis of the one I show you with the A2 mode for the bar, but we want to uh, found a parameter that allow us to measure the presence of the boxy peanut push. So we pass through uh, several parameters that are used uh, in usually, usually in involved simulations. And the ones who, burst, uh, who, wore, um, who work best is the median of the absolute value of the set coordinates. So here we have, um, again, Auriga 13 as an example, we have this, uh, this median of the absolute value of the set coordinates. I define it with that set symbol that you see in the Y axis. And we have the different radial profiles with time. So the color, now I see, I, I didn't put the label, but the color code is the time, uh, the look back time. So we have the violet colors, the darker colors at redshift zero, the end of the simulation. And further, we go to uh, brightest colors. So to do this, we, uh, we also test different ways of uh, isolate the bar and evaluate this parameter in, in the bar region. And then taking this, we can find in every snap if we have a signal of a boxy peanut or if we, or if we don't. And, okay, don't look the, the lower panel. <laughs> First, Auriga 13, the, the right one, yes. So uh, there we have the results of doing the analysis over this uh, median absolute value of the set coordinates. When we have the, the peak in the curve, then we will have a boxy peanut and we will take that as a time formation for the boxy peanut. And then we generate this, um, that, this um, method to measure the time for every snap and for every galaxy. There were cases as an example, I've got a team where we find a time formation for a boxy peanut around one giga year, but we also look back in time. It seems to be a few snap where you can see an, a boxy peanut which is structure, but it was only lived for one or two snapshots, or maybe three, but we saw something. So we do, uh, decide to define a, a weak uh, time formation. So, now that we have the time formation for a boxy peanut bulges, an interesting question to do is how this time formation is related with the formation, with the time formation of the bar. So here we have a plot in the y-axis, we have each of the galaxies that we study. And in the y-axis, we have um, a delta time that is how many uh, giga years after bar formation, this boxy peanuts uh, bulges form. So for example, zero means the time formation of the bar relative to each galaxy. And then the, the dashed horizontal line is one giga year after bar formation and so on. The stars are this uh, method that we use um, using the, the median absolute value of the set coordinates. So, in general terms, we found that the 
box CP not bulges in these simulations are forming in between 1.5 and 2 gigahertz after bar formation. So that was uh, that was an interesting thing to, to see. And then, as, as we are uh, studying box CP not bulges, an interesting thing to, to see is the buckling episodes, these galaxies, these, these bars experience buckling event, uh, buckling event episodes, meaning that when you have a bar in your electron projection, and if you have a buckling event, you will have a bending on your bar, uh, uh, breaking your mid-plane symmetry. So we evaluate this um, with different uh, uh, methods uh, visually that are the ones you can see as gray areas over the plot. That are the times when we saw that our bar was buckling but also we evaluate another parameters that are uh, used in envoy simulations. A bug is measured, it's a Fourier decomposition of your electron projection, it's measuring the amplitude of your buckling, or theta teal is the, 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 um, uh, the, the stellar, I am um, sorry, the, um, the ellipsoid is the orientation of your stellar um, velocities ellipsoid in the Earth's uh, plane. So these are, Parameters are used to, uh, yeah, find it. Um, they are used to use in these uh, simulations, but it's challenging. The visual method works best, and then we, when we studied the buckling, we we also wanted to look if uh, how the bucklings affect the the strength of the bar, and we saw that when you have a buckling, in particular a first buckling. Um, this seems to weaken the bar, so it makes sense with the result from any body simulations. But as you can see in here, there are two gray areas, meaning that we found some galaxies that experience double buckling events. There, there is a thing that it was already shown in embodied simulations. This is an example of Hauria 17. And we found that more than half of the galaxies, meaning five of the nine galaxies, oh, sorry, shows at this double buckling events. And to finish, we uh, found also interesting to see how frequent are the boxy peanuts uh, bulges in this kind of simulation, in the Auriga simulation in particular. And to do that, we first calculate the bar fraction is the curve that you can see in blue. And over that, we calculate the boxy peanut fraction, that is the pink one, and we compare with observation that in principle seems to, to work well. And we found at redshift zero that 40% of the barred galaxies have a boxy peanut at uh, redshift zero. So almost half of the bars have had a boxy peanut. So as a uh, takeaway from this uh, part, uh, we found a temporal uh, difference between the formation of the bar and the boxy peanut bulges in between one and two um, gigahertz after the formation of the bar. The size of the boxy peanuts that I um, that I was talking, we found that it's in between 40 and 60% of the size of, the, of their bar. Five or of nine galaxies exhibit a double buckling episode. And I have to add this uh, fraction that we found for redshift zero, that uh, almost half of the barred galaxies in this simulation exhibit a boxy peanut uh, bridge. So thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Paula. This was very nice. Um, I was curious because three out of your nine galaxies take longer than two giga years to, to form the box spinet bulge, right? So I was wondering. This plot. Yeah, oh, so I was wondering if you found anything that could. Explain this difference, like why Aurica 18 took much longer to yes. form it? Yes, this is, um, this is, uh, yes, this is interesting because we, the code is, is finding the peaks in this, uh, in this parameter. So it depends on how good the parameter is measuring, is measuring your, your, the signal of your box pin, right? So in this couple of galaxies coincide, uh, coincides with the ones that we found a boxy peanut that it was weak really early on. I didn't mention, but the square, the, um, the spark that is green, is showing that weak time. That is near the time that you will spec in between 1.5 and 2 gigahertz. 
But um, I will say that it will be interesting to see what happened if we have um, another resolution, maybe, to see if that will define the better structure that the method can measure it, or maybe a method that is more um, sensitive to the signal. But it's, uh, it's challenging to identify this structure in cosmological simulation because you have a lot of things. But yes. So, so your takeaway is that you think this is just a matter of finding them and they probably I fall think within is, two gigabytes. Yes, I think that is related or how well is the method to identify. Because if you have a boxy peanut that is very weak, maybe you will look at visually, but maybe you, you don't find like a very proper way to do it like in an automatic way. Because if you are measuring a very weak structure, you maybe are measuring things that are not boxy peanuts. So it's like you have to take care of yeah, with that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, do all your galaxies buckle, actually? Because there is more than one mechanism of the BPS bulge formation, like buckling. Sorry, I, I cannot. <laughs> Yeah. Do all of your galaxies buckle, like uh, all galaxies presented here? Uh -huh. Because there is more than one BPS bulge formation mechanism. Yes, there, there is. Yeah, uh, there is. A, yes, we found in, in this sample of galaxies, we found that all of them have a buckling event before uh, the formation of the boxy uh, peanut. Yes, I mean, could be also resonant trapping a yes. mechanism to form a boxy peanut culture. But, but in you, particular, but you don't see the resonant trapping. We, no. we didn't analyze the resonant no. trapping yet because we will need. Mm -hmm. I and mean, have you, and, uh, have you saw a double buckling events or like triple we, buckling events? Like yeah. the, yeah. Bu the bar can buckle once and then. And then can buck buckle buck again. Yes. Yeah, it's this thing that we saw in here. This, this, this. Um, Is it a common thing? It was found, yeah, it was found in embody simulations. I the, know, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Is it a common thing for your galaxies? All of them? Have. Yes. Five of the nine galaxies exhibit this. So it seems to be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? So we thank the speaker again. Thank you. Now we come to the last talk before the lunch break uh, by Dr. Nepal, Milky Way's old thin disk and a young bar. New insights on Milky Way disk history with Gaia machine learning and precise stellar ages. Can you make it to the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This one or uh, I try this. This guy's okay. This guy's I'll try. You can try it. Then you go first. Okay. Okay. Hi. So um, yeah. So my title is Milky Way's old thin disk uh, and a young bar: new insights from Milky Way disk history with uh, Gaia machine learning and precise stellar ages. I don't think we've uh, yet started uh, with Milky Way talk, so <laughs> I will give a brief uh, background on, and then present my. Uh, 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 research. So why do we want to study Milky Way? Uh, Milky Way is our home galaxy. Uh, it's a bar spiral galaxy with a central boxy peanut bulge. And uh, yeah, and it's the only galaxy for which we can have detailed observations uh, for individual stars uh, that is in millions of stars, right? Actually with Gaia, we have one, uh, like 2 billion stars that, that has been observed. 
So for these tasks, we can have astrometry, photometry, spectroscopy. So this is a very nice laboratory to test our galaxy formation uh, models and also our Rosetta Stone to understand galaxy formation models. But uh, although a lot of study has been done, um, not everything is well constrained. So there's much to uh, learn. Uh, so this is a classical view of our Milky Way. We have a thin disk, a thick disk, a bar, a bulge, a halo with globular clusters, other um, structures. But what is the formation mechanism and what is the relation between these various components and what is their origin epoch? That's the question many galactic archeologists ask. Uh, so how do we go about uh, tracing our Milky Way's history then? What do we need? So what we need is we need chemical composition, we need a stellar ages, position and kinematics for a very large number of stars to really uh, have a complete picture. That means for millions of stars. Uh, yeah. So where do these things come from? The, the atmospheric parameters, chemical abundances of our stars, uh, hopefully multiple species of, of elements come from large spectroscopy surveys. Uh, the 60 space space information, that is the position and velocities come from uh, Gaia and radio velocity from spectroscopy, uh, as well as equidistances, distances, extinction, uh, and ages of the stars are then calculated using some uh, codes, for example, uh, using codes like star house, which uh, I will also be using. So to begin this, like I said, we need, we need big uh, sample. So for this, what we did is we uh, built our uh, uh, big catalog. It's called RVHCNHCNN catalog. So in 2022, when third data release of Gaia came out, along with the 1.8 billion photometry and other parameters, they also released 1 million spectra. Uh, but most of the spectra were, were actually with a very low signal to noise for which they did not provide any parameters. Um, so then what we thought is, okay, so this is a big uh, loss. Can we really uh, do something to uh, make it usable? So we went ahead and built our own uh, machine learning pipeline where we uh, supplemented extra information from photometry, from parallaxis, and also the newly released Gaia XP spectra. So we added all this information to the um, uh, Gaia spect uh, RVS spectra and then came out our uh, TF log G, metallicity alpha abundance for the stars, which are very good uh, and comparable to um, the high resolution spectroscopic surveys. So now we have assembled this big uh, catalog we have about 12,000 metal poor stars in this catalog, about 19,000, 20,000 metal rich, super metal rich stars as well. Uh, now we go ahead and then use these uh, parameters to, in our Bayesian, I should put it in a code that I talked earlier, to estimate distances and stellar ages for these stars, extinction and stellar ages for these individual stars. We add this information and calculate velocities and orbital, uh, orbits using astro pi alpha to the maximum 27 potential. And this is our uh, final catalog. So of the 800 some, th some thousand stars, the best with uh, some quality cuts, uh, we have about 560,000 stars, for which the mean distance uncertainty is about 2%. Uh, we also have about 200,000 main sequence turnoff and subgiant stars, for which we have very good, uh, uh, very precise stellar ages and 1% uncertainty in this sense. Uh, why can we? Uh, how do we reach this is because for this, we, these are local nearby. So, so this red thing in here, I don't know if I can show you. So this is the distribution of our uh, full sample uh, in uh, galactic galactocentric grade R versus Z space. Uh, while the stars for which we could estimate stellar ages, uh, since the, these are main sequence turnoff and subgiant stars, these are nearby, so we only have uh, 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 the stars around this solar neighborhood. Okay, and this black uh, so this, these are around this uh, red contours. These black uh, dots are metal poor stars in thin disk orbit, which I will talk about in uh, upcoming slides. We do a lot of validation and testing for this uh, data set. Of course, the, the, the whole catalog is public, but this uh, catalog of ages and distances is not public, which will be coming yeah, as my third paper, uh, hopefully in a couple of months. Uh, okay, so now we assemble a big data set. So what problem do we want to tackle? So 
So let's begin with one of the major components of our galaxy. We want to answer when did the thin disk form of um, in our Milky Way. Uh, so there has been very uh, exciting discoveries at, at the high redshift front with many observations of cool disk galaxies uh, with ALMA and James Webb. Uh, similarly, the, uh, in the past five years or so, there has been very uh, many um, uh, studies showing presence of metal poor stars in disk orbits. Now, this is exciting because metal poor stars are usually very old. Uh, and then it's considered that metal rich stars are um, younger, but I'll show a little bit uh, different uh, answer later. But yeah, so metal poor stars are usually considered very old, and to find them in disk orbits means that uh, maybe disk formed earlier. Okay, so uh, we asked our key questions. Uh, does Milky Way have an ancient disk similar to this high redshift galaxies? And if uh, and then as suggested by these metal poor stars, and when did this disk form? Did it begin as thin disk or thick disk? That's the Question because uh, well thin disk and thick disk is still not completely um, answered. So this is our uh, full sample. And here on x-axis is the metallicity of our stars. On y-axis is the azimuthal velocities. Uh, the background is our full, our full sample. Well, most of the sample are in this uh, space, which is uh, the usual location for thin and thick disk orbits, uh, stars with thin and thick disk orbits. And here we kinematically selected um, stars. So these are these black uh, dots, which are metal poor, that is metal ECD is below minus one, which are confined to the thin disk, that is with Vmax below one KPC, and with a um, velocity above 180. So similar to those studies, we also find in our sample that we have metal poor stars in thin disk like orbits. Just to show that there are other um, uh, locations of other uh, populations in, in metal poor region, that is the UAC Sequoia, the Atari or metal weak this stack population is just shown here. So we find metal poor stars in thin disk orbits. Other, other studies just said maybe disk orbit, but we, since we have a big sample, we took the liberty to say, okay, let's search for them in thin disk orbits. We find, we do, okay. Uh, let's look at the ages for these stars. Now out of this um, couple of hundred stars, we do have ages for about 200 stars uh, because not all of them are in the main sequence of branch. So we, do not trust ages for giant branch stars, only for the uh, subgiants and ancient sun of stars. So if you look at the age distribution, uh, the black uh, stars, that is the, the stars in thin disk like orbits are exclusively old with, um, with, uh, with about 50% older than 13 billion years. While there is a significant portion of this kinematically hotter stars that are these yellow stars uh, with, uh, with lower V5. Uh, there is a group of these stars in here. So this sort of hints that maybe there is a different mechanism for these uh, um, uh, stars. Formation mechanism for these stars. Okay. So, yeah, so maybe one could say, oh, this is just a distribution of, uh, this is just a velocity distribution. Yeah, you find metal poor stars in uh, thin disk orbits, but there are a lot more metal poor stars in halo-like orbits or thick disk orbits. So, yeah, I just you found a small, uh, uh, like a tail of the distribution. But what what about if there is an old disk which extends to more high metallicity region? Uh, well, uh, for this we need, of course, ages. That's why we spend a lot of time calculating ages, redoing all this analysis, finding, uh, um, calculating better stellar parameters so that we could have good ages, right? So let's look at the stars. And uh, now what I'm doing in here is these individual uh, panels is showing tumor diagram with the inner. Um, Curve showing the canonical thin disk, the thick disk, and halo like orbits. If you go from top to bottom, you are going from older to younger ages. And from uh, left to right, you are going from metal poor to metal rich uh, 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 stars. Okay? So immediately, what you see is that, of course, lots of metal poor stars uh, down to minus 2.5 metallicity are in um, halo like orbits in the thick disk like orbits, and of course there are some metal poor stars and thin disk like orbits that we uh, found out earlier, those black dots. But what is surprising, what, what was surprising to us is that we also find significant fraction of old stars with, with a very wide range uh, on already in uh, thin and thick disk orbits at these oldest ages. Okay, so, so this was interesting to us. That in addition to this, we also find higher metallicity stars, even as high as solar or super solar metallicity at oldest ages. 
So what does it mean? That, that means that probably the old thin disk is not just metal poor, but um, it was already enriched to high metal state. Okay. So do we find any other studies sort of hinting towards space? So this was a study that came out uh, after we have already submitted uh, and uh, uh, came, came out in archive a little bit, little bit later. So this is a sample of uh, ara LIDAR stars which are thought to be exclusively old, but they also find a huge fraction of uh, uh, metal rich stars uh, reaching solar metallicity in uh, thin disk like objects. And actually they find a huge fraction of one third of them uh, and they say that this probably represents uh, an old component of Milky Way's thin disk. Okay, that's encouraging. So now let's look at uh, uh, some chemical properties of this uh, of, of our stars. We have this old stars in here, low alpha. This high alpha was expected. We have um, high alpha stars at uh, at old ages. We also have uh, old uh, low alpha stars. Uh, so that so these represent the low alpha thin disk stars. And uh, then, uh, as expected, the alpha abundance decreases with ages, and suddenly there is a small bump in here, which I will talk uh, uh, as a second part of my talk. Uh, so yeah. So now what we do is we want to check how exactly is the velocity dispersion for these thin and thick disk stars at oldest ages, and how do they fare with those high redshift galaxies that we um, talked about earlier. So what we did is we uh, kinematically selected low and high alpha stars, sorry, chemically selected low and high alpha stars with, uh, with alpha about 0.15 being high alpha and below that being low alpha. And uh, now we extend our age velocity dispersion relation to the oldest ages. So this is the blue curve is the low alpha stars which extends to, uh, to uh, oldest ages and so, so a slow rise in uh, alpha, but it is significantly uh, distinct jump in between of, of about 10, 15 to 20 kilometers per uh, second uh, in velocity dispersion. While our velocity dispersion sort of matches the high alpha velocity dispersion calculated for extra fraction sample of stars. So, so these are precise ages as well. Uh, surprisingly, we also uh, sort of have a match for uh, velocity dispersion from this Ritto et al. 2021 paper. So these are ALMA uh, observed in this galaxies for which uh, uh, they, they, they estimated the velocity dispersion. And uh, well, this is not an apple to apple comparison, but it was um, nice to plot them here and see that, okay, there is some similarity, but again, this is, this is not to be taken, uh, it's the same thing. Okay, so what do we find is that we do have an old disk, old thin disk, and it extends to oldest ages, and the velocity dispersion matches uh, somewhat seen for high redshift galaxies as well. Now, do we have more of these in other samples, or the samples that we can cross? So at the moment, we are uh, preparing um, a sample of about 5,000 um, astrocytic uh, ages calculated using individual frequency oscillations. And so this means that these uh, stars are with, with about 10% precision in ages. And for this sample also, we have um, you know, stars which are old and low alpha. Similarly, there, there have been other papers with other observations. I detail more in my paper, but uh, yeah, there is also one done with Gaia so they have kept with using main sequence turn up and subgiant stars. Okay, and we also find that GSE model probably happened around 9, 10 million years ago. And since we do have old thin and thick disk, both were probably splashed in this uh, splash or only the thick disk or high alpha stars that is usually considered. Okay. So now that was a story about uh, the thin disk or the disk of Milky Way. What about uh, when did bar form? Now we already had a lot of talk today. Uh, I'm in a room full of bar experts and I, my expertise is not dynamics or simulation. So, uh, but, but I think our data, new data set can tell us something about uh, probably um, um, that will interest a lot of you. Okay, so when did uh, Milky Way bar form? Is there a consensus? Let's look at it. Uh, while looking at uh, the age distribution of Bald and Bar region, we find that it contains predominantly old stars. Okay? But there has been study uh, just, uh, using uh, microlens stars, using star formation history, using deep HST observations that probably there are there is about 20% of stars that are younger than five million years. Uh, Paul and Weinberg said that Bar may be young, looking at the carbon stars, it could be as young as 36 million years. 
uh, while Tobias Bach uh, used a simulation to uh, find the uh, bar from his time of about 80 million years ago, this is also supported by Wiley et al. giving a lower limit of about seven, while Tepa Garcia used a simulation to match the uh, Milky Way properties, Taylor simulation, find uh, about 3 billion years of bar from his time. Um, you know, so, and also to explain the newly discovered um, uh, the, uh, the dia snail uh, spiral phase, uh, spiral, spiral structure discovered by, by Teresa Antoya in Dia Dia 2. Sergei Kopasov ran a, so he said that uh, a bar buckling event within the last 3 billion year, uh, year can also produce this Dia snail uh, feature. Uh, Mintev et al. also suggested a bar to be young uh, at 2 billion years uh, while studying kinematic features in the uh, nearby space. Uh, while Sanders et al. recently suggested nuclear stellar disk formed in a significant burst of star formation about 8 billion years ago. Uh, however, um, uh, these uh, uh, authors studying the star formation history also of nuclear stellar disk suggest that there is, a there is a majority of stars actually older than 10 billion years with a significant fraction of about 87 billion years old and maybe 15% as young as one billion years in the nuclear stellar disk. So, uh, majority papers hint at an older bar, uh, but there are suggestions uh, for a long time that maybe bar is also young. Okay. What do we know about bars at high redshift? We, we've seen that uh, uh, with, with uh, recent papers showing that presence of bar structure in this many waves as early as, as redshift four. Uh, yesterday, we had a very nice talk uh, from Camila saying that Milky Way bar could range throughout uh, a cosmic time as young as 1 billion years to 12 billion years. So what can we tell extra about using this new data set? So we went ahead and, uh, and looked at supermetallic stars. Why supermetallic stars? So supermetallic stars exclusively form in the inner galaxy. They do not form here in the, in the local solar neighborhood. So whatever stars we find here in the solar neighborhood probably migrated here from the inner galaxy. Okay. Can we use this, this their migration uh, uh, as, uh, as, as putting an extra constraint on uh, bar formation? Okay. Let's see. Uh, by the way, this is a new map of, uh, um, of our galaxy, uh, colored in metallicity, where you see that uh, uh, metal rich stars are, are sort of exclusively in, in the inner galaxy. This, um, yeah, this is from a new paper that, that we recently released. This is about 220 million stars using IXP, uh, uh, IXP spectrum. Okay, let's see. So we took our supermetric stars uh, in our sample and we started to plot uh, not only supermetric stars, but we took our stars in the uh, in, in this uh, stars with ages and we started plotting their guiding center radii in different bins of metallicity to see what do we find, okay? We see that as we go from metal poor, so this is around minus 4.32 or minus 4.2, as we move, as we keep on increasing the metallicity bins, the metallicity in bins like this, what we see is that as we go from, uh, from around metallicity minus, uh, metallicity point one dex to, to higher, we see that the guiding, uh, guiding radius of the stars, uh, of the stars, the solar neighborhood start, start to show this bimodal distribution. Okay, they peak at around, 6.9 to uh, 7.9 to C, and they also sort of sort of so an abrupt uh, stop at around nine-ish kilopascals. Okay, so we 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 think that this is probably related to bar resonances uh, or maybe fire alarms, as these radii have been suggested to be uh, bar OLR, bar core rotation around six, maybe higher order bar resonances around these. 6.9 or 7.9. Okay. Let's see it more clearly. If we take all our stars that are confined to the disk, okay. so if we take all our stars that are confined to the disk, that is with Gmax below 1 kpc, and plot uh, this beautiful uh, R versus V5. Plot, what do we see is that we see these ridges kind of uh, well-known ridges uh, in this uh, uh, RV5 uh, space. Okay, now let's uh, keep only metal poor stars that are metallicity below minus 0.2, do we see them? Uh, the sort of the ridges disappear, okay? But if we keep metal rich stars, 
in the same space, we see that they sort of clump in these two locations and maybe there is a sharp cut, okay? Now, it is, it is, it is understood that if these stars were brought from the inner, uh, uh, from the inner region by, by a, uh, and, and, and travel via bar resonance, they would be limited by uh, outer limb bar resonance. And uh, we find that there is an abrupt uh, absence of metal rich star beyond this line. Okay. So uh, what, we sh what we saw with this is that metal rich stars, supermetal rich stars actually uh, so very nicely uh, the effect of bar resonances in the distribution. Okay. Okay, so that was with very smaller sample. That was just a couple of thousand stars. Let's do the same game now since we have a big catalog that we recently made public. We have about 7 million stars uh, with Gaia radial velocities and, and, uh, and our metallicities. We do the same game. We, we take uh, stars and plot uh, uh, now their guiding radii in different bins of metallicity. And this dash dot line show uh, higher metallicity stars, metal rich, super metal rich stars, while the solid line show metal poor stars as well. And what, what we see is again, we see the same feature, but now in very big sample that uh, super metal rich stars sort of do not like to go beyond uh, 9.2 kiloparsecs. Okay, this with what we think is uh, limited by the OLR. Okay, thank you. This is just preliminary work. We try to fit some Gaussian mixer models to try to find where these peaks are. This will be uh, hopefully coming soon. Okay, so now we 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 understood that uh, metal rich stars like uh, to follow bar resonances. They are uh, uh, they, they they trace it well. What about the distribution of their ages? So in this plot, what we are doing is in each age bin, we calculate the uh, mean metallicity of 20 most metal rich stars and try to trace the upper envelope of metallicity. Okay? We find that at around uh, three to four billion years, we see there is an abrupt decline of uh, uh, metallicity. So it seems that suddenly uh, something, hap uh, so something happened and then there is no more supermetallic stars here. Okay? We, we find the same trend with other uh, samples as well. Uh, for example, the Ashton sample of Neo. Does this hint at something? Okay, let's look at age metallicity diagram and age alpha diagram. Do we find anything happening there? And we do find, we find that there is a very peak of star formation around four to, four to three billion years. This is very prominent. Well, we do also find this usual features that people have been seeing, uh, increase from, uh, from formation probably of the, of, the, of the thick disk, of the thin disk, um, rise of metallicity. But this is very prominent that around the same age that we saw a decline in, uh, in, uh, in metal rich stars. And this also corresponds to a slight bump in alpha, saying that this was a very strong star burst, causing to also increase the alpha abundance by, by um, slightly on. Okay. Similar, uh, okay. Now, what is interesting is that if you look closely, this is actually decreasing from higher metallicity to lower metallicity if we go in this age bin. Age bin. Similar dilution or decreasing trend for metallicity has been uh, for the same age range has been also reported by uh, Salo et al using Gala data set, uh, Karmi Gayat using the Sahomian history of Milky Way using Gaia data set. So, so something happened where the star formation began in pre enriched medium and then goes down with metallicity in this very short uh, epoch. So we say that this is probably triggered by BART because at the same time we don't find uh, metal rich stars in here. Why do we say that? Because like earlier speakers already explained, during the formation of bar, as the pattern speed uh, decreases rapidly, the bar strength increases and there is, a, uh, there is an epoch where you can, you can have very strong migration of stars to the outer disk. We think that this is what is happening at that moment and this is causing this. All right. Do we also see this in other data sets? So just to, just to briefly tell you, this is a, uh, again, Vensby 2020, 2013 sample. This is uh, microlens stars in the bulge. Uh, if you look closely, what they say is that the metal rich stars, so a wide variety of ages ranging from two to 12, uh, and has a dominant peak around four to five billion years and a tail to a higher ages. Okay. If you plot this line in here, you also see that around four or so, you see this decrease in, uh, metallicity with ages. Maybe it's related. I don't know. <laughs> this probably needs further study. 
But it's interesting that in the barbells region, we would have this metallicity peak and then decrease in metallicity. We also, what we do in this here is that, okay, uh, could, could we find some perturbation in the local disk if something happened at that uh, epoch? So what we do here is we again take uh, our ages and each bins of uh, stellar ages, we calculate velocity dispersion. The first one is the uh, sigma VR, uh, V phi, and then VZ. We see that, uh, so again, the black line is metal rich stars, super metal rich stars, while the red line is metal poor stars or, or rest of the stars. Okay? What do you see is that metal rich stars, so a sudden, um, so elevated velocity dispersions compared to the metal, popu metal poor population in this age bin at around four to um, two. This hints that whatever perturbation happened around the four to two billion years, this is probably an internal perturbation because this affects the metal rich stars more than the metal poor stars. So this is why we say that probably a Milky Way bar that we see now could be young because of these evidences that I presented. All right, so my main conclusions are here uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, very interesting talk. Um, okay, are there any questions? Thanks for the nice talk. This is a really great data set that you have. Um, so I'm wondering why, I mean, I, I see what you're saying about the metal rich stars and this burst of star formation, but I'm wondering why you don't think that could be caused by something like the passage of Sagittarius, which we know might be causing a burst of star formation in the uh, disk. You mean at which age? Sorry, I didn't get at which epoch? Uh, the, this burst of star formation around three giga years ah. that you show. Uh, well, because this burst started from a Again, in a pre enriched environment, that's what I'm saying. We know Sagittarius probably passed at around 16, 20 kiloparsec uh, away in the disk. So if that would have been the case, this, in, this would not be uh, starting from higher metallicities, right? Well, not necessarily, right? It could trigger star formation in the disk, in the disk itself. You could compress gas in the disk and this would trigger star formation in the disk. So this would... Enriched, be pre enriched gas in the disk that would be even mm -hmm. more enriched. Yes, it, it, it could, but then this could also should also explain the other observations we are seeing that in the bulge uh, or bar bulge region, we also had this burst of star formation at uh, the same epoch. Uh, that could be difficult to explain uh, by Sagittarius passing. Uh, Not necessarily, but sure. Yeah, I, mean, I guess some models would be good for that too to compare the different scenarios. Yes. yes. Thank you. I hope someone models this because this, I don't know. I, I don't know yet. <laughs> because the, the Sagittarius flow cuts the, the galactic plane uh, close to the solar system, to our solar system. I, I think it was calculated around 16 or 20 kiloparsec. I, I don't know so around solar system. Yes. So much. I'm just wondering about the selections effects in the Gaia or these catalog samples. What do you correct for the, the, sele the selection of distance? Or you have many bias that are very hard to remove. So how do they could affect the, the statistics? Yes, so we, we thought about that. That's why we were uh, skeptical when we said, uh, okay, why do we have this strong bimodality? There is no reason for these stars to uh, sit in these peaks. And then we thought this is probably due to our smaller sample, um, uh, some, some selection bias for the RBS data set. But then with the 7 million stars, I think it is, um, it's, it's, it's not easy to um, just say this by modality that we are seeing is because of selection effects. I, I guess for nearby stars, we can fully correct for extinction Yes, so we, 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 we correct extinction how, now. How far can you go? Uh, so for these, uh, I don't know if I show the data or not. So this is the full sample, but for the ones which we calculate ages are here. 
And all of these stars that, that I'm showing in here are with low extinction. We already removed the, those with high extinction. Can you guarantee the, the complete samples of the class of stars up to how many? No, I cannot. Stars? I have not done that. No. It's not a complete sample. I have not done that, no. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you plan on using Formos and how it will affect the results or make them better in any way. Sorry? I'm wondering, do you plan on using Formos in the future? And if it will affect your results anywhere, make, make them better? Probably. Well, I hope so. I'm in S3 and um, I'm making one of the pipelines, so <laughs> I will do that. Any other question? According to your results, you, you think that uh, you can say uh, for the thing disk that there was not a major, major event in the Milky Way. Why? Uh, for at least uh, um, the last eight uh, giga years. I don't know. The I results can... of uh, thin disk. You cannot conclude uh, this. No, we have not done that study. Okay. No. The metallicity, I mean, from the old stars. You cannot have a conclusion. Maybe I did not understand your question correctly. Uh, because you find a lot of old uh, stars from the metallicity in the thin disk yes. of the galaxy, you can conclude that there was not a major mer merger event, uh, uh, so we could have a starburst, starburst the last, uh, for example, uh, eight years. You cannot have such a conclusion. Uh, I don't think we can say that with, with, with what, we show, what, what I showed in here, because, I mean, old stars, Probably are all metal rich stars are probably all in C2. So okay. I don't know how it, this affects the merger scenario. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I did not understand. Yeah, very nice data set. I, I must say as well. Can you put the plot again of the, where you find the drop at three, four giga years? And you say that that's the age of the bar there. No, one more. This one, yeah. So the argument is that at three to four giga years, you you have a drop in the formation of supermetal rich stars at the correlation. Is that is that what it, what the no, I no I did not say that. I said is that in solar neighborhood we do not find um, that many metal supermetal rich stars beyond this three to four billion years. I'm not saying anything that has happened in the inner galaxy that could still be forming submetallic stars, but okay. here in solar neighborhood, we don't find them in our data set. Okay, but, but so how do you jump from that to, to the age of the bar? Well, like you said, the submetallic stars probably arrived here at this epoch in mass via these bar resonances. So if we, so the, the, so the last, epoch where they formed in the inner galaxy probably can give us a timing that, uh, well, these, these were the last ones that came along with the bar formation. Okay, so but, but this could be the last time that this happened, but not the first time that it happened when the bar formed first. So for example, why can it not be between five and six giga years, you have another peak and then a drop towards younger. Uh, that is why in our uh, paper, we put a question mark saying that this does not exclude an older bar. Okay. Uh, but what we're saying is that probably the one we're seeing now could be young. Okay. There could be a buckling that so, has happened, but so you or, have a kind know. of like a lower limit between three and four giga years, but it could be young. Yes. Yeah. So the one, I mean, you don't have to dissolve the bar, right? So the one that was formed five and six giga years might be the same one that we still see today. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have another process where you can, you, you still keep pushing your stars. And, and then you see stars now, I believe, for the years. Yes. That we have not excluded. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. One last one. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. It's more a curiosity because I don't know. So if I understood, you don't see meta-rich stars that are young in close to us, right? That's, no. 
that's what you're showing there. Yes. How long would it take? Um, what's the time scale to take the stars from the center of the galaxy towards us? Like, could it be that they're just not here yet? Uh, that could be. Okay. Uh, there's a calculation, I think, by Mage Frankel recently. He calculated something like 3.6 times age divided by eight. So I have to calculate. Uh, Thank you. There is a formula for that, but I don't remember exactly. Okay, <laughs> thank you. There is no other question. We thank the speaker again. So now we have the lunch break and we'll be back at uh, three o'clock. At three o'clock, please uh, remember for the speakers of the next session, Daniel and uh, people that uh, will uh, speak after the coffee break. Please contact our colleagues here so that you give the PowerPoint presentation, etc., and arrange everything. So three o'clock, we're back here. So the chair, uh, the, the chair is opening discussion. We are waiting for the Hello. Okay. So welcome, uh, welcome back for, from the lunch break. I hope it was uh, nice and you are well rested. You have a coffee. So uh, this afternoon we start with uh, Daniel Feniger, who's giving us a, a lecture on pattern speed of bars and spirals. Thank you. <laughs> Please, Daniel. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay. <clears throat> So the, the topic is uh, about pattern speed. And we have heard already uh, many, it's this, this notion is discussed uh, many times during this conference. And we will explain a bit uh, why and what's the situation about this, this single parameter. That seems just a parameter, but you will see it's, it's important. So first, uh, I will do some uh, brief uh, evolution how the community of astronomers has perceived galaxies over time and how this uh, evolution can learn us about uh, how, we, how we proceed and how we, toward what we, we converge. <clears throat> Then uh, we will define, it's a good idea in science to define what we speak about. So what is the pattern? Uh, we'll present some methods that we have uh, developed over the many years um, because we needed new methods or better methods. We tried to find different ways to do that because of some problems. <coughs> And then I will present as an application of some of these methods, what we have done in a, in a case of a simulation of a double bar galaxy, isolated galaxy, uh, pure uh, stellar dynamics, no, no gas and so on. And then I, I can, can conclude. So if you think about the uh, beginning of galactic astronomy among astronomers, uh, we can start around 1900. Captain uh, was devising the, the model of the universe as the Milky Way. In fact, the, the, at the time, the, the Milky Way was considered as the whole universe. And uh, not by all, but uh, at least uh, among astronomers, it was out of question to say there, is, there are 
they were, you, you have to imagine from Newton, say, to, to 1900, the astronomers were living in a world of stars. The stars, they feel the universe to, to infinity first at the time of Newton, and then they, they, with, with, with Galileo and so on, they, they were convinced that the Milky Way was, was making, was containing the stars. So it was not going to infinity, but so to some finite distance. And that's what, uh, what was the universe at the time. And it took still uh, many, two decades at least after Captain to really understand that, uh, say, Andromeda is, is another. <laughs> It's another galaxy like ours. And uh, then this idea that we had the uh, universe islands, um, island universe, sorry, uh, <clears throat> that because the, the Milky Way was the universe, and now we had uh, islands of universe. This idea of island of universe, in fact, is much older. You can, if you, I really recommend you to read uh, once if you have time a book by Kant, it's translated in English, French, and, and it's in originally in, in German, uh, by Kant. So you, you can understand how they were thinking, especially this person was extremely uh, a precise thinker. So uh, it's a good, a good reading to see how he was, uh, well before astronomer, he was guessing about the Milky Way, uh, and mostly the, this book is full of details that only in the 20th century uh, has, have been confirmed. Say. For example, he was guessing that uh, he was understanding that uh, Newton had a gravity theory, so he could use this theory for the Milky Way. And the Milky Way was just uh, an, an example of self gravitating system like the solar system and the satellite system around the, the, the big planets. <clears throat> and they were rotating in a disk and he was understanding that. And that the stars were, were not moving on circle, they were uh, have, having some velocity dispersion. That was also clear, you can find this in, in this book. And then he was understanding that uh, what's the next level in the universe. So he was extrapolating to what, what how would look the Milky Way far away. And he knew about elliptical nebulae, which were galaxies. Uh, and he, he thought that that's the, and then uh, from this epoch, there, there is this notion of island universe, in fact. So he was guessing already the extra galactic world, 170 years before astronomers. So after 1900, people understood that galaxies uh, are like the Milky Ways. There are other Milky Ways. And theoreticians were starting to make models. And uh, we had for the, between people like Jeans, Lindblad, uh, Lin Shu, uh, Kontopoulos, all these people contributed to, to model these galaxies. First, we do something simple. So they were doing um, a uh, simple axis symmetric stellar system, a bit on the model of star systems. That's why it's called stellar dynamics. Uh, and on the same uh, on the same model, they would do simple uh, <coughs> simple uh, models, axis symmetric, steady, of course, no evolution. And with time, it first it was steady, and then uh, Lindblad added. Uh, spirals and he was rapidly thinking that the spirals are not fixed in space but they may rotate so th this is the introduction of a pattern speed you have a pattern a spiral uh, rotating with some frequency uh, if we go into the 70s so that was for the spiral world because on plates the spirals they look bright because they were taking blue blue in the blue uh, you see the star forming region, so spiral is more prominent than uh, the, the stars, the, the old stars. If, we, if astronomy would have begun with infrared, the, the, the name of the galaxy would have been very different because the spiral in infrared, they are not so, so nice. 
um, then uh, it, it, around the 70s, uh, we had simulations showing that bars can develop in cell variating disks. And uh, spontaneously, that was a, a surprise. And people like Antopoulos were starting to model the, what is the motion in this kind of, of galaxies with, uh, with a bar. And the bar was rapidly thought to be a, a kind of extension of the spirals, just uh, M, equal, M equal two spirals, uh, just straight, special low, without understanding why. Um, and then we, in the 80s, Selwood, Spark, and also they, they found in simulation that in fact the bars, they rotate faster than the spirals. So you had two, two spiral, two pattern speed in, in models. So that was a break of, because once you do that, you, you cannot uh, assume a steady state. You have uh, something uh, changing. In the, in the time or so with the simulation, people, um, a lot of people saw that the pattern of the bar is decaying uh, with time typically. So it was not a constant of our time. It was a slow decay by uh, slow varying uh, variable. And then in the 90s, it was become, uh, it became fashionable to consider a double, triple nested bar, which each had a, could have a, a different frequencies, rotation frequencies. So that's complicated the, 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 the game, but nature was showing these objects in, in observation. So we had to take this into account. <clears throat> so already we have a multiple pattern uh, systems, it's already complicated on the point of view of making models. So, um, the, the way to approach this actually is not yet uh, well understood. We, we have to, how can we describe this in a synthetic, synthetic way? People continue to, as you have seen, to perform n body simulations because. Uh, it's the, the faster approach to answer questions in the present time. So we, we were doing uh, such studies because um, we, under, we were actually under, wanting to better understand this interaction between, uh, between spiral and bars because uh, they, they it's open new questions. To, uh, so we, we, during the simulation, if we look in, in detail, we see that um, the, the, the bars are not rigid at all. They, they, they move and the spirals as well, as they interact with the bar, they, are, they move. It's not a pattern that is strictly uh, rigid. So, and especially at the interface when the bar is close to a spiral, you get this uh, bar spiral interactions, which, uh, which complicate the, the thing. But it's just at the, at the place where traditionally we would put a corrotation. Corrotation is, is supposed to be a fixed structure in the rotating space. And if we have time dependence in this region, this delicate region on the point of view of dynamics, then it's, it's perhaps different. <clears throat> so what we saw is that uh, <clears throat> these regions are even more time dependent. If you want, you have a quasi periodic behaviors, but also how to, to, to predict uh, situations which uh, can be qualified uh, as chaotic. <clears throat> so it's, it's a simplified cartoon of uh, what we have in mind now. We suppose a model of, uh, of a bar, a big bar, and inside there is the smaller one rotating faster. What was supposed to be uh, stationary points, the, the Lagrange points are marked here. They are here stable, but it's just a cartoon. And then you see how the, 
it's it's how the bar spiral interaction might proceed because if the bar rotates faster than the spiral, at some point it overtakes them, and when they are close close by, then we can expect the bar should uh, reinforce the spiral structure by the gravitational uh, the deepening of the potential, and when they are in between, <clears throat> the the spiral arms might be more equal. And this provides a, a simple, say, uh, possible explanation of why sometimes people struggle, like in the Milky Way, to decide if the Milky Way has two, two bright, uh, two main uh, spiral arms or four. Because uh, if in time the, the bar, at some point the bar would show uh, equal four arm spirals, and at some other times, we could have uh, some could be brighter because they, they would form uh, more stars if, if the potential is deeper. So that's what's in opening this kind of time dependent situation, interesting uh, uh, constraint to, to check with observations. Uh, can we know now what's the phase difference between the bar and the spiral in the Milky Way? And can we trace that in? term of star formations, uh, histories, and so on. That could be interesting topics to, to examine. So that's just the same in non-moving. Uh... <clears throat> so the, the Stradwood paper uh, starting this discussion about the different uh, pattern speed you can see in this he had another uh, more detailed uh, paper with Sparky uh, later what is shown here is the the Fourier transform in time and in azimuth of a um, galaxy model and body simulation and you see that uh, first you don't have a single frequency you have a full range of frequencies in the spiral region, that's the outer arm, that's the radius. And in the inner region where in the model there is a bar, you have another uh, clump of frequencies <clears throat> um, at very distinct values. And they are uh, um, the, uh, in the, what would be called the co-rotation of the bar. Um, you see that there is an over overlap of the spiral on the, on the, on the bar. The, one has to remember this is an average over several rotations. Uh, so it doesn't describe the instantaneous situation. But it gives an idea, and especially the, the width of these frequencies shows already that uh, you have a considerable width that in the signal provided by the N-body simulation, you, you have a time dependence. You have frequencies that uh, are not the same. So <clears throat> it's a superposition of many frequencies with slightly different frequencies. So, but anyway, we can already see in this simple graph plot that uh, you must have a time dependence on the large scale. Like here, uh, we have the arm, the arms going to, to the bar, but perhaps later on, uh, the, the bar would be a bit offset and so on, the, the spiral arms. So it, it, it puts some questions like, uh, we must have a torque, a nice reciprocal torque, and the co-rotation is uh, torqued by both patterns at, with different phase. And um, this asks the question, does it make sense to speak of Lagrange points? Because everything is time dependent and Lagrange points should be equilibrium, uh, equilibrium point. <clears throat> so uh, that's just a contradiction. And then if you consider what's going on inside a, a big bar, a secondary bar, it's mostly should rotate at speeds uh, typically higher. So you, you can imagine the type of interaction of a small bar on the large bar, uh, torque, reciprocal torque on each. <clears throat> so this lead to 
view these objects as de time dependent in a, in a rather essential ways, at least in this region, in the interface region. You can describe an, an average bar uh, as quite well if you consider the far, not too close to corrotation or not too close to the inner bar. It probably makes sense to make some average modeling. But um, if we want to to grasp to to capture the the essential of these systems, we we have to consider this uh, time dependence. So we know the Milky Way has a strong bar, and uh, with which with this kind of of uh, properties. So when we, it's uh, a lot of people work on Gaia data and so on and try to model the Milky Way potential. And most of the, for a long time, these the models were purely axisymmetric, so ignoring the inner bar. And <clears throat> now they, they have a, they pro pro progressively these models improve, but still uh, you have uh, fixed, fixed spirals, fixed bars. And we live just not, not so far from the, the critical region. So if we live uh, something like here, when we observe uh, at reachable range, we are in a critical region, which, which should be uh, time dependent. So that can bring some, uh, <laughs> some confusion. We, we have heard for a while that the bar in the, there should be two bars in the Milky Way, one slightly uh, inclined with respect to the other. And probably this is because uh, people had not the same, uh, the same samples. And so if you sample just this part, you would find a different uh, direction than if you sample closer to the center. Anyway, we... <coughs> The, the way to model this is indeed to, to consider for some regions average situations and uh, with a proper pattern speed. So we have to know uh, what is the, if we do models like action-based model, we, we need these average quantities uh, quite well. And so we need uh, to be able to make a good, uh, a good models. And in these models, you, you see the, the, import, the dynamical importance of the pattern speed is as important as the potential itself. Because if you change the pattern speed by uh, 10%, typically the uncertainties are of this order, then it's the same as changing the potential by, by 10, 10%, which is a, a huge effect. <clears throat> So the best model we have now is to assume a constant. The, this constant rotating model is useful because in a rotating frame, the Hamiltonian is an integral of motion. It's the only integral, uh, global integral that exists in such a model. Uh, so it's, it's uh, very precious for uh, dynamical uh, considerations. And the fact that uh, the actions these, these magical quantities are robust to perturbation means that this Jacobi integral is the very, the first uh, quantity that should be considered in, in bar galaxies, like in models or even observation. I would uh, encourage you to consider this quantity because um, it, it is the, the one that is the least affected by, by perturbations. So just to review the, what we know about these rotating potentials. We have an Hamiltonian, which depends on in the rotating frame. So we have a rotating frame with the positions and the frequency omega uh, for one, one particle. We have an Hamiltonian, which has a conjugate momenta, P squared over two, the kinetic energy. Um, and then we have this, uh, this term, which depends on omega, which is proportional to the, here you see the, the angular momentum. 
and uh, omega of the rotating frame and the potential. And it turns out this is a difference between the energy of the particle and omega times the angular momentum. So this, this relation is, is uh, showing you that uh, uh, this quantity is constant, but E and L are not at all constant in a bar. You, you, it's, it's a strongly varying function of positions Okay, well, for a particle moving in a barred potential, the energy is not conserved, the angular momentum is not conserved at all. I mean, you can see it change sign in many times, or it varies about uh, by 50% or 100% um, very often. So these quantities are, <clears throat> are very time varying in this kind of situation. We can re rewrite this, um, this same uh, Hamiltonian, so this Jacobi integral, in the fully in the rotating frame. So we have here the x dot, the velocity in the rotating frame, minus uh, effective potential. It's a centrifugal uh, potential um, in, this, in this frame, and then the, the gravitational potential. The, it's interesting to notice that uh, conjugate momentum, if you look, uh, you have the velocity in the rotating frame and you subtract omega times x, what is this quantity, is just the tangential velo velocity. At some position, you have the tangential velocity. So it, you see P, the, this conjugate momentum is just the velocity in the inertial frame which is aligned with the rotating frame at given time. So it's, uh, this, this inertial frame is not always the same on, on time, but it's each time you, you have an inertial frame which has uh, this quantity. It's very convenient to use uh, in n-body simulation if you want once to integrate, uh, say, n-body simulation in a rotating frame. You just take your same snapshot with the instant, the, the starting velocity, and you see, uh, <clears throat> and then you, you, because it's in the inertial frame, you, you just use this for integrating the motion of, uh, and, uh, and then uh, you let the, the system uh, rotate. <clears throat> And then if you save a snapshot, it's, it's again, you, you save in the inertial frame by using this uh, conjugate uh, momentum. It's not, the, the, just the rotation is in between, uh, is, is rotating the frame. So we, we need only if you, we, we are used to use E and L, it's just because of historical region, reasons, uh, people have considered axisymmetric model of, of galaxies for a very long time. And in these systems, E and L are each uh, four integral, because L is a vector for integral, uh, sorry, uh, for spherical system. It's for axisymmetric system, you have LZ uh, is a distinct integral. So the phase space geometry, <clears throat> we, we can think of, of a bar rotating in a potential. If we have this, this view the, of the effective potential, it's looking like that. So near the center, it's looking like a typical uh, <clears throat> gravitational potential. Rotation has little influence, but as you, you get to co-rotation, the centrifugal and Coriolis forces are dominant. It's why suddenly the effective potential turns back. And here we, we are dominated by the, the rotating frame. <clears throat> it means that, you see, it's why, I mean, the, the pattern speed is so essential. It's, if you are wrong with your uh, omega, you, you change the, the height here of this, this crater and change the dynamics in your considered system. So it's indeed this core rotation region is, is what defines a, a barred system. It's the, the, 
so in in case everything is you have a uniform omega you you have typically lagrange points but you notice that uh, energy difference because it it's a potential it's an energy per unit mass you notice that um, there is a summit here and a kind of saddle point here they are almost at the same level of energy so it's very sensitive this this uh, corrotation region to perturbation if you reinforce the bar if the bar is more traction then this this saddle point goes down this uh, summit goes up and when it becomes axisymmetric the there is just a circular corrotation and the corrotation disappears it's no longer it's no longer a resonance if you don't have a difference in energy you you have no dynamical effect because uh, it's everything is equivalent so it's a uh, it's why this uh, this small difference in energy is going to influence a lot uh, when we see the spiral arm starting at the end of the bar it's you can bet it's just the region where here at the saddle point you you can change dynamics dynamics is completely different on this side and on this side so that's the first order dynamics of barat galaxies that has been considered for a long time in this uh, we had already uh, some plots like that this morning <clears throat> The orbits, the, the periodic orbits in this rotating frame are uh, well known. Uh, this X1 family, uh, you have here, it's not shown, but uh, it depends on much on the inner uh, mass distribution. You can have X2 perpendicular orbits. Then you have uh, this X1 orbit extend up to, so it makes typically loops like that. <clears throat> If you increase the energy of the, the Jacobi energy of this family, at some point you, you reach these critical points and then everything is changed. The, the orbits change. Uh, the, the influence of this, um, of this uh, fixed points are, are very strong. Around L4, L5, of, if the bar is not too strong, we can have this type of orbits. What is usually not described is when the bar is getting stronger, stronger and stronger, these full families, they become unstable, even complex unstable. So it means that the two strong bars, they, they, they destroy all the regularity that still exists in this region. And uh, so it's probably you can keep in mind that there is some limiting uh, factor to strong bars, not just because the inner orbits uh, cannot be, if they are too strong, the inner orbit also become chaotic, but also around the Lagrange points, uh, this is, uh, there is a critical value for the eccentricity of the bar to do that. And then outside, we, are, we rapidly get into the, the disk and the, influence of the bar decay uh, like uh, uh, a quadruple. So it's, it's, a, it's a weak weak effect as soon as we go beyond the, the lean blood resonance. <clears throat> we, we, we can model the outer part as a disk as usual, an axisymmetric disk. It's a good first order description. So, since this pattern speed parameter is so important, um, how do we find that? So I, I have described before how, the, how Selwood and Atanasula also for several years, they were doing this uh, uh, pol uh, polar azimuthal uh, Fourier transform, but also in time, they, essentially the, your Fourier transform gives you a phase, and this phase in, in, in time gives you a frequency of the, the phase rotating around. So you can deduce from that uh, uh, the frequencies. 
so from the, the Fourier transform. But the Fourier transform in time is a bit problematic because you have to take a base that is several rotations. So if you take too short, you have um, aliases and so on. If you take too long, you, you do, do an average over a long period, several giga years, and the, the system may in between evolve. Uh, so there was a Treyman Weinberg in 84, devised a method. Uh, I will go into detail uh, later uh, about the ideas behind that. Um, to get an instantaneous and global pattern speed. <clears throat> they were using a continuity equation. If you observe a flow of mass, typically, or it could be light, and you assume that this, this mass is conserved in time, you can deduce the constraint on the, on the flow, no, which, which uh, contains in, in it the rotation of the pattern. If there is any pattern of that. So that was, it's still a very widely used method. For example, in this paper, Corsini uh, et al, they were inspecting, because it's, it's a global, you, you have to integrate the light over the old, all what you can <laughs> over the galaxy in several slits. And then you, you sum different quantities in these slits and then you find uh, the slope of this, uh, of this uh, plot is uh, giving the pattern speed. The, so they take slits well into the outer bar and slit inside the inner bar and they could see the, the, the slopes were different. So that's first first hint that uh, this method can work to some extent, but the problem is, is, is this, um, it's exactly to control the errors because we integrate in regions which are obviously unrelated to what we, we want, <clears throat> and we can have a local perturbation. So, <clears throat> so what I was using say, in the 90s in then body simulation is, is more more is very straightforward. You you take an um, body model, you calculate the moment of inertia of the bar, you, you guess about the extent of the bar you want to probe, and you compare it with two snapshots with some small delta t, uh, the angle difference of this moment of inertia. And then you derive the pattern speed in the almost instantaneous. You don't take a too large delta t if you want something very, very. <clears throat> it's already good enough to say see that the pattern speed may oscillate over one rotation. Uh, such things. Uh, if the, but the, I would say the problem is exactly to to because you don't want to take the moment of inertia too far beyond the, the bar. So exactly how, how far you have to go to get a fair uh, sampling of, the, what you, of what you want to measure. So let's us define what is a pattern. So, in, <clears throat> so we can do like that. We, We say it's a, it's a function, we, we assume a function in some space, Euclidean space, depending on, on positions, could be a multidimensional space. It depends on T, and the function is a real function. We don't complicate at this stage. <clears throat> and the, the point is that this function in time has a special characteristic that the shape is preserved under some particular time transformation of the, of the coordinates. So you have a, a say a R is for rotation. You can imagine a rotation. You, you rotate <coughs> the, the function and then uh, you, after a time T, and then you typically have a shape here and after some, some time, the same shape is, is rotated or modified by the function R. So we would like to, knowing 
with this definition, we say it's, it's, we can, it's what we do usually if we recognize something is identical to another, we, we, we de decide it's a shape or an object and so on. Same object is just translated or rotated and so on. <clears throat> but if you notice the doing so, what is special in a, an object is not really the, the value, but the gradient that of this object are really important to characterize the shape. So the gradient are going to, to play a role. <clears throat> so let's do it in phase space. You just uh, take, you could do it uh, directly in space, or, but because we are on this, at this level, we, we can be more general. We can take a function f, which could be a, say, a distribution function, which depends on time and position and also velocity. Why not? It's just that after a time interval, it's the same, the same idea, but in, instead of taking a finite time interval, we take an infinitesimal one. And we, we just assume some rotation, simple rotation here. Um, we have a shape, we will just rotate it <clears throat> by uh, angle uh, d, d, d phi. So after a time dt, we have the same situation of time t, except for rotating these coordinate x and v with some angles. In velocity space, we can also rotate the velocities by some angle. Phase space is a is a special space. It's not just Rn. It's a combination of two R3. Uh, it's not just R6, so it's not a metric space, is what I want to say. It's a combination of two metric space in position and velocities, but you cannot rotate in this space, in the six-dimensional space, arbitrarily. You have to rotate only in the respective uh, space. That's why we separate here the, the two type of coordinates and you can get different parameters. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so d phi over dt right, will define the, the rotation, the vector rotation in space or the vector rotation in velocity space. We, we just expand this to first order. So the zeros order cancel and we get the first order constraint which is the, the instantaneous variation. At some point, you, the, the time variation of the function is this uh, combination of gradient of f in space and velocity space, and this combination of rotation speed, um, omega time x is, is the tangential speed in this, in this space. And then we rearrange this with the vector on uh, vector on scalar products into something where you we, we get the omega on, uh, separated. It's more convenient this way, as we will see. So this this is just a generalization of what Tremaine Weinberg used in the in their paper in '84 to to such situations. <clears throat> So what can we do? Is, well, just to remark, uh, of course, we, we can extend this. We could be even more general. Instead of taking just rotations, we can have translation, dilation, or even accelerations, uh, different transformations that could uh, also be interesting. Typically, it will give interesting uh, constraint if we have linear dependence on the parameters, because then we, we have this uh, rotation rate, expansion rates. So it could be used for the Hubble flow, say Hubble flow is expansion rate. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so now we have this time, we had this time dependence, local time dependence. We can get rid of this if we assume we have to introduce something. For example, Boltzmann equation is a, it's a relation between the local phase space density and and the uh, gradient of of this uh, function also so we can this is typically this term so we get rid of this dt by 
by uh, replacing with, with this gradient of f, which appear also on this side. So the same quantities can be used. <clears throat> and so you have a local constraint. Even in principle, if we, we would say, uh, I am, so I forget about velocities, uh, just looking in, in space, I have no dependence on the velocities. So we can drop these second terms. And I just look in the plane, I have just one single rotation parameters, omega. Uh, the, then you have a, just a single equation, even uh, at one point you, sh you could be able, knowing this, this thing, if you measure this and you measure the, uh, this term, you can derive omega. This is the tremaine weinberg uh, use of this type of equation. But you see, you can extend this in three dimension, you can derive the vector speed, uh, if you know the full gradients, and, and you can extend in, uh, here we assume omega is the same in velocity space than in uh, space, but it's not necessary. And you have to make it simple, uh, just do this. So now we have three, three unknowns, three parameters, if it's in, in, on three dimension. So we need three positions. If we know exactly the gradients there, we can find out the omega. You see, it, it seems to be easy if you have the three point in space or phase space, you can derive this omega. The catch is that you need to know these gradients and the gradients are known to be um, sensitive to measurement errors. So that's the difficulty. But you see, in principle, we can have a local, local constraint on these parameters. If we add, instead of three, we take more uh, numbers of points, what you get is a linear system with over-determined, more constraint and equ than the co uh, more equation than uh, parameters. So you can do a least square, it's a least square. Uh, um, uh, it's a li linear equation, such equations. I don't know if how many of you learned this at uh, in the applied mathematics course or something like that. Um, it's the way to formulate a least square problem, that a traditional least square. You don't uh, want to have a square matrix. You have U data matrix, uh, one on, the, on one side, on the other, and then you just feed this into in the linear equation solver, and it will give you the least square solution, the best solution that approximates this overdetermined system. And if if the system is exact, it finds the exact solution. Or if you have less, it even works when you have less equation than constraint. In which case, it gives you a solution, but it gives you the solution with the least norm here, the, the smallest parameters that satisfy your two equations. So that's a nice. Uh, so this, this type of tool should be, uh, all scientists should, should be familiar with that, I think, because it's, it's extremely uh, efficient and nowadays, uh, you know, you, you can use that uh, very easily. So the, if we want to work in phase space, you see we need to know the accelerations the, because the gradient of the, the here we have the, the acceleration term. So that's, of course, uh, in practice, uh, this is a difficulty. In the galactic context, we can have a model of the acceleration in the, if you think it's the, the galactic potential, uh, the galactic uh, field of force, you can make a model of that and try to, to solve this thing. <clears throat> so with modeling and iterations, perhaps we can find something. So just this remark about these squares, because I have the impression people don't, don't know that. Do you know that? Or who is familiar with least square linear system, so well, that are, have more equations than unknown. This is really, sh should be familiar with that. <clears throat> it's really a very useful tool. So what it means when I write 
this system approximately equal to that. You are in your matrix A here, and um, unknown X, and another colon matrix B. And when we, we write like that, it means that we find the smallest norm, L2 norm, the, the, that's why it's a square thing, the smallest uh, L2 norms of the difference between the two. So that's the identical formulation of, of this. So for example, if you use uh, MATLAB, Octave, and so on, you just do, you have your X, your you, you find your X, you have your data matrix A, data matrix B, you make a left division, let's call it like that, A divided, divided by B on the left, and you find X. So it's, it's not more complicated to do a least square uh, <coughs> solution on such systems. Uh, of course, there are other methods, such if you prefer L1 norm, because the L2 norm favor the discrepant point a bit too much. If we, do, we don't want to, to favor these points, we take a L1 norm. And it's, sometimes it's more, uh, it's, it gives better results, but uh, it has a drawback. It doesn't guarantee to have a, a solution while uh, the L2 norm is working in all cases. <clears throat> So if we have a, we, we, we are open to examine if the, the stars rotate not only in space, but or the system and the galaxy and so on, rotate not only in space, but also in velocity space. We can do exactly the same, except here instead of plus, we have two columns, uh, six in fact, because each one is a, a three dimensional vector, six times N matrix, you have six unknown and uh, again, a uh, data matrix. <clears throat> so now we can solve this uh, phase space problem with uh, you know, say more than or equal to six data point. <clears throat> you can find the, whether the rotation in space or velocity space are the same or not. So Premen Weinberg, well, was not we were not using the the distribution function, but we are using a density. In, in fact, density in a plane, uh, the projected density. <clears throat> and then for this equation, we can use the continuity equation of hydrodynamics, and this this allow to get rid of the dt dt term, which is here. It's it's eliminated by the conservation law. But you can essentially the tremen weinberg method is to have this term. And then instead here, we just collect a number of points. It's a discrete, it seems to be a discrete problem, but in fact it can be continuous, it can be discontinuous. It's, it's much more general than uh, assuming that the points are in space, a continuous a line along the line or something like that. So you see the, the same principle holds uh, except if you, you here we need uh, always the gradients and in the Tremaine Weinberg approach where they do an integral of our line. So they manage to transform the gradient in, in a, an integral of densities and velocities. But um, we can, in which case this type of uh, equations are useful. We can, on the local side, you see immediately that if this term <clears throat> is zero, <clears throat> because if your, your gradient is aligned with the position, the radial directions, this uh, vector product is zero. So it doesn't contribute anything except that perhaps you have some signal on this side and then you get some uh, errors. So these, these uh, and this happens whenever the system is locally axisymmetric. So along the say, axis of a bar or the main axis, you have this term is very small. So it, it's not useful to integrate this type of uh, regions 
when uh, the term is too small for because on the other side you will have uh, an error terms so what can be done <coughs> um, <coughs> yes uh, just uh, to stay here i come back on that so we have a three-dimensional problem here instead of the two 2d method of train weinberg can be imagined you 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 use the gaia data if you would know the density of stars in different positions you can know the average velocity of this group of stars you could start and then you have to estimate this gradient you could start to find the the pattern speed of this group um, <clears throat> local, local or it depends on how, how many of these points you what type of, of sample you, you use we have the same same approach the problem with Gaia in particular is that the, to have a proper estimate of the density is difficult because you you have a, a extinction selection functions like that and this makes the gradient uh, quite sensitive to to this uh, these errors Yes, uh, considering this, uh, again, this system, uh, what you can do is you multiply each line by a different weight. This is very frequent in, in linear optimization. You change the weight here because you decide this for this equation, the, there is uh, less importance. And typically what is done is uh, you, you have a weight W, which is inversely proportional to the error associated with your observation. And this is equivalent to a key square optimization. If you do that, uh, it's, it's very fashionable in astronomy, key square optimization. Uh, if it's a linear problem, it's, uh, it's the same. <clears throat> so the typically in a bar galaxy, the typically good region to sample are like that. Where you're not along the bars, you, you want to sample here. Because the signal is strong, you have a, you have a you, the gradient of density is not at all a radial. So you can have some signal. Now I introduce another method, which is a, um, which is completely different, in fact, except uh, <clears throat> instead of F, this function it could, it was arbitrary, you take just the potential, <clears throat> so it's in space, <clears throat> and then you get this system of equations for omega. Here you, you have, what is this? Is just the torque. The torque on the particle one or two and so on, time the, the pattern speed, is proportional to the velocity time acceleration and the time derivative of the potential. This time derivative is along the trajectory of the, the particle you, you look at. So again, you, can, you could in principle derive the pattern speed. If you know the local acceleration, the, like the gradient of the potential, and you estimate this, this uh, also, uh, if you have a model of the potential, you could also estimate this for a given trajectory. For a small dt, you find uh, how the potential change along the, the trajectory. So we can derive this same equation either from the relation I showed you before, or just by assuming this, the, the Jacobi integral, and it just yield the same, uh, the same equation. So, when is the torque small? When are these terms small? Uh, is when the when this this term when the torque is small. So along an orbit, sometimes you have some situation where the the torque is is zero because of the just a, a line at the right position. So this uh, they should be avoided to to. Taking this such situation into account don't add to, to the problem. 
in n-body models, in, um, in principle, the, when, when you have gadget or so, such solvers, they calculate the gradient of the potential, they calculate many things, and they could do this phi dot as well. They just need to have the, oops. They could, they, they could um, oh, sorry, it's not omega, it's phi, phi dot. Phi dot it could be solved uh, in directly in n body, n body solver while the force are calculated. But uh, what we do, because it's not provided, instead of changing this type of codes, we just uh, evaluate two times the potential by displacing the, the whole system by a small dt twice back and forth. And then we find this quantity. So it's a bit complicated, but uh, was for us uh, the fastest way to have these numbers. So the advantage of this method in the Gaia context, the Milky Way context, is that we don't need the, this special gradient of the mass. We just sample stars. If we have a good potential models, <clears throat> credible, it should give something because we have this velocity and position ex, uh, ex, uh, information as well. <clears throat> so it's, and it's not sensitive to the sampling, uh, selection function, extinction, and so on. Now another method, which is uh, almost like I told you is this simple method of estimating the metal, moment of inertia. You take the moment of inertia of uh, 3D. So you can write this as a matrix equation, X are the you have a three by N vector of positions. You have a mass matrix, just a sparse matrix. And then you estimate this moment of inertia. Uh, and then what, is easy to do is to make a standard uh, SVD decomposition. Again, uh, is it, are you familiar with SVD, singular value decompositions? Has anyone heard of that in, in lower curves? That should be, it's a, something is missing in the, <laughs> in the current teaching of students, I think, because it's all, again, it's, it's something so useful and, and uh, used all the time. If you have heard, uh, the NSA is very fond of that for detecting people on the network. <laughs> or it can have used, uh, you, you are always surprised to see how this singular value decomposition is, is, um, is valid for any, any type of matrix. You can decompose a matrix. Uh, if it's a general matrix, you have a singular values. It's like the, eigen, the square root of the eigenvalues. And you have um, orthogonal matrices, except in general case, the, the, on the right hand side, it's another one, it's not the same. Here it's a square matrix, so it's a, a bit equivalent to the eigenvalue problem. You find the eigenvalues, but here I found more convenient because it's, it doesn't cost anything in terms of computing. And uh, it's the algorithm are very well, uh, are all real. You don't have uh, imaginary numbers. And so in, in practice, you do just this. U, S, you want to, to have these two matrix. You, you ask SVD of the matrix you, you look. So it's, it's a really standard tool. So the problem we had is that we wanted, in fact, the der derivative of the results, uh, the time derivative uh, for a single snapshot. So, but we can find I dot with the data we have. I dot, the moment of inertia variation, you just derive this. If you, you know the velocities, it's a, a vector of velocities and position, you see this combination of of things, it can be exactly computed once you know the velocities of your, of your object. So you, you have a I dot, and what we would like is to find this orthogonal matrix, the time derivative of this. So the algorithm is, 
is not known. This one is quite fresh, if you want, in the literature. And uh, it's, uh, but it's, it can be done. Uh, I'll show you the, once you, you have U dot, <clears throat> you get the omega by taking the vector products of your your initial uh, <coughs> your, your your initial uh, rotation matrix with the time derivative of that so that's just uh, the how the system rotate just to have a look uh, in matlab octave uh, how it looks for the implementing this algorithm it's just uh, Besides some safe uh, checking, just to make a loop. There are a few things. This is the the difficult part that uh, Toast and uh, wrote, and then uh, and then it's it's done. So it's it's uh, it takes no time. So. By the way, this inertia moment of inertia can also be applied in velocity space. You'd like to see your velocity ellipsoid is, is rotating. And you can do this exactly the same one once you have the this inertia, moment of inertia te tensor in velocity space, you just get the same. The, the 2D methods can also be in 2D, we can express all the, these time derivatives analytically because uh, in three dimension you get. Uh, Equation of the third degrees to solve, so it's it's messy. Here it's it's, it's uh, manageable. So you have new moment of inertia, and you calculate a few terms. Everything depends on position and velocities of the single snatch, snapshot, and then you find the omega in two D. For the Fourier now Fourier method, so that's very popular. <clears throat> Here we, we just expressed the method without really needing the Fourier transform. You, what you do is you just express the Fourier transform and may take the time derivative of that. The phase, if you take a Fourier or inverse Fourier transform of your uh, particles, you, you have uh, the you, it depends only on the angle of the particles. So you multiply by the, the mode M and the mass is MJ. And so sorry for the collision with M. It's two things different. So the Fourier transform is like that. It's the sum of uh, terms of this, um, uh, for of, of the, the, the azimuth, of the particles, which we better find with uh, arctangent of two arguments. There is too many, too, too often uh, people uh, use the arctangents of one argument when they shouldn't, and then uh, you, you get uh, typical errors. Even in, in my uh, Google uh, map, I find always these errors of angles and can be sure this is because the arctangents is used on, with a single argument. In astronomy, it uh, should be known because we always change uh, uh, angles uh, and quadrants and so on. So, <clears throat> the, the mode phase, <clears throat> the, this something different. The phase is in, in another, is a space of the frequencies, another space. Um, <clears throat> simply for a mode M, you have an angle, which is the, again the two argument function of, of the imaginary part of, of F and the real part. And that's you time differentiate analytically. And you find uh, just an expression <coughs> which, which can be, then you find omega. You have to divide this phase, the, phase, the time, time differentiated this by M, because in, in for the you, if you have n pattern, n times the same pattern, you have to divide the, the speed by this, this number to find the pattern speed in space. So it's why we call this the phase speed. It's not the, really the, uh, the mode speed. So it's not the, exactly the pattern speed. 
So all this can be analytically solved with your snapshot coordinates. You have the, the angles again, the time derivative of these angles, they depend on position of velocities. Then you form these sums of all, all the particles you, that you want to sample. And then you find the mode speed by a combination of these, these terms. You can even differentiate the phase once more to get the pattern acceleration. Um, why, why it's useful to have the acceleration? It's because you can check the constancy of the, what you find. If it's really small, your acceleration with respect to the, to the, the speed you find. <clears throat> so that's exactly the same procedure, a bit more calculations and new, new terms, and then you find a, a ratio of this pattern acceleration, pattern speed with this. So it's a way to check the results. And also with the free method, you can apply that to any mode. <clears throat> so you don't need to restrict to the mode two because when we try that, we found that uh, if you look at the mode four, for example, it's not always the same value as it should be as the M equal to. So if you get into this situation, it means the system is, you have two phases that, that rotate at different speed. Most, most probably the system is not time independent. You can extend the, in 3D, the Fourier method. Uh, we didn't find a method to find the the omega for any mode, just to m equal to one, you can do the same because you can express instead of taking the position, you take the, the unit vectors of the positions. So, and then you form again a moment of inertia of, of you could call it angular moment of inertia. Uh, we're doing this, you can fully analyze in 3D the mode two. And the, the point to do that is to avoid uh, uh, to take polar coordinates because if you do that, you, you fix the, the angles and then you have a preference for there is a singular axis and so on. So here it's, it's safe because uh, you, we don't have this problem. But we couldn't find a generalization of the other modes to a simple expression like that. So I don't, I don't go into the detail, but you can find that in the paper we had uh, last year on, the, on these methods. So it's uh, just a, a small illustration of what we did in uh, using such methods <clears throat> with embody models, with Wu and Tam and uh, in Taipei. Um, so we, we are interested in double bars and uh, see what's the interaction with this, with this bar and what they do. So we could model this. <clears throat> so because these bars are not at all rare, <clears throat> observationally. So what we did, we took three components of Miyamoto Nagai models, and we find the equilibrium distribution of these by um, an algorithm of Ewing and Springer, which was quite fine, uh, very, very little problems, some, but could be managed. We used 20 million particles. So the, the third component is supposed to represent a kind of halo. The first component is, is going to be the small bar and the second component is going to be a disk with a bar. And we, we integrate this with uh, the code of uh, Jir Falcon of Denon, which is very efficient. You can, um, it's easily a, almost a factor 10 faster than the three code in the, traditional way <clears throat> and very precise because it, it uh, conserves momentum contrary to the tree code. So we, by, to, to get these double bars, 
the trick is to start with a cold inner disk. We, we choose to have a colder inner disk, just having a few parameters uh, a bit lower than the one of the bar. So it's, it's a way to, you can guess in advance what you will get with this kind of type of uh, model. So the question was, we have two bars and we have these bars with a, you see a projection of the density of such a simulation at some point. So here we, we have the spiral arm starting and at some point we should have a Lagrange points. So we call this equilibrium points because we, we were not sure if it's really uh, fixed points in, in, any, in some rotating frame. So, and then if we, we calculate the pattern speeds and we can study how these patterns change. So here is the, this is the, the, the density of each of these Miyamoto Nagai components. A bit look, it looks uh, impressive, but in fact, it's quite, quite nice. It represents well this galaxy, or it can be a spheroids, it can be a homogeneous things. It's, it's quite, uh, can change. You have two parameters. Um, besides the mass, you have the, the A plus B is the disk scale length and B is the scale height. So the, that's, um, and we can choose the Tumre Q as a function of in, uh, the, the global Q is like this. You see that this dip is, is devised to, to be sure we have a, a secondary bar first. And indeed, uh, after a short time, what we find is this, uh, if you look at small scale, four kiloparsecs, you have this small bar. And uh, at larger scale, you have the big bar, uh, like nine. And the, these two are, it's a very, very stable uh, system because it started in equilibrium. It evolved very quietly with these two bars rotating at different speeds. Um, <clears throat> there are some other snapshots at different times. Um, the small bar, and the, the, the big bar, and the small bar is large each time uh, during uh, over 80 giga years, I think, in total equivalent. So, what are these equilibrium points? Because uh, we have this problem are there Lagrange points or not? So what we decided to do is to, what we can at each, <clears throat> so for, we first need to find the pattern speed of each, each component. So we use the 2D moment method, easy to implement, as I showed you. Um, then the, the solver provides the potential of each particle. So you, we can calculate um, the effective potential of each particle, in which, which is the effective potential for each particle if you, we know the pattern speed. And then in this, in this uh, potential, we can find the fixed, the equilibrium point, it sh should have zero, calibrating the, the acceleration. So you should have no, no acceleration in the rotating frame. Instantaneous rotating frame. So it, on the, in the R direction, <clears throat> it's, it's polar coordinates here. Uh, we have R direction, we can uh, have this, uh, this term and the uh, centrifugal term. In azimuth, we have to equilibrate, you have zero torque. Essentially, this is, it means we have zero torque. And what we, we didn't use exactly that, we just multiply by R just to make, um, to make it easier to, to, to deal with. Because uh, if we multiply by R and each of these components to square it, you get a function which is quite useful because when it is small, it means you are very close to uh, an equilibrium point. So we just have this function is, is positive, as you see, of a position and velocity of all the particles. And we can, we can even sample the particles in, in pixels in the plane to, to make an average over a pixel. 
And then <clears throat> this function can be um, analyzed in the, in the plane. We we don't this we, we get in the the galaxy is sufficiently flat, so we, we just take z equals zero is the the, the location where the, the vertical acceleration is zero. We didn't consider this because it wasn't needed, in fact. But we could add a z square to this and, and solve our way in, in the cube, in the volume. <clears throat> so, so then we have the pixels with different values of this, uh, this function, w. And we find the, 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 the 36 pixels that have the lowest value. Why 36? Because uh, we expect to have four Lagrange points or something like that. And around any pixel, you want to have the neighbors. So you, you have something like uh, nine, nine pixel you want to keep. And so 36 for four, four points. So we, we sample all the pixels, the one with the 36 lowest values, we plot them and we find uh, where is this, uh, these special equilibrium points are. And uh, we can also sample the, the white and black line. Uh, just one equation is minimized, the radial equation. We have zero radial force. And along the white curves, you have the zero torque. So you, you find uh, at the intersection, you, you get this uh, equilibrium point. So you see how it can change. This, this is an um, interaction in time. Sometimes you have complication with the small bar it can be a bit of offset. <clears throat> and the interaction with the spiral, you see the, the torque is, is going into the spiral at some point and at other times it's, it's different. So you, we see well how this, uh, this force act each on each other, the, the bar and the spiral are interacting <clears throat> and it's very time dependent situation. So we cannot have, we, we proved by that, that the equilibrium points are, are not fixed point. They are at each instant, the point of equilibrium, but these points move. So um, yeah, it's another showing the torque in, the, in this bar on um, two bar system. You can see where is the large torque typically away from the bar axis. So these equilibrium points, <clears throat> it's interesting to see in time how the, the radius of this, the, for black is the large bar, for the red is the small bar. You see the C8, but also you see the difference between the one is supposed to be like uh, L1 and the other L4. The, the minimum one should be L4, the larger one should be L1. But you see the difference is uh, changing with time. That's, that's uh, curious because it means it's like the strength of the bar is, is different at this position. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> we can also add the azimut of these points. It's an average rotate to always rotate, so it would be hard to plot on, in time. So we, what we do, we reduce the azimuth by an average of a, proportional to time, an average rotation speed over the, on this range, for example. <clears throat> so we plot this reduced azimuth. So we see better how the, these azimuth evolve. And you see, it's, it's sometimes it's quite dramatic. You have here, Again, along the long bar, uh, the points, they just shift to the other, uh, by 90 degrees, to the other side. <clears throat> so th this is a special situation here. And the same here, it's, it's very chaotic, very evolving. You, you have this, um, these equilibrium points uh, moving around. And considering the effective potential, this is also very interesting because you see the, as I told you, the, the difference between L4 and L1 is telling you how the bar strength or the effective resonance is, is acting. So it's, for a while, it's, it's quite constant. It's small, but it's uh, quite constant. 
but that sometimes they almost vanish. You see that. So it's like an axisymmetric system for uh, like this resonance, if it for uh, some some period of time, it's like disappearing. And the same here, and this correspond to this uh, chaotic region here. At the same time, you have like an axisymmetric system. It's why the, this equilibrium point can move uh, easily around. <clears throat> And the same here, the, the difference between the effective potentials is negligible. So that's interesting to, to think about uh, what's the effect of this co resonance. Uh, sometimes it's like it's a gap of, of um, a dynamical gap. You can migrate angular momentum or not, depending on uh, whether this gap is open or not. Here we can see, uh, let I skip this one, the pattern speed uh, in terms of colors. Um, you see the scale of the colors. If you have the Fourier m equal two, m equal four, the Jacobi integral method, and the method of inertia, <clears throat> you see globally it looks similar, but in detail you see differences. Even between the m equal four and m equal two, we should have the same uh, the same speed at each time if, if they would be really rigid, but they are not, not if you look in details. The, the Jacobi integral, it, you see it's smoother, it's because it's, it's probing the potential, it's not probing the mass. The potential is the convolution of the mass, so it's already uh, a smoother signal. So it's why it's, it's interesting. This method I find in, in n-body simulation, at least it's, it's quite uh, useful. And the moment of inertia is resembling a lot the M equal to Fourier, except that um, the weight, there is more weight given to the particle far from the center. So the, the Fourier method is, is bad when the center is perturbed because it doesn't care if the particles are close to the center or far away, they, they have the same weight. While the, the moment of inertia, they, they damp the central regions a bit with this um, R square dependence. The strength also can be can be analyzed. The strength of the Fourier. I didn't describe this, but can calculate the strength of this. So let me conclude and see this time. Um, <clears throat> So we have a non-negligible time dependence of barred spiral galaxies. And this demand, not average method, but instantaneous and local, because you want to be able to, to see these fluctuations, to see the fluctuations in order to, if you want then to apply, make average, then you have an idea of how the average is representative of what you, you have in mind. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> So the, the Jacobi constant method is uh, very physical. Uh, we don't need to assume uh, conservation of mass, which is a problem in, uh, when using this, especially for gas in galaxies, but for also stars. And if you have too much uh, young stars it's, uh, in your, your sample, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not obvious that it is a good uh, representation. Uh, uh, surrogate of, of mass. <clears throat> so as I said, the moment of inertia is useful when you want to be insensitive to the central perturbations. Um, the problem with the moment method is you have to truncate at some distance because if you would go to infinity, you would have too much weight in the outer parts. So the, the exact way to truncate is it's not, uh, not clear. The, the Fourier method in itself, if you take different modes, you can check if they, they can, say, have the same uh, values, if it's consistent or not. So my, now my understanding of co-rotation region, what we are used to think about Lagrange points and so on, it's actually particularly time dependent. And um, one has to consider the adjacent regions, they, 
interact. So, <coughs> so we have to understand this and it's, it's concerning our neighborhood in the Milky Way, the, the bar spiral region. So we, we cannot consider a strict equilibrium points now in such situations. So we have to, to go a step beyond that. <coughs> Yes, we can expect, ex, expect for the Milky Way that uh, the bar at the, at the tip of the bar are flexible. So you, you shouldn't picture a bar as a rigid body as a, a flexible structure and the spiral arm the same, especially in the interaction zone. They, they are not uh, rigid structures. For the OL, OL, OLR in the concerning, because the sun is not far from what was considered as the OLR, uh, around of the, due to the bar. Um, it's in fact beyond the co-rotation. So we can expect that the local perturbation due to the spiral is sufficient to, to complicate the discussion. So we have uh, two patterns at different speed. If we take the spiral, spiral arms uh, as pattern speed, you get different OLR than if you use uh, on the, the bar. So what's the interaction of the two patterns in the solar neighborhood? It's probably uh, if you take an average, you can find some trace of the bar uh, perturbation, but uh, it has to be done uh, in a proper way with, with being aware that, that the two, uh, that the, the, this is in fact a time dependent situation. Just, um, open issue and future possible works if you have uh, time and resource. <laughs> um, we, what I didn't told, but you can extend the methods I discussed before to when you don't know where, around which center is the system is rotating. So you could uh, have a more complicated, you can find uh, equations that give you uh, the center of rotations with that. So you don't need to know where is the center in principle, but the equations are more complicated. Um, so of course we want to, to have a local studies of the Milky Way bar and spiral pattern speed in, in, from the Gaia data. For this, I, uh, I, I am stuck by just understanding how to to what is the, the same thing we have with Gaia, uh, because of course extinction and other problem makes the data, uh, the density we find is, is not uh, a fair sample of the density of stars. There, there was a paper by Denon, uh, Schoenrich, and others last year, which was in fact inspired by our methods, which were public, uh, several years ago without proper recognition. And he just modified a bit these methods, but um, the, the open question is, is it really useful? And in which circumstances the, they, they add to the method requirement of mass conservation. So we, we, we get back to the tremendous Weinberg method, but they, they smooth the signal. So but they, they typically don't make a local and, and um, instantaneous uh, estimate of the pattern speed is what I, I was wanting to have. They make average already. So it's, it's not very different from, from the previous method, which were average from the start. <clears throat> so I, I will stop here. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, maybe we have time for a couple of quick questions or a couple of quick questions. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was tapped in that you show several different methods and for one of them you show an example of how it should be programming in MATLAB slash Kopta. I was wondering if there are like Python, MATLAB, or any other libraries that implement these kind of methods, or if it's something that 
I, could, I could send you what I have, but you know, it's a very short code. It's, it's not very difficult. It's a few lines. Typically, you sample your data, you, and then you put this in the linear solver, and you are done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's following the equation in the paper. You just write that as a vector of things. And... Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I had a question about um, the um, something like the Jacobi constant 3D method. Yes. So how would that work in practice? Because you need to know the potential, which of course you don't know usually. So you need to, to know the phi dot. And uh, this is in so in body simulation, you uh, uh, told you it's not provided by by gadget or other codes. You have you have to to uh, uh, integrate in time back and forth, small dt, and you find this for each particle, this phi dot. But how would you do that for observations? Or... From observations, uh, for the Milky Way, I would say we have to make a model of the Milky Way because it's the phi dot along the trajectory. So if you have a model of the Milky Way, it's a potential or field of force. So you, you, you know the velocity, so after a small time, you find the, the difference of potential. It's just displaced in potential, so along the trajectory. So do you maybe, are you just to understand how this would work? Would this be some kind of iterative method until you get the correct potential? Because of course- well, the For the Milky Way, yes, because the big question is uh, how the dark matter is influencing that. So what I would do is to start with uh, model and then you find you will find some results and then um, you you could find discrepant values or you, you because it's local you can probe uh, different samples um, you can find if the, the omega is changing in this model already if you find the omega is changing with positions it's it's already great and then you can change the potential or find Thank you. Okay, one, sorry, one last question. I, I think this is a very naive question, but instead of using a potential, could you use acceleration, pulsar accelerations from the PTA? Acceleration. Can you use pulsar accelerations? Ah, yes, yes, yes. That's the dream for the future. Okay. If uh, I post the uh, Gaia missions, the uh, find acceleration of each, <laughs> but with pulsars, we can get uh, this perhaps before. Yeah, I, so, think, I, I thought there were some already out there, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. but you get uh, probably the acceleration along the line of sight, not just 3D. Um, I'm not sure what you get from the PTA. I know that in, I just know that because the, in the Omega Centauri global class, we have some, a few measurements of yeah, pulsar yeah. accelerations that I think are 3D, but yeah, not sure. Of course, you so you it's like the velocity. You if you see the star with a proper motion, you after a while you see there is a binary perturbing. So the, the speed is, is the acceleration is exactly the same problem. You can have a neighbors uh, giving an accelerations, and so one has to probe many many stars and many pulsars to get uh, something uh, you can distinguish between uh, the, the one perturbed and the one alone. The, the, yeah. Okay, I think we need to continue the discussion during the coffee break. So let's uh, thank our speaker again. <laughs>
Okay. So welcome back from the coffee break. Now we have uh, Alexander Marchuk that will talk us about decomposing the spiral arms. What are they? The floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? I assume you can. Uh, so hello everyone. I want to start from the thanking the organizers and the panels personally for inviting me in. Uh, and I also want to apologize for some possible language issues. I hope it will be not that terrible. Uh, so I am into the observations. So I'm gonna talk about the observational part of the uh, topic. Uh, so normal simulations in my talk, sorry on that. Uh, so just a couple of years, I'm interested in the spiral arms. And this is just a small group. It's just me and my students. So uh, I will gonna talk about there will be a short introduction uh, and two parts, which is the photometric decomposition as the Cartesian radices. And the ultimate goal is nicely described by this quotation from Jerry Selwood, that the final goal is to find the observational evidence that can allow us to discriminate among theories of spiral arm origins. Ah, okay, I, I can do this, yeah. So, a short follow-up series. Of course, you know about the data wave theory and the lean shoe paper and the traffic jam analogy, where the spirals rotate rigidly with constant on growth speed. Uh, there is a tidal interactions, and uh, what we observe in the uh, numerical simulations, which these recurrent dynamic spirals, and so the, we expect like one rotation in this case, many rotations in this case, where spirals rotate like the disk. Uh, of course, there should be honorable mention about the bar influence on the spirals, but for simplicity, I will assume that we will talk about spirals without bars. And this is true for like half of the every sample I will talk about. There are some problems, but I will not focus on them. Uh, so the observational state of the art, nicely described by this part. Uh, so mostly is it the question, is it density wave or not? Uh, and the, from the relational point of view, all ideas based on the same uh, way that if your spiral rotates rigidly, it will rotate faster than the disk in the outer part after the creation and slower in the inner part. And we should observe some sort of the angular offset between different indicators, maybe it's like some star forming indicator and gas or old bulk of uh, stars. There is a nice discussion in Tambura where I get this picture from and the folio paper who find and did not find such of sets. But it, well, the recent states nicely described by this meta analysis from Foley, I assume, who just collects the data from the literature and finds that there is anecdotally like 50 50 uh, evidence for and pro and contra such angular sets, even in Claw and nearby and iconic examples like M55, and so also there's also like 5050. So, yeah, sorry, uh, on this stage, uh, uh, progress so far, there are plenty of methods to estimate correlation in observations, but we don't know if they work or not uh, correctly. Uh, this pitch angle predictions in the previous slide is the same idea, but these core jumps can be in both directions, and it's usually spiral arms are not symmetrical and it is difficult to estimate them using Fourier techniques. Uh, and there's like like just five years ago a paper from the Nature Astronomy where they claim to detect like exactly the same offset which I'm talking about. So there's ongoing discussion on this topic. And uh, the last slide in the introduction, why you should care about spiral arms. Well, probably because uh, just choose your favorite topic of the physics of uh, galactic disks. Uh, many, same as for, for the bars, many galactic in the nearby, in the local universe are spiral. And as we now know from the James Webb telescope, in the distant universe, it is the same. Also true, there's like 20 to 40%, this is from this work. Uh, uh, 
Uh, me myself interested in the star formation discussion, whether this star formation efficiency in spiral arms is the same as in other parts of the disk or not. But again, again, so there are many reasons to study them, and yeah, they're just long and beautiful, and that's nice too. Uh, so the first part uh, is planetary decomposition, what it is uh, when you try to, probably you know that you try to estimate parameters of the disk, uh, bulge, bar, etc. on the photometrical images. And there is on the right uh, lower corner a picture from the Desi Legacy Viewer, where there are available such models. And uh, so this is the residual picture. And you often, if you look at the spiral galaxies, you often see looks see an image like this, so the bright, uh, parts which are in these spirals, and there is also abstraction around them. So the question is, uh, if we do not take them into account in the decomposition, how do they affect the parameters of the classical components? This is one question. And we actually try to answer this using another technique. We'll try to slice the uh, spiral arms and do like some parameter fitting, but it needs a lot of manual work, so it's not ideal. And another interesting question, when we just uh, take into account the photometric model of the spiral arms, maybe they will allow us to estimate these angular sets better because we take into account the full light distribution across the arm. But yeah, this is just the idea why we need to model them. And we have such model. It's really simple and illustrated in this part. So uh, the, yeah, of course. and. Let's go back. Uh, so another issue that spiral arms are not always logarithmic or symmetrical or whatever. So you also need a very complex model. Uh, the rigid line is our model is modeled by polynomial function. Is this coordinates? We have two surfaces for the inner slide and outer slide of the radial slice, and we also have the profile along the spiral arm. There is the maximum, the exponential part. It looks like something like this, and we use infit, or my infit, I don't know, uh, for this study. There are some examples of such arms. And so far, we do this for, for different data samples. Two of them are published. This is in 51 in 17 bands from the Spedia from ultraviolet till the 250 microns and uh, about 30 galaxies from Spitzer, 3.6 micron band. And two of them are not published yet. There are around uh, 300 images from the Hubble and the James Webb still to, uh, Space Telescope till the, there are very distant galaxies. There are also three galaxies uh, on the infrared part only, but we'll talk about them. So I will not present like results for some particular data sample because it's almost near the same, and, but one very important side note here is that, of course, spiral arm is nicely illustrated by this image from the Eibensteiner, uh, where they study molecular gas. And uh, of course, real spiral arms looks more like this one. And uh, decomposition, there is a smooth, fun smooth sorry, functions. And uh, so you can do such sort of analysis only for distant galaxies or diffuse galaxies, or when you convolve to the like lower resolution or something like this, what we do in this case. So uh, the first part, how uh, the inclusion of the spiral arms affects the classical components. Uh, well, we see, and I see by disk here, I mean, of course, the oxysymmetrical part, because of course the spiral arms are also the part of the disk, but we model them like uh, on top of the oxysymmetrical component. So we observe that the uh, scale of this didn't change much, but uh, it can, but the total luminosity of the disk drops uh, up to like two times. And because the disk uh, loses its luminosity, the bulge in the center became brighter. So bulge total ratio increase and its effective radius also increase. Uh, and there are plenty of results like that. So we need to take uh, into account the spiral arms in the real galaxies if you have the massive spiral arms. We also try to 
this is a curious also result from the when you try to estimate the bump size uh, at top of the oxymetrical component in the azimuthal prof profiles, and we find that it depends its size depends on the spiral to total ratio, and there are many results sounds similar to this. So if you want to like, uh, if you're curious uh, the size of this bump, you can consult with this paper. Uh, spirals uh, participate like in 20% of the light in, uh, from the galaxy, but up to 40 or 60 like in the M51. Uh, that just focus on all slides, of course, this one on the right side, it's a pitch angle and Hubble morphological type. So you see this exactly like uh, the same dependence as you expect from the Hubble fork. Uh, so it's like a sanity check from our results. And we also find uh, an interesting case that spiral fraction uh, the luminosity increase in more luminous disks, at least in the 3.6 band. Uh, okay, let's not focus on the pitch angles. I will just need to say that we have some expectations about, uh, okay, quick reminder, the pitch angle is the angle between the circle and the uh, spiral arm. And we have, uh, from my introduction, we see that we should expect these offsets and there should be, uh, Inequality between the speech angles of star forming regions and other regions, which maybe is a bulk of old stars. And we didn't find the same inequality, but even for modeling arms with complex forms, it's in M51. But it is rather difficult to say because it, of course, depends on which part of the arm you use. And as I said previously, these color jumps can be in both directions. So this is hard topics and it's even harder for me because uh, I want some observations which allow me to discriminate series and most of the results based on the pitch angle estimations, but they are not that reliable finally. And to be honest, all these galaxies mentioned here, they have disturbed morphology. So probably expect the density wave in them is not a great idea. So it's kind of expected result. And uh, the last one, is the evolution. So previously in our work using other technique, we detect that the pitch angle of galaxies uh, increase in the past. So it's bigger in the distant galaxies using Hubble telescope data. And we prolongate this trend using new data from the James Webb telescope uh, for redshifts from unity till 3.3, I think so. And these red points are just uh, points from the literature. Uh, there are plenty of results. Let's just focus on uh, also this part and this that we also find that uh, spiral pattern became more asymmetrical in the past. And this is the plot of asymmetry. And our results can be summarized like this, that uh, spiral arms in the local universe have lower pitch angles. They are uh, longer. They have lower variation of pitch angle. And there are two examples of such galaxies. OK, it was a part about parametric decomposition. Now the part about the cartations. OK, I assume we all now know what the cartation is. Uh, but just a quick reminder that in the density wave, we should expect like one cartation for the spire arm. Uh, and if the nature is dynamic, we should expect like many cartations. And the question is how many we observe in real galaxies and do they agree with each other? Uh, we answer this question by collecting the data from the other works. There are massive data sets available here and also published where we just collect around 2000 data points. And for like 300 galaxies, there are more to them uh, one measurement of the rotation for the spiral arms available. And there are plenty of methods, uh, like 10 
or even more. Uh, and we have this data that's which method used, uh, data, the original link, and so on and so on. So what we are planning to do, we are want to see uh, if they agree or not in real data. And of course, as it is real data, we expect that they don't agree with each other. Uh, and besides the table of data, we also have this image presentation. So if you like interested in the dynamic of the spiral part of the galaxy in your favorite object, you can like go and consult with our data. At least you'll not, sorry, not our, just collected data. And you at least will find what's uh, uh, measurements so far uh, available for this object. And we also have this image presentations, the vertical axis is minimalist, just the base of the triangle is the uncertainty, and so different colors are different methods. And so like the quarter of the galaxies, we observe some sort of the agreement. Is it so one group or several groups? And most of the objects, there is a complete disagreement between measurements so far. Uh, we do statistical analysis of these results, and there are plenty of uh, what we can talk about, but uh, let's just uh, take a look at other three examples. There is a total level of uncertainty in the disk related to the observations, to the, sorry, to the measurements. And this is like uh, how scattered the points are. There are plenty of results, but let's better focus on this graph. Uh, so again, the vertical axis is a total uncertainty in the disk. So we we'll find, well, we may find the rotation. And this is the last point of the so the furthest is the estimation. Sorry, and uh, we see that. Well, if we move to the edge of the disk, the total error estimation increase. And of course, this is exactly the same what we should expect from the uh, case when most of the, our samples have spirals of dynamic nature. But of course, there are also can be pretty, like there can be many other explanations. Well, maybe just methods don't work, maybe they use wrong assumptions and so on. But curiously, we test exactly the same graph for does it depend on like presence on the bar or which type of the spiral pattern we have and the morphological type. And you can check the paper, it's exactly the same all the time. Uh, but nonetheless, this collected data allow us to boost other, uh, several other works. The first I will and this final part, I will talk about them. Uh, the first one, and, well, technically, actually, I start to work with spiral arms from this idea. It's exactly the same as previously from the angular sets, but for the azimuthal width, so you get a slide across the arm, and if there is like a strong and stationary density wave, you should expect that the profile of the arm, and of course, if you use a proper image, proper band, you should expect that it should uh, skew in different directions. Uh, well, advantage of this method is that you need just one photometrical picture. And of course, there are disadvantages. Uh, and for like certain galaxies, we try to estimate the rotation position in the spiral arms using this method and found the great consistency with previously measured data. And uh, there is also like double uh, check in each case where you have two spiral arms available because you can you measure them individually. Uh, the second follow-up, and there are three follow-ups uh, about the resonance coupling. So maybe our picture is not correct because uh, there are independent parts of the spiral pattern which rotate maybe rigidly, but with their own pattern speed. And from the, there are many expectations that they should connect on the resonances. So take a look at the picture, there is one, pattern is the second, and the rotation and the outer related resonance, they are the same. There are plenty of 
results so far for both like for, for, for observations. You have also a theory from the plasma physics uh, equations and also, of course, and body results supporting this. And they just have a very um, simple case of the flat rotation curve. I just wonder what in principle can be uh, relative positions of two patterns, two consecutive patterns. So if there is a tuple, it should be inversed because uh, bigger than unity. If you assume like the major resonances, like four to one and one to two, and it's very easy to calculate. And this is the results. Uh, there are four uh, ratios which are big enough that you sh can't expect to place two uh, patterns at the same disk. And there are all other uh, ratios uh, split into the pairs. So previously available result like for 70 plus galaxies from the font and colleagues. Uh, I will not read this, but yeah, this pair coupling is naturally expected in this formulation. And we also have two other pairs, which so we also will expect the pair resonance coupling in these cases. And we can easily also estimate the uh, winding time in this case. It's just a very simple formula. And we should expect like spider arms, if not uh, support each other, they should wind up in just one to three rotations of the galactic disk. This was the theoretical part, and there's also observations. Of course, uh, working observations, there are six close, uh, nearby galaxies with the flat rotation curves. There are here rotation radius estimations from it, in each case, in each case, we use at least uh, two different methods. So there are 17 works in total, and these are uh, individual patterns, as I assume them. And uh, they are indeed not uh, placed arbitrarily. They have this resonance coupling case. We also estimate, uh, again, it's spiral, spiral resonance coupling. Uh, and we also have these two curious cases, which I believe probably not uh, seen before in this case, spiral, spiral. Uh, so yeah, indeed we have this, of course it was shown previously, but this time we have like several methods to uh, increase our confidence in the result. And the last slide and the last follow-up that we indeed have objects, I think like one object where previous results all agree with each other and so we have a good hypothesis where uh, what the nature of the spiral arms in this object. And we show, so we uh, take other, let's try to estimate them again. And if there will be uh, agreement, it will be a strong evidence for correct interpretation. So we apply exactly the same idea with the angular sets and also another one from the kinematical data and get indeed some sort of agreement. I will say that for the nations, it's a very so good sort of agreement. Uh, it will be published soon. And there are also cases of two patterns and also like implicit arguments for the dynamic nature in other objects. You can see this paper too, if you're interested in this sort of stuff. So uh, what are spiral arms in galaxy disk? We don't know yet, but so my two cents here that we can measure the properties photometrically, it's even in complex for complex forms and so on. And theories should explain the data we collect so far. Uh, we didn't find a strong signal for expected for the case on density wave, except the one case probably, which is the previous slide. Uh, you need to correct your bulge and disk parameters if the spiral arms uh, fraction is big enough. And uh, our, correct, uh, our collected data of the cartesian measurements show a lot of disagreements. And we see that total error coverage increased when we move to the edge of the disk. So 
there's probably an argument for dynamic nature of the for the many galaxies, but probably not. And but we also have like a strong signal for because this newly proposed method from the WITS works, because we see the spiral power is non-scoupling cases, and uh, and we also see this uh, galaxy where we find good agreement between what we expect and what we measure. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And questions? Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I have a question about the number of spiral arms. Uh, is that something you put constraints on using the photometry? Were you able to see evolution uh, at different cosmic times? So the question was uh, about photometry. What spirals? What about the number of spiral ah, arms? The number of spiral arms. Yeah. Well, we see, we know that there is some expectations. We, of course, we measure their parts in like, uh, I will say that there is like between two and three the median number, but uh, you, you can check the paper if you're interested in this. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Panos. Well, thank you, Alexander. Uh, I want to ask uh, if and what percentage of galaxies you find have a single correlation, and if there are some of them if there is any specific morphological feature, they can group it under this one, under this feature. Well, if I understand you correctly, uh, the question is about morphological features, which can be related to the, at least for rotation, for example, yeah? If there are uh, no coupling, you have a galaxy and you have a single corrotation, how many objects like this you find, and if there is a morphological feature that characterizes Okay, them. okay. Would you, uh, there is one method which I assume proposed, like Omi Green, where uh, when you have like uh, uh, the bright spiral arms, uh, they end and there is more uh, less bright, or there is num m number changes from two to three and so on. So we, in our collected data, this method also included. So you can go and check exactly. Uh, is there any uh, agreement between, between these morphological features and are the collected data? So, but me personally also observe like breaks in the spirals, but number of cases is not that big. Maybe, maybe just, sorry? There are not many. Yeah, yeah not many of them. Very nice doing the fits of the spiral arms. Uh, my question is about this, right? So do you, do you have a sense of how um, unique or robust are the solutions when you fit the spiral arms? Uh, how, how difficult it is, right? Because I guess, are you using the levenberg marquardt uh, algorithm for, or, or because, so for example, if you do, if you run the fit once, um, so, are you happy with the of the results? Okay, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So, in all published papers, you can go and check uh, the models, and in decomposition, it's relatively difficult to estimate the error bars properly because Infit doesn't do this right. And in in uh, M fifty one case, we do a proper bootstrapping for like ten thousand images. And to give a decent result, so I just assume, and yeah, but in, you maybe see that on the plots there is no error bars, so yeah. Uh, but uh, from my point, uh, the images talks for themselves, from, yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's the hard part of the decomposition that you need to estimate as such as properly. But, but I guess, like for example, you, you have to add, I don't know, three more parameters for each spiral arm or something like that? Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't talk, there are like 20 parameters for one arm. So oh, how many? 20. 20. 20. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, even more than 20. But 
and 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 when but when you do like how often do you have to do you get a result that doesn't look well and then you have to rerun again this is a, it's an iterative process i guess uh yes and if your first guess was pretty decent it will converge soon and you we have like tools to make it decent yeah but yeah for big images it can take like a lot of time for sure but good, good that uh, that you're trying this uh, because uh, it's difficult. But it's good. Yeah, it's difficult, but it seems like uh, applicable for even like 300 images sample. Yeah, yeah, it's just one one person make it. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. So next is uh, Chiara Buttitta. that will discuss the dark matter dominated galaxy NGC 4277. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. So first of all, thanks Pano and the organizer for giving me the chance to present my work. And my name is Chiara Butita. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Astronomical Observatory in Capo di Monte in Naples. And today I will present my PhD project that I uh, realized thanks to the collaboration with Enrico Maria Corsini and Victor De Battista from the University of Padova and Central Lancashire. I think I will be really quickly on this slide since we already have heard a lot of nice talk on barrier galaxy that motivated us to how why we have to study barrier galaxy they are really common object two out of two out of three this galaxy local universe host a barrier uh, galaxy uh, barrier structure that is this elongated structure at the center of the galaxy and there are three key parameters that permit to characterize the bar that have length that is something related to the extension of the stellar orbit that Sustain the bar structure, the bar strength, that it is an index of how much then non axisymmetrical forces of the bar uh, contribute to the total gravitational potential of the galaxy. And then we have the angular velocity, also known as pattern speed. And this is a really important parameter since it uh, controls the position of the resonance, it regulates the exchange of angular momentum, and it affects uh, both the stellar and gaseous kinematics of the whole galaxy. It is usually parameterized with the rotation rate. That is a ratio between the rotation radius and the bar length. This is a dimensionless quantity that permits to distinguish bar into three categories that are slow, fast, and ultra fast. And in this sketch, you can see a representation of uh, these three kinds of bar. So if the rotation rate is larger than 1.4, we have this situation in which the corrotation is way much more large than the bar length. So the correlation is represented by this white dashed circle. The bar is defined as low. And uh, if the rotation rate is between one and 1.4, this means that the bar length extends close to the correlation and is rotating as fast as it can. And I want to point out that this value does not correspond to a specific uh, value of the bar pattern speed, but was chosen by large consensus in literature. And there exists a third condition that is the case in which the rotation rate is lower than one, in which the bar length exceeds the rotation. And this is a prohibited condition since according to stellar orbital theory, um, stellar orbits are not able to support the bar and so they tend to dissolve. This is a really schematic way to see how uh, we can have a, a bar formation. We have that the bar can form spontaneously in a stable stellar disk, depends on the condition of the disk. And typically they are fast bar. 
And uh, we also have the bar formation can be triggered by tidal interaction with a nearby galaxy or flyby. And in this case, we have that the bar are typically slow. And eventually the evolution of the bar depends on a lot of parameters that are in, uh, in, in the galaxy, such as the gas fraction, but also the dark matter content. In particular, we have that the interaction with a dense uh, dark matter halo, it is responsible of a slowdown of the bar. And so um, it is important, uh, this is another way why it is important the bar pattern speed, because it can help us to have a hint to which is the possible formation scenarios, but also try to put a constraint on the dark matter content. And how we can measure the bar pattern speed, there are a lot of many methods that were developed in literature that use some modeling, but the most uh, direct way to measure the bar pattern speed is through the tremaine weinberg method that is based on three simple assumptions. So the disk is flat and axisymmetric, that the bar has a rigid rotation, that means that there exists a well-defined bar pattern speed, and that the tracer satisfy a continuity equation has, for example, the case, the case of all star with no gas component. And directly from continuity equation, we can derive this expression in which you can recognize the bar pattern speed. Uh, this is the inclination of the of the disk of the galaxy, and then we have these two quantities that are that are called the photo, uh, the photometric and kinematic integrals, and they basically represent the luminosity weighted position and velo uh, velocity of the tracer that must be calculated in aperture that are parallel to the disk major axis and that are centered with the galaxy center. And this is important, in fact, uh, since we want we assume that the disk is axisymmetric. We have that one side of the disk, it's uh, balanced by the other side contribution, and just this end up only with the bar signature in this photometric and kinematic integrals. And this is just a schematic representation of the Tremaine Weinberg, in which you can see three different pseudo slit and the corresponding light of profile extracted along the pseudo slit, and how they are positioned in the uh, photometric versus kinematic integrals uh, plane. So uh, we can simply fit the data with a, a straight line and from the slope, we can recover the bar pattern speed. Uh, which is the situation nowadays? I mean, this is a, a, plot, a figure that is updated up to 2021 in which I start my PhD. I show you here the bar length versus the rotation radius. So we are basically looking at the rotation rate. And these are all the galaxies for which the bar pattern speed was measured with the determined Weinberg method applied on a standard tracer, and for which the relative error on the bar pattern speed is below 50%. Data belong from different works in literature that use long slit or integral field data in both use Khalifa and Manga. And the situation is that we have that bar are more or less consistent with the fast regime. There is a large fraction also of ultra fast bar that have larger, have a confidence level more than 90%. But we also notice that we have a really few slow bar that have large uncertainties, and so they are also consistent with the fast regime. So the question is that cosmological simulation predict large numbers of slow bars. But we are going, uh, I will show you in the next slide what, why it is important taking care about the ingredients of the cosmological simulation prediction. So uh, in this framework, I started my PhD and I work on this galaxy, specific galaxy that is NGC 4277. This is a lenticular barrier galaxy located in the direction of Virgo cluster. And I, this is the SDSS image in which I plot the light contour to better enhance the bar structure. And uh, I start with do a um, photometric uh, characterization of both the properties of the galaxy and the bar, starting with um, isophotal analysis. So by fitting the isophoto with ellipsis, it is possible to recover the surface brightness profile of the galaxy the ellipticity of the uh, fit and isophote and the position angle. And through this analysis, we can recover not only the orientation of the disk, but also some, uh, we, can, uh, we can see some bar signature that are like, for example, a local maximum of the ellipticity that correspond to the region which the isophotes are more elongated since are associated with the bar. 
And uh, another hint is that correspond in correspondence of this uh, of the bar region, we have that the position angle can should be nearly constant. Another kind of analysis that can uh, help us to uh, study the bar signature is the Fourier analysis. So we can uh, decompose the light distribution through series uh, Fourier series. And since the bar is a two-fold symmetry structure, we have that the even component of the Fourier, um, of the Fourier, of the Fourier series are larger with respect to the odd one. In particular, the M equal to is the most prominent amplitude. These are all ingredients that can help us to uh, characterize the bar properties that we see in a uh, in few slides. Lastly, I perform a photometric, a 2D photometric decomposition of the galaxy in order to understand the, the different light contribution of the various components. So basically, each pixel of the image is represented like um, a combination of the light contribution of different uh, components that we test for different uh, structure and we end up with uh, a, that this galaxy is better uh, fitted by a Cersic bulge, a double exponential disk, and a Ferrer's bar. So we, uh, with this uh, detailed analysis, we can recover the um, bar parameters such as the bar length and the bar strength. And in particular, the bar length is a quite tricky parameter since uh, we don't know uh, which are the clear edges of the bar. In particular, if we, are, uh, if we have some ring structure or spiral arms, the bar length uh, could be biased by the, um, uh, in, the pitch angle or the pitch of the spiral arms. And so usually in literature, we use a combination of different methods. So in this plot, you can see the radial profile of different quantity that we have derived through the past a photometric analysis that can permit us to define different bar length measurement and then we took the, the weighted average uh, mean to obtain the final bar length. So uh, the, uh, for example, in this panel, you can see the radial profile of the, fit, uh, of the position angle of the fitted isopod. And uh, one of the different definition of bar length is that is the radial distance at which the position angle in the bar region change uh, of about 10 or five degrees respect to the position angle associated to the maximum of the ellipticity. And the second case is, is that the, this is the bar interbar radial profile. This is, is based on the contrast between the bar and interbar region. And uh, similarly to the position angle, we can derive the bar phase angle from the free analysis and we define the bar length in a similar way. Uh, same story for the bar strength. So we use a different combination of um, methods that are presented in digital. Uh, so we have to define the bar. We have to measure the bar pattern speed. But since this is a dynamical parameters, the photometry is not sufficient, and so we also need the spectroscopy. And in fact, we have uh, integral field uh, data, uh, MUSE data for this galaxy that we use to recover the stellar kinematics map. So in this figure, you can see the uh, line of sight velocity and velocity dispersion of the galaxy. Uh, we first uh, bin the data in order to obtain a spectra with a certain specific signal to noise high enough to guarantee uh, an accurate measurement of the stellar kinematics. And we then apply the PPXF and Gandalf algorithm to measure the stellar and gaseous kinematics. Uh, together within the GIST uh, algorithm. And uh, looking at the stellar kinematic, you, you can see also, also here, maybe it's not so easy to see in this slide, but you can see there is a sort of S-shaped velocity field. This is something, uh, this is another signature of the bar that has, is perturbing the ESO velocity contour. Uh, so we are ready now to apply the Tremanian Weinberg method. I show you again here the relation that um, connect the bar pattern speed with the photometric and kinematic integrals. Uh, for this aim, we um, define a nine pseudo slit with uh, uh, different semi length in order to cover the extension of the disk and uh, ensure that the disk contribution is totally balanced. And in this figure, you can see the galaxy that I rotated in order to have the disk major axis parallel with the vertical axis to better define the pseudo slit. 
and for each semi length of the pseudosphere to be measured the photometric and kinematic integrals. So we're measuring the luminosity weighted position and the luminosity weighted velocity that is simply recovered uh, by co-adding all the spaxel in the spectrum and measuring the spectrum with the PPXF algorithm. Then for each semi-length, we recover the bar pattern speed and we uh, check the convergence of the integrals in the sense that we want, like, we want to find the radial range in terms of slit semi-length in which the value of the bar pattern speed remain constant or consistent within the error bar. So this range that go from 20 up to 35 arc second, this is the convergence radial range. And this is the, the we take then the largest semi-length for the pseudo slit to recover the final measurement of the bar, bar pattern speed in the sense that we plot the photometric and kinematic integrals in the corresponding plane. And you can see the data dispose uh, more or less along a straight line that we fit. And from the best fit, we recover the, the slope. And so we recover the bar pattern speed. And finally, we derive the rotation rate. Uh, the rotation rate is 1.8. And uh, this is the first case. The, we can say that this, the bar is low at more than one sigma. This means that this galaxy is the first case that show a slow bar that has accurate measurement of the bar pattern speed and the rotation rate. So, which is the situation nowadays? How we can, uh, where we can collocate this measurement in the, the plane that I show you before? So this is just um, uh, to remark that this is one of the among, among the best uh, uh, accurate measurement of the bar pattern speed. And I also had uh, recent uh, data from the work of Geron uh, in 2024 that again apply the Tremaine Weinberg on the manga data. And uh, also other works that use integral field uh, data with MUSE and that they derive um, uh, bar pattern speed also in dwarf barred galaxies. So the situation is now that we're starting to populate also this slow bar regime, even if the uncertainty are still large. But the issue is that according to a certain prediction for cosmological simulation, we have that the rotation rate is still uh, low respect to the predicted one from cosmological simulation. And then uh, here we have to think about this since as already Francesca pointed out, we, uh, we have to be careful about the ingredient that we put in the cosmological simulation, since uh, a tiny changes can change also the prediction on, um, on the bar pattern, uh, on the rotation rate of the bars. And in particular, um, bars in, uh, in the Auriga simulation seems to be, uh, are characterized by, to, to be more baryonic dominated. To, this is necessary to, uh, to be consistent with the fast bar that we, we have from the observation. And this in a sort of way motivated us to explore which is the, inter, the internal content of dark matter in, in the galaxy. And in particular, we selected two galaxies. One is the galaxy that I just presented a few slides ago. And the other one is uh, another galaxy that was studied in Cometa 2019. And we selected these two galaxies because they have similar properties in terms of morphology, photometry, they are more or less at the same distance. Um, and they have similar bar length. The only, the main difference is that one hosts a slow bar and the other hosts a fast bar. I mean, an ultra fast bar, but it's consistent with the fast regime. So the point is that since the galaxies are quite similar, in terms of morphology, photometry, photometry and so over, uh, should be expected to have the same internal structure in terms of enclosed mass. So the idea is that according to theoretical, uh, theoretical works, we have that slow bar can be, uh, bar can, can slow down after interaction with a dense dark matter halo. So we, ex we can, uh, in a sort of way, try to connect the rotation rate with the dark matter content and so the internal structure of the galaxy. And so we start building dynamical modeling through the MGE algorithm. This stands for multi-Gaussian expansion. 
this and uh, here you can see a representation. And basically the photometry is described as a combination of Gaussian that have the same galaxy center, but can have different orientation and uh, um, axial ratio. And we inject the mass model in the genes, uh, in the gem model. This is an axisymmetric method that permits to recover a prediction of the second order velocity moment. And if we also add the contribution of a dark matter halo, we can also have a prediction of the fraction of dark matter within the bar region. So here there is an example of the various results that we obtained for the two galaxies. These are for NGC 4277, that is the, ga the galaxy with the slow bar. And this is the observed RMS. Uh, in the other panel, instead, you can see the prediction from GEM in which the mass, it is a simple mass follow light model. So the dark matters follow the light. And in the second case, you can see the prediction of the VRMS uh, from a GEM model in which the dark matter is parameterized with a spherical dark matter halo that has a, uh, that follow a quasi isothermal sphere profile. And clearly you can see that the mass follow light model, it fails to match the observed VRMS. It's not able to predict uh, uh, the amplitude of the of the, these two maxima. Instead, the second model seems to do a better job. And situation for the other galaxy is a bit more complicated. So, the again the the panel are the same that I uh, explained before. In the first case, so the mass follow light model, it seems like we are not able to better to well reproduce the position of the two maxima, even if the shape is well recovered. In the second case, instead, at radial distance, we are not able to parameterize, uh, to fit very well the observed data. By the way, this is just a set of models that we build. We change and try different dark matter halo profile. And uh, when we have the best fit of the data um, from the model, we recover the enclosed mass profile. So uh, here on the left again is the galaxy with the slow bar, and in the second case, the galaxy with a fast bar. The blue, uh, red, and green line represent the enclosed mass from the MG, the composition that maps the star distribution. Um, the red one is the dark matter, and the green is the total contribution. And we also uh, plot the, um, the length of the, bar, uh, of the bar and the extension of the data that we have. And uh, the value that we obtain of the fraction of dark matter within uh, the bar region, it's in one case is 50%, in the other it's more or less 30%. And this is something that is consistent with theoretical observation, uh, from theoretical prediction, sorry. And so we have that fast bar live in more bionic dominated system, instead the slow bar experience drug from a dense dark matter halo. And so now I think I'm done. Uh, these are the main results that we obtained from this analysis. Let me just spend a few words on the ongoing work for which unfortunately I still cannot show any, um, anything. So we are working on uh, using N-body uh, collisional simulation to try to mimic the photometry and kinematic properties in the galaxy. The idea is try to develop the, um, comparative tool that can help us to have an idea of the, of the internal structure within without uh, necessarily perform a dynamical modeling. And I thank you for the attention and I'm ready to take your question. Thank you. Um, questions? Chiara, do you have the rotation curve of the two objects? Rotation curves? The rotation curves of the two galaxies, if you have velocity fields. Can it be that if we construct uh, rotation curves in the slow bar case, we have a flat rotation curve and the other one a slightly declining uh, one? We have the rotation curves of the two galaxies. I don't add it here. I, I need to check if there is some hint also in the rotation curves because we can just simply extract the, the, the profile along the major axis. I will check. The rotation at the corrotation, uh, at the estimated corrotation radius, if it is flat or it is declining. I don't remember. I'm going to check because now I'm curious. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
This is really nice work, very exciting work. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on naming curly R the rotation rate, because I, you, you, you're calling it the rotation rate, and I've seen this mentioned before in the literature, and I always have a very hard time explaining to people what curly R is and finding a way to kind of say this in a quick way without having to say rotation radius over the bar length. Um, and I've seen people use the rotation rate, but should we be really using this word because it's not, I mean, a rotation rate implies that as it increases, the rotation rate increases. Yes. Whereas in fact, we have the opposite, right? As R increases, we actually have a slower rotation rate for the for the bar. So I'm wondering what I didn't get. Sorry. <laughs> so so as curly R increases, the bar pattern speed, the rotation yes, so radius is is increasing because the yes. bar pattern speed is decreasing. So when we if we say like the rotation rate increases, so R curly R increases, we are talking about a decreasing rotation for the bar. So they're kind of Opposite. Do you see what I do? You see what I mean? I mean, I can I can say, for example, we since we are working, I'm working on this uh, final project with body simulation. We have that we see this decreasing of the bar pattern speed. So I will say that it is more the corrotation radius that increase and not the bar length. This. Did yeah, I answer your question or maybe I... No, I think my comment is more about the naming actually of this curly R ah, thing, okay. which is more of a philosophical question about the naming of this parameter because I still haven't found a good way to call it. I guess rotation rate is one way of doing it, but it seems counterintuitive, the name. Because yes, a, a bit. If, if you're, yeah. Sorry, it was just a comment. No worries. Okay, um, are there more questions? Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, did I understand correctly that uh, you calculate uh, the fraction of dark matter in uh, only in the bar only in the bar area, right? FDM. What is your FDM? Hey, yes. Uh, here. So this fraction is basically the dark matter contribution over the dark matter plus the MG contribution. So just the dark so, matter component over the total one. Do you assume that uh, the dark matter that is outside the bar does not interact with the bar? This is the fraction within the bar length. Yes, yes, I understood. And <laughs> that's why I'm asking. Do you assume that uh, the bar doesn't interact with the dark matter outside its radius, uh, outside its the radius, uh, which is equal to the bar size? I just wonder whether this is a correct assumption because uh, the bar particles can resonate with the particles in the dark matter, in the dark halo, and these particles of the dark matter halo can be outside. Uh, I think they can be outside uh, the sphere you actually consider here. In short, maybe you should check uh, the dark matter contribution not only in some enclosed sphere, but like <laughs> at higher and higher distances from the center. Yeah, I mean, um... Usually, there are a lot of work that computed the dark matter fraction within the effective radius. That is another way to measure the, let's say, the contribution of the baryonic and dark matter. We decided to, uh, to compute the cumulative dark matter fraction within the bar length, since in this case, we have quite the similar value for the bar length of these two galaxies. And so we want to understand, uh, since this, these two galaxies are quite similar, if there is some some uh, difference that is appreciable uh, within the bar length. But for sure, I can compute the dark matter within different radius that could be the corrotation or other resonances. Okay, yeah. maybe just for the comment. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks.
So last uh, speaker of this afternoon session, Oscar. What's your title? Yes. Ah, the Magellanic clouds with high resolution glasses. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Internet? No. Hello. Uh, trying to connect, it says. I don't know. Okay. I think you know are right in the password. Okay, good. Okay, it's working, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like this, the first one. Okay, so first of all, a disclaimer, this is the first slide on purpose, but since it relies on internet, really the, um, from one slide to the other, it will crash a little bit, but I will try. So first of all, I would like to say that back in the days, when I used to be a, a kid, when I was in school, I used to be in the first row sitting. Not because I was super interested on the lectures or because was I, I was part of the SOC, but because I could not see very well what was written on the blackboard. Even though it was long, long time ago, I perfectly remember the first day I went to lectures with my new glasses. It's like I remember these blurry shapes become super sharp lines. It is like a new world open to me. So I guess this is somewhat similar to what happened to the study of the Magallanic clouds thanks to the, to the launch of the Gallada. So in this talk, uh, titled the Magallanic clouds with high resolution glasses, I will summarize what I've been doing during my PhD under the supervision of Mercer Romero Gomez and Xavier Luri at the University of Barcelona, and done in collaboration with my colleagues, some of them present here today. So first of all, I would like to introduce the data, and I will be talking about the Gaia mission. If I had to summarize what Gaia has been doing in the last 10 years in one sentence, I would say Gaia has been measuring astrometric, photometric, and spectroscopic data for almost 2,000 million stars. You may wonder, okay, this is a large or a small, or a small value. As everything, it depends on which what do you compare, no? If you compare with Hipparchos, for example, ah, if, let's start with the negative way. It is only represents 1% of the Milky Way stars. So still we don't have like the whole picture of our galaxy. However, if we want to be optimistic and let's compare it with Hipparchos, its ancestor, we will see that the improvement from 100,000 stars to 2,000 million stars is a lot. So this means that from one star that we had in, our, in the Hipparchos catalog, now we have 2,000, uh, 20,000 stars in the more in the Gaia catalog. However, these stars that we observe have not equally distributed as with Hipparchos. So if this is what Hipparchos could see with this mostly solar neighborhood, this is what Gaia can reach. So now if we see the galaxy from, uh, from the top, so uh, face on, we will see that Gaia is able to see um, some spiral arms and even can reach the, spiral, the galactic uh, bar. So having motivated that, here I go to the classic Gaia image that you can see in all Gaia uh, presentations. And today I'm going to, to not 
I'm going to talk not about the Milky Way, which is, we can see very nice, the feature here, the absorptions and so on, but about these two galaxies in here, the large and the small Magallanic cloud. Uh, in order to make some comparisons of about what we have been doing during these last weeks, in here I'm showing how Andromeda is seen in this Gaia image. So um, the Magellanic clouds are almost 20 degrees in the night sky, so we can get plenty much more data in comparison to what we can get for Andromeda, at least in what Gaia means. So if we make a zoom in in the large and the small Magellanic cloud images, we can get this. What do, should we get about these galaxies? Let's start by the large sibling of this uh, couple. First of all, I would like to say that the LMC, or Large Magellanic Clouds, is 10% of the mass of the Milky Way. So it's 10 to the 11 solar masses. Uh, it is a dwarf spiral galaxy, so all the stars lie in a, in a disk. But this disk is not completely phase on. So we are looking at it as more or less 30 degrees with respect to us. So it's almost phase on, but not completely phase on. On the other hand, we can see some features of clear disequilibrium, such as, for example, one and single and broken spiral arm that doesn't have its counterpart here. We can talk about the off-center and out-of-plane bar, which is not on the center of the center of mass. On the other hand, if we talk about the SMC, what I can say about it is that it is a dwarf irregular galaxy. So the three-dimensional structure is more complex than for the LMC. And it has 1% of the mass of the Milky Way. So it's a 1 to 10 ratio also with respect to the LMC. Uh, other clear of signs of disequilibrium, as I said, is this, this distorted shape in the line outside that cannot be seen in this image, but it is. And the other one is the Magellanic Bridge, which is this flow of the stars that go from the LMC towards the LMC due to the tidal interaction that they had in the past. So as a summary, if I had to summarize why should we care about the LMC and the SMC, I would say, first of all, they are the closest galaxies to the Milky Way. So this means that we can get astrometric information for millions of stars something that is only feasible for the, for the Milky Way and the LMC and the SMC. The good thing about the Magellanic clouds is that we do not live inside the galaxy, so we can, have, we can have coverage for the whole galaxy, as we can see in these images. On the second hand, I would say that they are in a strong interaction, as I said before. So this means, by taking into account these two points, that the LMC and the SMC are the perfect laboratory for testing methodologies and models designed for the study of external and interacting galaxies. So having introduced why should we care about these two galaxies, I will talk first about the first scientific problem that we face during my PhD. Uh, this is a schematic view of where we live. No? This is the sun inside the Milky Way disk, and this is the Milky Way stellar halo. When we observe at the LMC, for example, we want to see, observe these stars. However, when observing there, we also need to cross on the foreground contamination of the Milky Way stellar halo. So this means when we look at the LMC field of, field of view, we do not only observe LMC stars, but also Milky Way. So in order to make any study on the LMC dynamics, first what we want to get is to get rid of this population of stars. One naively could think about, okay, let's make this splitting by taking into account distances. However, Gaia is not providing distances, but, but parallaxes that can be done as a proxy for determined distances. However, the LMC is at such a di long distance that the signal on the parallax is at the same level than the than the error. So this way we cannot use parallaxes in order to get individual distances on the LMC. So we need to do something more, sof more sophisticated than that is. So this is how, if you take, you go to the Gaia archive and make a query on the LMC and the SMC uh, field of view, this is the, what you get. This is real data. So here what I have done is to take the data set of the LMC and the SMC, take into account which is the Gaia photometry, bin the night sky, and then look at which is the total fluxes of each of the different past months, G, BP, and RP. And then I convert these fluxes into RGB images. So in here we can see, for example, that there is a bunch of Milky Way stars that we don't want to have them in our sample. And also, for example, in the center, we have both Milky Way and LMC. So in order to do this in a sophisticated way, we make a neural network classifier that we have as an input, the astrometric information and photometric information of, of Gaia. And as an output, we have a probability P, uh, and we have this P that will go from zero to one. 
we will have as an output if the for us given a star we have a probability close to zero this will this will mean that the milky way that this star is highly likely to belong to the milky way on the other hand if the star has a probability p close to one this will, this will mean that this is highly likely to be of the lmc in order to make this classifier binary we need to define a probability cut in order to make this uh, classifier binary so all the stars that lie in above this threshold will be lmc and below will be uh, milky way depending on which is the probability cut that we make we will have different uh, characteristics for our trim samples. So, for example, if we select a small probability cut, what we will be is to optimize, to prioritize completeness over uh, purity. What we will have in our LMC sample is that, okay, uh, we will not lose any for sure LMC star. However, we will gain some Milky Way contamination. On the other hand, if we move this probability cut to a smaller value, we will prioritize in purity. So, all the stars that are in our LMC clan sample for sure are from the LMC. However, some of them will get lost in this intermediate regime. No? So in here, what we will do is to create different samples using different probability cuts, depending if we want to prioritize pur uh, purity or completeness. So in order to show how good this classifier works, this is again no, uh, what I say, the LMC and SNC based samples. So we still have Milky Way contamination, which is super clear here. However, if we consider the more complete sample, we can go from this to this. And here you can see how this uh, becomes clear dark. No? Again, I can make this animation. And here we can see that even for the more complete sample, all these Milky Way stars disappear and also some in the in the middle. So in order to say and to see how good this Gaia data works, uh, we can make a uh, we can highlight this part, which is the Magallanic Bridge, I was saying to you before, and here we can see this, overflow, this flow of a star from the SMC going in the direction towards the LMC due to the interaction of these two galaxies. So this was one sample, and here we have the comparison of the different one. This is the base one, which has Milky Way uh, contamination, and in here we have different levels of completeness and purity of LMC and SMC stars. So, and we are talking about samples of uh, dozens of, uh, of millions of stars, from 12 to 6 million stars, with astrometric information of Gaia. So, in order to see, again, visually, about the performance of this classifier, we can see at this Milky Way globular cluster, which is uh, Tucana 47 and NGC, I don't, remember the, no, I don't remember the number, and we can see that even for the complete sample, they already disappear. So, here we can see how this classifier uh, quite easily disentangles what an LMC star is or a Milky Way star is. So finally, in order to see about how good this sample uh, are, let me just check. Okay. to see how this good this sample are, we can focus on this in the complete sample and make a zoom in in the inner region of the LMC, which is the LMC bar. And in here we can see how the amount of and the quality of the data is excellent for making studies, for example, of the LMC star, uh, the LMC bar, which is something I will be talking about later. So this was, uh, all of this was part of my first paper, my PhD thesis entitled Kinematic Analysis of the LMC using Gaia DR3, which has two objectives as a, two, two objectives. The third one is the one I mentioned, which is create neural network classifiers for the selection of clean LMC samples. And the second one, Ah, and that this data is available online, so you can freely use it both for LMC and SMC in case you are always using uh, Gaia data for the LMC or the SMC. And the second thing that we wanted to do is to perform this kinematic analysis of the inclined velocities of the LMC. As I said before, the LMC is a galaxy that is not face on with respect to us, but with an inclination of 30 degrees. So what we want to do now is to move from the Gaia observables parallax, uh, uh, proper motions, uh, positions, and so on, into the in-plane position and velocity of the LMC. So correct from the view and also from the systemic motion. When we do that, we can move to this X prime and Y prime uh, coordinates, which are in this X and Y axis, which represent the in-plane uh, position and velocities of the LMC. So again, this is already the projected. This is not an sky view. And in here in black, we can see the over densities where by this change of coordinates, now the spiral arm will have it on the bottom part of the image, not on the top part. So if we focus on one of them, for example, in the one of the optimal sample, 
we can see the different features. And here, what I am showing on the left is the BR, which is the galactocentric radial velocity. So this means if a, gala, if a star is moving inward, inwards or outwards from the galaxy. And the second one is the residual tangential velocity. So it's comparing the rotation velocity of a, of a star with the rotation curve. So for example, here, some characteristic features we can see is that there is a quadrupole on the in the in the bar, which is a, a characteristic feature that we see on the bar. However, it is asymmetric that we can see that the quadrupole is not the same size for both parts. So this is a clear thing of asymmetry. And we wanted to study why this maybe is produced by the inclination of the bar with respect of the disk and so on. This is something that we still have to, to study. Secondly, we can see you know, that in the inner in the part of the arm attached to the bar, we can see that there is a clear inward motion. So this means that these stars are moving towards the center of the LMC and that those stars, since this is positive and red, this means that this part of the disk is rotating faster. And lastly, here we can see some part at some over density with blue, a blue over density that this means very great radial velocities. This means that a lot of stars coming towards the direction of the LMC. And this is something I wanted to check if this belongs to the Magallanic Bridge or not, because this is the region where it lies. So this is something that we are still working on it. This, again, these maps I was showing, this is just using uh, astrometric data. So we can only access the in-plane velocities, which is Vx prime and Vy prime. The idea is that we also have a subset of stars that also have a, a spectroscopic information. So though there are like 30,000 K stars that allow us to make the same study, but using all 5D inform information, also line of sight velocities. The good thing, we, you can see that the coverage is not as good as the one that we previously had, no, not, not the whole galaxy is observed. But the good thing is that uh, by adding these line of sight velocities, we are gaining an extra dimension of the velocities. So now we are able to perform the vertical velocity maps. So how stars move with respect of the plane of the LMC. So this is the first time that we have for an extra galactic, um, for an extra galactic galaxy that we get full three-dimensional um, uh, kinematic characterization, uh, both x, y, and, and z. So another paper was on the application for the SMC. This is something that I already told, so I will skip that. And the third paper I would like to talk is related to what I have been talking during this afternoon, which is the bar pattern speed of the LMC. Uh, so let's go with me. Again, uh, I would like to emphasize now that the bar pattern speed is this uh, angular velocity at which the bar is, is moving. So in this project, we use different methods. As uh, Daniel was suggesting that there are different methods to determine the bar pattern speed. We'll be using, first of all, the theta value method, and it has two different versions. The first one is the line of sight velocities, which is the quite the standard by people working in extra galactic. So this is the one that Chiara mentioned in the previous talk. However, since now we have information of the in-plane velocities, we can also play, use the in-plane velocity version of the theta value method. On the other hand, we have the bisymmetric uh, model of the tangential velocity, which is an, empir an empirical model introducing the Gaia collaboration paper on Gaia, EDR, Gaia DR3 on the bar of the Milky Way that by fitting a, a bisymmetric model of the tangential velocity tries to find the correlation radius. So this is something that we have seen before, no? that if we know which is the correlation radius and the rotation curve, we will be able to know which is the pattern speed of the bar. And lastly is this uh, then a method that was intended to be used in single snapshot simulations. It's a modification of the TW, but masking on the inner region, just on the bar. And by doing so, uh, we'll be able to get the, the pattern speed. So first, what we wanted to do is to test these methods with simulations to see before how do they perform before going to the real data. Uh, in two simulations. The first one is the B5, which is an isolated Milky Way-like galaxy. And the second one is uh, one galaxy of the Kratos suite that I will be talking later of an interacting LMC-like galaxy. So some, we found something that quite unexpected on the TW method that we wanted to report that I will be mentioning now. Uh, this is the formula that works for the in-plane velocity uh, version, but as we saw before in the previous talk, the the one for the line of velocities works quite similar. And in here, what we have is the in-plane position, no? so the mean x and the mean by. And those are the outputs that we got in paper one. So we are in position of applying this, this method. 
Uh, as we said, as we saw before, no, imagine this is our galaxy in already the projected space, X prime and Y prime. And now what we can create so are some pseudo slits where we can uh, plot this mean X and this mean uh, BY. By doing so, by different pseudo slits and by masking only the slits that are inside the bar region, we will have this straight line that by fitting this, we will get the pattern speed, the omega p. So this is the idea, and one naively could think, again, this is not the sky plane, so this is working the in-plane of the galaxy, but we'll expect that to get the same pattern speed for different uh, configuration of the X and Y plane, because we are working on the in-plane galaxy, so this is, can be arbitrary chosen, as long as set is perpendicular to the plane. So we should expect to have the same omega p for this orientation, for this orientation or for this other orientation. But this is not so what we found for when testing the method with uh, simulations. Here's what we get for the Kratos suite. This is not time evolution. This is the same snapshot, but we are rotating the X and Y uh, axis. And in here we can see that for any orientation, we find some um, linear relation, but that fits a different slope. So in here we can go being the, the true pattern speed, this horizontal purple line, which is the one that we know by finite difference because it's a simulation, we know the ground truth. We can see that the pattern speed may vary from 20 and can even as low as five, for example. So this is something that happened for any simulations that we tested. So we found this warning. So this is something that we wanted to say that maybe the focus is on the how uh, cosmological simulations perform, but maybe we also need to double check if the methods that we are using are truly reliable. So this is something that I would like that someone, an independent method, an independent group finds if they find the same book or, or not. Then we have the bisymmetric model of the tangential velocity that works perfectly for the simulations. So we recover where the results and also for the DNA method. So now we go and use these methods for the, for the Gaia data. And this is what we get for the LMC. Again, this is what we get for the in-plane version, but the same we have for the in-plane, for the line of velocity version. And we can see in here, of course, we don't know the, the ground truth, so we don't have a dash horizontal lines, but we may see a different, I can skip it, yes. We can see a bunch of different values depending on this arbitrary um, orientation that we may select the, the axis. However, we also have line of sight velocity, so we are able to provide one point. So in here we have uh, that the estimation of the line of sight CW provides a pattern speed of 30. But we think that if the LMC by nature will be oriented in another direction, will be another random value inside of all this uh, curve. So this is TW. So again, no, this is the 30K stars that we have. We have this slope of 30, but again, we think that maybe this should bias uh, depending on which is the orientation that we look the, the galaxy. On the other hand, if we use the bisymmetric model, we recover a correlation radius of 4.2, so we can recover a pattern speed of 18.5. Uh, so this is another independent result that, that we got. And lastly, we applied the DNA method that worked perfectly for simulations, but when applied to the data, what we found is that the pattern speed of the, of the LMC almost to be non-rotating. So this is something was, that was something quite surprising to us that we wanted to test if this is something reliable, physical or not. So this is something that has been found in numerical simulation, but for very specific configurations, such as counter-rotating dark matter halo that may even flip the, the bar. But this is, again, this is something very super specific. On the other hand, it may have a possible external origin, such as the interaction of the LMC with the SMC and or the Milky Way. And this is something that now we are testing with this Kratos suite that I will be talking later. On the other hand, however, this almost no rotating LMC bar will indeed not show any correlation. So this leads to some problems with, with the theory. However, this result must be sensible to task extinction or, or completeness, as we said before. So this is something that should be taken into account. Or we may even have a counter-rotating M equal one mode due to the off-centeredness of the bar. So maybe this can be uh, compensated with the other one, so making this, this bias. But again, this is an independent method and another result. And what we wanted to highlight, like three different methods with one of the best data sets to apply to galaxies provide three different results. So maybe we should start thinking about all the methods that we are using. So as a summary, we have uh, this uh, bar length, 2.3. If we 
believe the bisymmetric model, which is um, the correlation radio that it provides, we will get a correlation uh, a carrier no of 1.8, no. And comparing with uh, what we have been seeing during the whole day, this will host to a, a slow bar, so another slow bar that will appear. However, this is according if we believe this this result from this empirical method. But again, this is a, a first a first approximation. So this is uh, paper three, and now I will I will like to talk during my last project, which is Kratos, a large switch of embodied simulations to interpret the kinematic of the LMC disk. I usually don't understand, I don't explain why the name of this uh, of the simulation, but since we are here in Athens, I have to, because Kratos is this fictitious character of from the game God of War, that is this angry guy uh, aiming for revenge, and he's facing like the whole mythology from the the whole Greek mythology, you know. So this guy aims to enter into the Olympia and having to face uh, Titans and even the main God of War, Ares, and also uh, even more important gods such as Zeus. No? Why the name of these simulations? Because I did most of the analysis during my PhD stay, which was in Lund, which is this Nordic city. So I got the vibe of Nordic uh, mythology, and this is kind of related with the last saga of the game, which Kratos, which is a tired guy and super bored, has to aim and find again with the Nordic uh, gods. So that's why the, the name of the of the simulation. Having said that, after this parenthesis, I would like to say that Kratos is a suite of 28 pure body simulations of the interaction of the LMC, SMC, and Milky Way. Those are split into 11 sets. And it's set is by varying one of the different uh, parameters or asymptotes that we have for the data. No? For example, the total mass of the LMC that is uncertain, the total mass of the, mm, no, the mass of the disk of the LMC, which is uncertain, the Tumbra parameter, and so on. So by varying these uh, uncertainties, we want to have this suite that will cover all the possible scenarios. Uh, each of the sets includes three different models. The first one is the LMC in, in isolation, so we'll serve as a control model to know if these initial conditions create a bar or not. Maybe it doesn't create a bar, but the interaction with the SMC boosts, so this is something that we want to say. The second one is, obviously, the interaction between LMC and SMC. LMC and SMC, and the third and last one is the more realistic one, where we have the LMC, the SMC, and the Milky Way interacting. So here I want to show, uh, this is public data also, so you can use it or contact me, but all these snapshots that I will be showing now are open. So here I'm showing a video, if this works, maybe yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Here we have, uh, for one of these simulations, we have the LMC disk. Here I am only showing baryonic matter, so Dark matter is also plotted. Uh, it's also taken into account for the simulations, but not plotted, and also the Milky Way. And then here we can see how the for these initial conditions, the LMC does not create a, a very strong bar, but after the interaction with the SMC, it boosts the creation of a bar. And then on the second pericenter, right before the, the present time, it creates an off-center bar and singer and broken arm, something quite similar to what we see for real data. Something like this. So if we stop in in this snapshot, this is what we will have, no? An off center bar and singular broken up, which is quite similar to what we see for real data. So this qualitatively this is, uh, will be a good simulation to take into account the internal kinematics of the LMC. But again, the good thing is that it is only one simulation from the whole suite of 28 different simulations. So here I am showing how the LMC looks for the different configuration at the present time. However, the good thing is that since this, those are simulations, we have the whole information, we have position, velocities, so we can almost, ah, sorry, before going to that, and here we can see that we have a, a lot of plethora of, of different configurations, such as flocculent arms and a strong bar, we may have also grand design arms and a strong bar, we may have flocculent arms and without any bar, we may have grand design arms and a very weak bar, for example, we may have ring-like structures as observed on, on the LMC, uh, most importantly, single and broken arms and off-center bars, which is what resembles the most with the current scenario. But again, what I wanted to say is that since we have the whole information, we're also able to see, for example, these galaxies as seen edge on. But what is for me it's even more important is that, okay, uh, again, we have different scenarios, distorted, warp disks, and so on, is that we can move from these density plots into velocity maps, something similar to what we have done for the real data. So by comparing this, uh, kinematic maps with the real data, we can see if 
maybe we can say something about which is the more likely scenario or try to fit better, which are the, the, the parameters that fit the LMC, the SMC, and the Milky Way system. So this is for the radial and the tangential. And to finish, I would like to show a video because yes, this was just one single snapshot. And here we can see the whole time evolution. This is the LMC disk. Uh, and here is the distance between the LMC and the SMC. So now it's in isolation, uh, super carefully, nothing is happening, but da, 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 da. now the SMC will come and we can see it on the kinematics. The bar is created. Here we can see the, the imprint in the, in the spirals, and now the second pericenter okay, will distort a bit more the galaxy. So this is on the Kratos paper. Again, this data is public, so you can use it or contact me and we can talk about it. And finally, the last project I would like to talk is about uh, Gajanir, which is related to my new position in the Lund University. And Gajanir, for the ones that you don't know, is the, the follow-up mission that is proposed to happen to continue Gaia. Uh, if it happens, that is still not approved by ESA, will be not before 2045, and it has two uh, main objectives. The first one, I would say, that is to have astrometric information for 10, approximately 10 million new stars in the hidden regions, so the ones that absorption is taking a lot of effect. And the second one, and for me, more interesting for the LMC and the SMC, is the improvement in the astrometry of the 2,000 million stars, okay, uh, those are billions and billions, uh, has been already observed by, by Gaia. So since we have a baseline of 40 to 50 years, well, we can fit the proper motions. We have some observations here and some observations here. So we'll be able to fit the proper motions what better. So this is for the LMC kinematics will be excellent. So now what we are looking now is to an open source Python software to create more catalogs for different traces and for different missions, for example, Gaia and Gaianir. So with this Python tool, if you have like a simulation such as Kratos or whatever for your Milky Way like galaxy or so, you will be able to, to move to, to perfect scenario no, of simulations where no errors are there are into, into more catalogs. No? And this is expected to happen by the end of the year. So keep posted in case you, you are interested. And finally, with this, I want to go to the conclusions. Uh, I would like to say you know, that now there is available these uh, clean LMC and SMC samples that are open data that anyone can use, that is working with Gaia data. Secondly, it is the first time that an homogeneous data set of a galaxy that is not the Milky Way is presented uh, for the three-dimensional information for more than 20,000 stars. Thirdly, that we have used three different methods to provide three different LMC bar pattern speed. So this may be, again, will cause some tension between uh, simulations and data. So maybe instead of focusing that much on the simulations, maybe we need to focus more on data. So we have the DW that the large dependency on the frame orientation when applied to both simulations and data. Uh, so we discard any bar pattern speed found. The then method, we still need to evaluate the variety with the simulations to find a non rotating bar. If maybe if the interaction with the SMC may cause this uh, non rotating bar. And thirdly, if we believe the corrotation radius provided by the bisymmetric method, we will have a slow bar for the LMC. Finally, we have this Kratos suite that due to the high spatial temporal mass resolution and suitable for interpreting the internal kinematics of LMC like this. And stay tuned for the Gaia and Gaianir mock catalog tool uh, by the end of the year if you're interested in creating mock catalogs for your simulation of Gaia and Gaianir. However, the two main, two main take home messages that I wanted to provide is that the Magallanic clouds are the perfect laboratory for testing methodologies and models designed for the study and external interacting galaxies. And that with Gaia and the Kratos suite is the perfect model to study them. So with this, I finish. Uh, thank you very much. OK, this was a lot of information. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, Uh, thank you for this informative talk, Oscar. Uh, can you comment on? Okay, I saw that you twice. You saw uh, you saw that LMC is actually on the second pericentric passage. Mm -hmm. 
how sure can we be that it's not in the first? Because I've seen people saying that it's the first person in passes, mm -hmm. not the second. That's the, all out of curiosity. The, they are referring to the two different things because what is we are quite sure is on that we are on the second after the second peristaltic passages of the LMC and the SMC. What Eugene and Gurtina Vesla are discussing is about the peristaltic passages between the Magallanic clouds and the Milky Way. So this is another. So oh. you were talking about the preceding phases of the LMC company. and SMC. Yeah, to the Milky Way. Exactly. So LMC and SMC and are interacting while falling towards the Milky Way. Yeah, yeah. They have interacted at least two times in the last 3.5 giga years. What it is not that sure is that how many things the LMC and the SMC have encountered the Milky Way in the last seven or eight giga years. So you were referring to the the passage passes between LMC and SMC. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. cool. Really nice work, Oscar. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, I was very curious about what you were talk mentioning about the Tremaine Weinberg method and the issues there. Um, We've been actually working with on the cosmological simulations with Alex Mero, who is around but isn't here today. So you should definitely chat to him in the next days. Um, and we were also having some trouble with the Tremaine Weinberg method and the cosmological simulations. In particular, we were having trouble getting an accurate estimate of the pattern speed when um, there are perturbations and the disk is not all um, aligned and you have some like warps or vertical disturbances in the disk. So my question is, is what you're finding, does that also hold for the isolated cases, this big change in the pattern speed, or does it hold only for the cases when you have a disturbed kind of LMC like system? We find the same feature for both interacting and isolated. For example, the B5 simulation of Santi Roca Fabrega, which is a Milky Way like in isolation, just by rotating, by the fact that the what we think, eh? by the fact that you don't, do not only have uh, a bar perturbation, but also a spiral arms, it also creates that the integrals are going through um, also the the pattern the, the spiral regime no we may also we also try to make like these pseudo slits by making the cut on them but still we didn't find like a value that converts so we didn't find like a recipe like okay under this specific scenario even in isolation which is the more simple case uh, didn't work so this is something that we wanted to report <laughs> Thanks, Oscar. Really interesting talk and really nice visualizations as well. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, magnetic fields and if about, sorry? about magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you know what kind of observational data is out there for the LMC and the SMC in terms of magnetic field strengths or directions, but I was curious as to whether or not you think those are um, contributing or affecting the properties that you presented. Mm -hmm. uh, being honest, I am completely ignorant of magnetic fields. Uh, something that we are currently working to improve uh, our interpretation of our results is you know, on the, the Kratos-like simulations, uh, including aerodynamics and magnetic fields. So this is something that we want to study probably during my postdoc. So yes, yeah. because this is an oversimplification of the problem. No, since gas is not taking into account, this is it will change. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So before uh, uh, thanking Oscar and the other speakers uh, uh, again, I think tonight there is a conference dinner. You want to make a, an announcement? Well, uh, you have the instructions. It's not far away from here. Uh, eight thirty, about eight thirty, we should be there. Okay. Thank you. Because this one, this computer saved the, the passwords. Because maybe I can erase the, the history from the browser. <laughs> yes, we can do that. I wasn't even aware that you can, that it makes sense to 